And about to start. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order at 10 a.m. As many of you know, as many of you know, the governor has recently signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Chicago Plan Commission, determine that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I am making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this commission is not practical nor prudent. Similarly, I am also making a determination pursuant to the newly created section E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago Plan Commission or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Before we get into the full meeting agenda, I would like to ask that everyone, um, because we are meeting virtually, please be mindful of, the, of your surroundings in terms of noise. Please remember to keep yourself muted when you are not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live streamed for public viewing. Lastly, if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. Thank you. I want to also quickly provide guidance to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony on the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the plan commission today should have already submitted public testimony forms, which include the speaker's full name and address, as well as the public hearing item number and those forms have been gathered by the staff. I would also like to remind our presenters to please be mindful of their presentation length and to please stay on point in a concise and efficient manner so as to respect the time of all in attendance. Out of respect for others, speakers should limit your, com your comments to three minutes. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make your comments. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of the staff or the applicant, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. Again, out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers. Any individual who disrupts the presentation or any subsequent comment session may be muted and removed from the virtual hearing session. I will now call the roll call. Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner Brumfeld. Commissioner Burnett. Here. Commissioner Cordova is here. Commissioner Cox. Uh, here. Commissioner uh, Flores uh, is unable to make it today. We heard she uh, heard both from her this morning. Commissioner Garza. I'm present. Commissioner Grossman. I saw her earlier. Commissioner Grossman? Not here. Commissioner Kelly. Commissioner Lightfoot. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Murphy. Here. Commissioner Novada. Commissioner Osterman. Commissioner Dreyas. Here. Commissioner Searle. Here. Commissioner Shaw. Here. Commissioner Spazada. Alderman Villegas, Alderman King. Alderman Mitchell is present. 
this is Brand Grossman. I am here. I was on mute. Okay, and I'm hearing somebody in the background. Uh, I'm at, I'm at uh, Commissioner Sposato, I assume is not here. Commissioner Tunney? Here. Commissioner Villegas? Here. Commissioner Okay, he's not here yet. All right. Commissioner Biaggi is present. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Commissioner. Grossman is present. Grossman is present. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got you, thank you. Okay, thanks. I would also like to suggest people to go onto the Plan Commission website and provide your comments on the updated Master PD guidelines presented at the October 15, 2020 Plan Commission. The department is accepting comments until December 16th, 2020. The Department of Planning and Development intends to hold a public webinar, webinar on the item in December as well. So be on the lookout for that. Again, those of you uh, actually, we encourage all of you, uh, commissioners and, and, and the public, to please go onto the website and review those proposed Master PD guidelines. And uh, we very much uh, need and appreciate any comments that you can make on that. We'll be accepting your comments until December 16th for this next draft. We will now approve the minutes from the October 15, 2020 regularly scheduled plan commission meeting. The minutes were distributed prior to today's hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission held on October 15, 2020? Moved I'll make by Commissioner motion. Shaw. Moved by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by Commissioner Garza. Garza. I, I, you know, I, I always I recognize your voice and then my, all right, thank <laughs> you, Commissioner. It's like, never thank you. Those, like, I know that voice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, I, again, because we're doing this virtually, we have to do, we, we can't just do a A and a hand, hands raised. I've got to do the, um, the, what, the what it calls, the roll call. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly. This is for a motion to approve the minutes. Commissioner, uh, so quickly, as quickly as we can. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Gaza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. And Commissioner Viegas. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Burnett vote yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Register your vote. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you, everyone. We will now take public testimony for the items remaining on the agenda today. I have 14 people signed in to speak today, eight to speak on item D6 and four to speak on item D7 and two to speak on item D2. As I call your name, please wait a moment until you are unmuted and then you may proceed to speak. Please remind you that you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. The first of the speakers are Ms. Anna Shabowski, who will be followed by Mr. Carlos Huntley, Ms. Chloe uh, Guren Sands, Mr. Chris Connich, Mr. James Burns, Ms. Kate Lowe, Ms. Penn Wing, and Mr. Fan Lee, all of whom would like to speak about item D6 on the agenda, a proposed plan development submitted by 2420 South Halstead LLC for the property generally located at 2420 South Halstead Street and 2500 South Corbett Street. The second set of speakers will be Butler Adams, followed by Leslie Smith, then Philip Enquist, and then Rich Gettler, all of whom would like to speak about item D7 on the agenda, a proposed plan development submitted by 40 West Oak Avenue. Um, anyway, let me just go ahead and start calling folks. Uh, Mr. Carlos Huntley. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Anna Shabowski, you'll go first. Hi, my name is Anna Shabrowski. I'm the community development lead with Bridgeport Alliance. Bridgeport Alliance and nine other groups have submitted a letter urging you to reject the proposed rezoning of 2420 South Halstead Street and adopt a moratorium on all rezoning for logistics projects on the south, southwest, and west sides until the city council passes ordinances that address the inequitable distribution of logistics facilities. We are asking you to reject systemic environmental racism that puts in an inequitable burden of pollution on majority minority neighborhoods. The affected neighborhoods are majority minority. Bridgeport is 66.6% .6 people of color, according to CMAP's Bridgeport Community Data Snapshot. 
Across the river, the Pilsen neighborhood is 82% people of color, according to CMAP's Lower West Side Community Data Snapshot. Within a half mile of the site, nearly 8,000 people live, and 80% are minority, minorities, according to the Center for Neighborhood Technology. There's already an overburden of pollution on the southwest side. In 2018, the Natural Resource Defense Council mapped the cumulative environmental burden in Chicago using EPA data. The area in question is one of the most burdened with pollution in the city, scoring 9 to 10 out of 10. In the 2020 City of Chicago Air Quality and Health Report, the Chicago Department of Public Health created a similar air quality and health index map showing this area is in the 7th, 8th, and 9th worst, worst deciles for vulnerability to air pollution. There's also a growing overburden of last mile logistics facilities on the southwest side. Amazon already operates a fulfillment facility at 2801 Southwestern in Pilsen within the same Pilsen industrial corridor. In July, Amazon signed a contract with a logistics facility at 3501, or I'm sorry, 3507 West 51st Street in Gage Park. Target already has signed a contract with the Hillco facility being built on the site of the old Crawford power plant in Little Village. And there are already last mile logistics facilities going in to replace former warehouses at 3535 South Ashland and 3711 South Ashland, also in the 11th Ward along the boundary between the Bridgeport and McKinley Park neighborhoods. The overburden on the Southwest side is furthered by the city's racist approach to the rezoning industrial corridors. As the Metropolitan Planning Council mentioned in their written comments on the project, the industrial corridor modernization initiative started with North side communities in 2016. And by rezoning white North side industrial corridors for non-industrial use, that initiative is driving more polluters to majority minority South side industrial corridors. I urge you to reject this rezoning and reject the systemic environmental racism that puts an inequitable cumulative burden of pollution on majority minority neighborhoods on the Southwest side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Carlos Huntley. Hello. Good morning. My name is Carlos. I'm, I'm a property owner uh, that lives adjacent to this development. And um, I have several concerns. The first of which is the height of the structure. It's about uh, 43 to 45 feet uh, based on the plans. And that will tower over uh, the neighboring structures, particularly homes, my home uh, among many and, and create kind of a, a, a monolith uh, in the area. The second thing, uh, the development doesn't appear to take into consideration the residential character of the neighborhood. And we're concerned about uh, our children playing in the streets, uh, our, our elderly people uh, walking through the neighborhood. And uh, we would prefer to have all, all access to Sonor, Hillock, 25th, any residential area to be closed or removed. Uh, we feel that the development doesn't take into the sensitive nature of the, the neighboring community, the residential community. And, and we'd like for those areas to be closed off. Um, we would also generally prefer to have a residential community there uh, as opposed to an industrial community, if that's possible. Um, and we would love to see that um, uh, the, the, the development <coughs> would use more extensive use of Corbett and Halsted and not the other areas, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so with, with these things in mind, we do as, as residents, and I, I speak for many in the community, we do oppose this development. We think that there is a better use for this property and, and we can achieve that and, and work with the community and, and, and us to, to do that, just that. So thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ms. Chloe uh, Guerin Sands. Have we unmuted her? No. Sorry, Chair, Madam Chair, she's here now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. My name is Chloe Gurren Sands, and I'm the manager of health equity and planning at the Metropolitan Planning Council. MPC was a lead partner with the city of Chicago in the creation of the 2016 Our Great Rivers Vision and serves in leadership on the River Ecology and Governance Task Force. MPC provides technical assistance to and has developed close partnerships with a number of riverfront communities along the south branch of the Chicago River. MPC and Our Great Rivers are not anti-development. Over the years, we have seen time and time 
again, the public's aspirations for the rivers to be recreationally and environmentally thriving and to attract innovative industries that utilize the river while improving water quality. But MPC is not in support of the proposed zoning change due to three main concerns. First, the Pilsen Industrial Corridor, which this site is in, has not yet gone through the city's industrial corridor modernization process. As we saw with the North Branch process, industrial corridors have not remained the same over time and their land uses should not be locked in forever. Decisions about large long-term developments on such valuable land should not be made before a proper assessment of the industrial corridor is complete. Second, while MPC appreciates that the proposed development will be subject to the standards in the Chicago River Design Guidelines and that de the developer's plan seem to embrace creating public access at the site, another distribution warehouse is simply not the best use for this riverfront location. The current land uses adjacent to the site include residential, parks, an Orange Line station, and nearby connections to the expressways. While there are industrial uses nearby, they are across the river, not adjacent. Given the site's proximity to these amenities, the site holds potential for mixed use transit oriented development, which could grow the tax revenue generated by the site more than one single warehouse. Continuing to promote incompatible industrial land uses will steal away yet another large valuable riverfront site that this community will not get back for decades. Lastly, and most importantly, is our concern over the lack of meaningful community engagement and involvement in this development process so far. Local groups in Bridgeport and the surrounding communities have actively engaged their neighbors, civic organizations, and the design community in creating visions for this stretch of the river. These ideas and the people who create them should be engaged meaningfully throughout the development of the site from concept creation to execution. To MPC's knowledge, none of these local organizations we work closely with have been contacted in earnest to discuss the development and the work they have already done as constituents. To be part of Great Rivers, while simultaneously reacting to riverfront development on a parcel by parcel basis is disingenuous. Uses surrounding this site are changing. And distribution is not the best use for this site. If today's proposal is approved, residents and stakeholders may have to wait decades for the chance to see the true potential of this site come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are great. You almost had a time down to the second. Um, Mr. Chris Kanich, Kanich. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cordova and members of the Plan Commission for allowing me to speak today regarding the prologist pro development. My name is Chris Kanish, and I'm a very happy to be a community member, homeowner, and taxpayer in the Bridgeport community. I fully appreciate Alderman Thompson's efforts to bring development to our community and truly believe that he has our best interests at heart. However, my first point today is that the development process for this site was almost guaranteed to result in a mediocre plan that doesn't live up to the potential of this scarce and valuable location. As a bit of background, this development is made possible by combining two parcels, one of which was for sale for quite some time and another which was actively in use by a recently developed heliport while this deal was being put together. With the assistance of the aldermen, Prologis put together this development proposal without engaging the community for an entire year. And once the plan was shown to us, many in the community expressed frustration that even if they are opposed to it, there's no doubt that the fix is in. With a community engagement process like this for selling recently developed in-use land off market through connections to the aldermen, how are we to believe that any developer with a better idea for those combined lots could even hope to have a chance to build it? I desperately want beneficial development to happen here. And that means soliciting ideas from as many people as possible, not just those with connections to the powers that be. It's hard to see how this development is beneficial for anyone besides the current and future owners of that land, Amazon, and the thousands of Northside families that will get their Amazon packages that much faster. In his letter to neighbors of two days ago, the alderman told us that there could, would be 150 permanent jobs on the site. But he had previously told us that he cannot make any claims about the number of permanent jobs at the site because Prologis will merely be a developer and landlord for the ultimate operator of the logistics facility. So we're left using unenforceable, ambiguous reassurances to make lasting, hugely impactful decisions about the development in our neighborhood. My day job is as a computer science professor. So I can say to you that those 150 permanent jobs are about as precarious as they come. Warehouse automation is moving fast precisely because it so drastically cuts the human job element out of the equation. So at the end of the day, we have a community notification process masquerading as a community input process a stated economic benefit backed up neither by a community benefits agreement nor by a sound understanding of logistics facility fundamentals 
and about the least creative use of riverfront property you could possibly imagine, which further burdens the South Branch with providing creature comforts to those in the North Branch who are fast at work turning all their industrial uses along the river into high-end commercial and residential property. Thank you very much for your attention, and I encourage you to help our community find a truly beneficial use for this land by rejecting this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Kanish. Kanish. Mr. James Burns. I'm chair, I don't see Mr. James Burns. He sent us an email, he's unable to attend this morning. Okay, thank you. You know, and I wanna remind commissioners that we have several letters from a range of organizations and individuals that was in our packet for, for this, um, this meeting. Ms. Kate Lope. Good morning. Thank you Good for morning. this opportunity to speak. I'm a member of the Bridgeport Alliance and happy to live in the Bridgeport community. First, I want to counter some of the economic development claims made by the developer and even implicit in BPD's closing slide today. I want to bring your attention to the Regional Strategic Freight Direction Report issued by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning in that they caution against freight uses for local economic development. Similar to MPC's comment, other uses can generate more tax dollars, which our city sorely needs. Furthermore, jobs will be fleeting due to automation. And even before automation eliminates these jobs, job quality prospects are troubling. Secondly, I want to address transportation safety problems. The report documents about transportation focus solely on congestion and automobiles. They don't address that this facility will bring hundreds of freight vehicles in conflict with Orange Line users. The Orange Line station is a hub of bus, pedestrian, and drop-off off activity. I want to acknowledge my self-interest here. I'm direly concerned about bicycle safety. This facility will have on peak days, more than 600 freight vehicles turning across the freight lane on Halstead. This is one of the few connections over the South Branch. Already in just over three years, Streets Blog demonstrated 18 car bicycle crashes and 10 pedestrian car crashes. Freight vehicles are deadlier. So alternatively, we want a collective community engaged visioning of land uses that are healthy, prosperous, and sustainable instead of allowing for cumulative economic and environmental burden. We are hopeful that this can be done through the city's planning process instead of worsening of cumulative environmental burden. As Anna reflected, there are 8,000 residents within a half mile and 80% are people of color. In the meantime, before the plan takes effect, we are urging the plan commission to take action by rejecting this rezoning and um, adopting a moratorium on rezoning for logistics uses until we can see further action and together envision livable, healthy, sustainable, and prosperous futures. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pen Peng Wing. Uh, Bang Wing is not here, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Fan Li. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, hello. Thank you for letting us speak. My name is Fan Lei, and I am a future resident of Bridgeport. First, let me say that the concerns of job automation, traffic accidents, and pollution should be enough for the commission to reject this rezoning. The promise of planting trees and making a river path doesn't change this project for what it is, a big, ugly building that's only deepening the pockets of an e-commerce company whose business practices are even uglier. Second, I want to address why I chose to move to Bridgeport and will only be living one mile away from this site, knowing prior that the air quality here is much worse than that of our North Shore neighbors. As an Asian American woman living in a country where both major political parties either explicitly or tacitly condone crimes against Black people and people of color, I do not feel safe living uh, in, this, in any other neighborhood in Chicago. 
I have lived in Lakeview where I saw a white man on a bus give an Asian woman the dirtiest sneer simply for wearing a face mask before it had become mandatory. Around the same time, a white woman looking directly at me exclaimed, oh no, when she saw that I was wearing a face mask. Living in Bridgeport meant that for once, I would have a reprieve from the constant harassment, threat, and stress of racial bias. So this warehouse unequivocally represents bald phase environmental racism and divestment. In this country, white people do not have to make the trade-off between, between enduring endless daily racism and breathing in toxic chemicals. 51% of the residents within a quarter mile radius of this site is Asian, while the majority of Bridgeport's white residents live on the southern end of the neighborhood, safely tucked away from this abominable project. Lastly, promises of revitalized city coffers are specious at best and don't factor in all the externalized costs. We must take a dignified position and recognize that these businesses need us more than we need them. Reversing the course of inequality starts with seemingly innocuous decisions such as this. It starts with putting the interests of thousands of concerned residents first. It starts with elected leaders giving us ample time to prepare and respond, something that we wish our aldermen had done. But as someone who only needed 30% voter turnout in majority Asian precincts to keep his seat, I don't expect Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson to work in the interests of people who look like me anyway. I don't expect Alderman Thompson to care about my voice, my air, or my vote if he has money from exploitative, profit-driven interests like Prologis to back his next re-election. The data against Prologis and Amazon is clear, but in fact, the most dangerous ramification of this is the erosion of democracy veiled as business as usual development projects. The only way to protect the city and our community is to reject this rezoning and issue a moratorium on all rezoning logistics facilities until we have developed a plan for a more equitable city. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, the second set of speakers will be Butler Adams, followed by Leslie Smith and Philip Enquist, and then Rich Kirtler, all of whom would like to speak about item D7 on the agenda, a proposed plan development submitted by 40 West Oak owner LLC for the property located at 46 74 West Oak Street, 1000 1006 North Dearborn Street, 1001 1007 North Clark Street. Uh, let me first call then Mr. Butler Adams. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, um, my name is Butler Adams for the record, and I wanted to say that I am in support of this uh, proposal, even though my support is a bit lukewarm. Um, personally, I'm a little bit tired of this, you know, 2000 fake French Gothic Renaissance architecture. You know, I saw this 20 years ago with the Elysian and with Park Tower and Chicago, I believe should be a lot more progressive in terms of its architectural design. Um, I have read through some of uh, people's complaints about this particular building and by no means is it out of context with the area at all. The building itself has already received a 40 foot height reduction and reduction of units, even though it was only 15 units. One of my concerns is though, there was no seemingly no, res no reduction in terms of parking. And one of the complaints is increase in traffic of the area, even though it is downtown in the central area. And I believe that right now you have about 160 parking places proposed for this building, which is more than a two to one ratio for units. And there's a building right now going for New York City designed by uh, architect Robert A.M. Stern. It's about roughly the same size. It has 86 units, but only 26 parking places. So well, I'm kind of concerned about the uh, great number of parking places in this building. It's really not needed. Um, there was a meeting last week about a proposal just a few blocks west of here, uh, North Union, and a lot of their parking places are going to be going underground. So I don't understand why this particular developer can't place at least one or two of the parking floors underground. You're going to have eight floors of above ground parking and just kind of blank, lifeless walls facing the street. In terms of people complaining about height and density, which I know you're going to be having, this is downtown and this is the central area. And personally, I'm tired of projects getting dumbed down in the central area to, capit uh, to capitulate to these NIMBY people. Um, a lot of these people live in buildings that are taller than this one. This one has been reduced to, I believe, uh, about 466 feet from a just bit more than 500 feet. There are plenty of buildings around here that are taller. 
There are plans for buildings just west of here in North Union that will be taller, up to 600 feet in height. So I'm concerned that we keep bending over backwards to down, uh, not down zone, but dumb down these projects in terms of height and density. There was another proposal just a few weeks ago for a, like a, a, a State Street where the bookstore is, and that project has lost height and density. And I asked the question about how much less tax revenue is going to be brought in. Well, it's going to bring, bring in $600,000 less annually in terms of property taxes. And right now, the city is talking about raising taxes on people right now. Well, my parents are on a, 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 a limited income, and we have a six flat, a commercial building, which means our taxes could go up a lot more. So um, dumbing down these prime projects is not the way to uh, benefit the city, but I do support it. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Leslie Smith, followed by Philip Enquist. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, let me say that um, I do not object. At, let me first say that I'm appearing as a personal uh, citizen, member of the community as opposed to an, an attorney. But um, I want to say that I do not object to a safe and appropriate development on this site. I do, however, object to the lack of transparency that has gone on throughout the presentation of this development. Community residents have been led to believe that the development would have a floor area ratio of nine, rather than, in fact, a floor area ratio of more than 19, which is inappropriate for a residential community. The proposed development will create serious safety and traffic congestion problems. Due process requires that the community be permitted an opportunity to present an independent traffic study which accurately presents the situation on these two two-lane streets, one of which is closed twice a day for drop-off and pickup for the school. It will be unsafe for the children, for the parents, it will be unsafe for ambulance and emergency vehicle traffic. The current traffic uh, study presented by the developer does not in any way accurately represent the situation on these streets. And as a matter of due process, the community should be permitted to present an accurate traffic study so that the development can be assessed in light of the true traffic and safety uh, conditions that are in fact present. Um, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Philip Enquist followed by Rich Gertler. Is Philip Enquist on? Yes, he's unmuted. You can start speaking. Okay. Uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Hello? Uh, no, it, it's not. Sorry. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time and allowing us to speak. I very much appreciate this. Uh, my concerns and that of the board of 30 West Oak and the, many of the residents is that the design proposal for the sub area B of the Warren Bar site with a proposed FAR of 19.39 as stated in the development package uh, and a 35 story tower on a 10,000 square foot site is simply too dense. It's stated that the overall FAR, including Warren Bar, is 11.34, but the actual FAR of the sub area B that we're focused on is 19.39. And we're encouraging the plan commission to take a closer look at this proposal. It needs additional scrutiny uh, regarding density and height and also impact to the local streets. One of the issues about this neighborhood is that it is made up of two lane streets. It is not Chicago Avenue or Diversity or State Street or LaSalle Street, but Oak Street and Dearborn are two lane streets. Dearborn is closed twice a day for school bus operations and Oak Street and Walton Street turn from two lane into one lane streets due to parent drop off and pickup of students. The building itself uh, is surrounded by a two-story historic structure to the north, as you can see in the elevations that are in your package, uh, page 15 through 17. There's an eight-story historic uh, Newberry Library to the south, 
a nine-story Warren Bar Health Facility to the west, a three-story Ogden School to the south. 30 West Oak is a 24-story building to the east. This is a 35-story building at 465 feet high. One of the reasons it's so high, as was mentioned earlier, is that eight floors of parking are all above grade. It's a very high parking requirement or parking uh, program here of 160 uh, spaces, and they are all above grade, making the building 35 stories high. We're recommending a lower zoning and a lower proposed building height, something closer to the 20 or 24 floor range. Uh, with parking below grade, if that is possible. Uh, we strongly encourage the plan commission to take a closer look at this proposal, and we thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much. Now, Rich Gertler. Well, is he on there? I, I didn't, Chairwoman, I didn't see anyone signed in with uh, Rick's name. Okay. Last set of speakers is Mr. Larry Lusk and Mr. Michael Simi, both of whom would like to speak about item D2 on the agenda. He proposed amendment to plan development number 276 submitted by the Society for the Danish Old People's Home for the property generally located at 5656 North Newcastle Avenue. Mr. Lusk. Is he on there? Yes, Mr. Lusk, you have to unmute yourself in order to speak. I've done it. Thank you very much. Um, good, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Lawrence Lusk, and I reside at 6822 West Hurlbut Avenue, directly across the street from the Danish home. I'm an attorney with offices in Chicago, and I was previously employed by the city's Chicago Department of Buildings as an attorney, where I worked for approximately eight years dealing with code enforcement matters. I also worked for approximately 10 years at the city's Chicago Department of Administrative Hearings as an administrative law judge. I have, I have represented clients in front of the city of Chicago Committee on Zoning, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and uh, I have previously been recognized as an expert in land use and city planning by the Zoning Board of Appeals. I have never appeared before this committee. I have submitted a written statement outlining numerous objections to this proposal, and I ask that the statement is read by the committee and made a part of the record in this matter. Due to the time limitations, I just want to focus on what I'll argue is this proposal's failure to meet the criteria necessary for approval by the committee. First of all, I would focus on chapter 17130609, uh, whether the proposed development complies with the standards and guidelines of 178090, specifically chapter 0902. It states as excess as otherwise stated, planned developments must comply with any special regulations that apply to the subject property, including that limit to the Chicago landmark ordinance, et cetera. This proposal is, is located in special district number one. That is a, uh, does, does uh, entail special regulations for development. If the applicant is allowed to remove themselves from the special district by way of amendment, then I see no point in having a special district in the first place. In addition, chapter 0609B, whether the proposed development is compatible with the character of the, surround, the, character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and building scale. This, Proposal is clearly in violation of the standard. The character of the surrounding area is entirely single family homes governed by the most restrictive zoning regulations in the city of Chicago zoning code. This proposal is out of character in terms of use, density, and building scale. Finally, whether the proposal infrastructure facilities and city services will be adequate to serve the proposed development at the time of occupancy. As the witness statements already submitted indicate, the current public infrastructure facilities, in particular the sewer system, is already overburdened and only designed to handle water runoff from single family homes, not a large commercial building as this. I'm seeing I'm running out of time here because I didn't get unmute, so I'll quickly move to my summary. This proposal was originally presented as a dire desire to enhance the dining facilities and allow greater access to the outside green space. But over the course of the last year, the reality is set in for the neighborhood residents. This is an attempt to change the entire character of this facility from a nursing home to more of an independent and assisted living facility. A close look at the proposal, proposal reveals that they, they have a new movie theater, a new health club, an enormous new event space, and even a bar. This proposal, taking into consideration the fact that there is no public transportation in close proximity, does not have sufficient parking. They need to have one-to-one -one parking for the 62 units proposed. 
the street, the street parking should not be added to the required parking count and they should be required to have the required off street parking in conformance with the applicable provisions of the zoning ordinance. Thank you Obviously very much. My main concern is parking. Thank you so much. One of the things I just want to point out to you also is that we did not start your timer until you started speaking. So we so we we didn't uh, include in there the mute the mute, muted time. Thank you so much, Mr. Lusk. Mr. Michael Simi. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm Michael Simi. I live at 6842 West Hobart. I'm a retired City of Chicago employee. Uh, good morning, all officials and attendees. I respect your time and matter um, and considerations for this. We are not opposed to the home's expansion. It is the magnitude of which they want to change the footprint of our city's history in Old Norwood Park. I am a lifelong resident of the City of Chicago, not a transplant to the city. We bought here in 1991 due to the green space and open nearness of the area in big lots, mature trees, and low vertical buildings. We love the quality of life here. The home wants to build basically a 40 foot wall with no setback at the alley, six yards from our lot line, increasing sound pollution, traffic pollution, and reverberation um, and flooding. The construction of this wall will have to have the alley broken up and footings to support this. We use our alley constantly. This will be a burden to our neighbors. The over 30, thousand square foot building will 40 foot high walls will constrict ventilation and wind currents from our air movement and also sunlight and diminish um, this reduces our quality of life the area of floods now is evident in our basements from the last 30 years water runoff will be immense and overrun these residential sewers that were not designed to accommodate today's waters let alone this project it does not fit into a residential area the 40 foot high wall will echo the noise emitted by the Kennedy Expressway in the blue line 400 feet away constantly. It hits the existing addition built in 1972 before the Kennedy went, or sorry, before the blue line went out to O'Hare and bounces off homes now with nowhere to go. Um, the sound is deafening at times and this will only increase it along with the airport noise uh, of two runways that come overhead. That uh, nothing has been addressed for sound mitigation. This is a residential area of single family homes and will diminish our property values and quality of life as we are retired and use our outdoor green space constantly. I have submitted 45 names of residents and not one supported this. I canvassed the adjoining properties that would be impacted the most, all objected. I ask you to please consider our quality of life here as taxpayers who along with you are struggling to help the city shoulder property tax bills as the home pays none but wants to expand their business on our residential area, diminishing our quality of life and our property values. Thank you very much for your time and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, um, same, same to you. Um, I also wanna, I just thank you for, for everybody who's taken the time uh, to come and, and, uh, and uh, share your comments and your thoughts and, um, on, on these different developments. Um, do we have anybody else maybe who had signed in but wasn't here when I called their name but are here now? Anybody we could, um, okay, just want to double check that. Well, I also want to assure everybody that we listen very carefully when you speak, come here, or take the time to come and speak. We listen to you um, and, and uh, we, we definitely, uh, you ask us to consider your points of view and I want to assure you that, that we do. Um, so thank you. Again, it, this is really an important part of our process for you all to take the time and come down here and, and speak with us. And then I know that you also, many of you send us letters or written documents. That also is very meaningful. So again, can't emphasize enough how important your presence here today. So now on the agenda are matters submitted in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Do I have a motion to approve item numbers one and two under the NLAP heading and item number one under the disposition heading? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Garza. Garza. I got it. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. <laughs> and Let's seconded by Commissioner Searle. Thank you both so much. Okay. So um, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Um, Commissioner Brumfeld is not here, right? Yes. Oh, you you came. Okay, great. No, I, I, I've been here from the beginning. I think you skipped over me on the last vote. No, I didn't skip over you. You just might not have heard me. 
Um, so let me let me mark you present. Um, or maybe I did skip over you, but I thought I remember saying your name. Anyway, your name. thank you. Thank you. Thank Chairwoman, you. just to clarify for the record, I think uh, Commissioner Brumfeld, do you want to be marked as yes for the minutes? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I did skip over you on the minutes because I because I didn't hear no. you. Okay. So thank you, Noah, for following up on that. Commissioner. Thank Kern you. Uh, Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Grossman? Commissioner Grossman? All right, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. I love your yeses. It's like these resounding yeses. Uh, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Yeah, Commissioner Tunney, um, I know you're here. Uh, Commissioner Tunney? Okay, so I, as as is sometimes the case, the alderman are in, uh, yeah. in two meetings. Chairwoman, uh huh. This is all uh, Commissioner Wagesbeck. I'd like to be recorded for purposes of quorum first, pres as present, but uh, also yes. vote yes on this. All right, thank you so much. And did you yeah. want to vote yes on the minutes? Were you here for the minutes? No, I wasn't. But okay. yes on the minutes as well, if I could. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Novara is present as well. All right. And so I'll mark you. Not uh, and what about you on the minutes as well? I no. Do I ever see Commissioner Burnett vote yes. Will be dedicated okay. to violence prevention. Fantastic. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, all right, motion passes. Now matters to be. Uh, now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. The first item on the agenda is a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by Hewa Terrace 920 LLC for the property generally located at 920 West Lawrence Avenue. The property is zone B3-5 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The applicant is proposing to renovate the subject property, a 13-story 201 unit affordable senior housing project with 48 off-street parking spaces into a 204 unit affordable senior housing project with 43 off-street parking spaces along with interior and exterior building and landscapes improvement. This is in the 46th Ward. Catherine Hurd will provide the context overview and the applicant will present uh, the proposal. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, my name is Catherine Hurd with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, Highway Terrace is located in the North Region in the Uptown community area. Uptown is an economically and culturally diverse and vibrant community where the total population is approximately 58,000 people. The median age is 36.9. The median household income is slightly less than the median city and regional income. 28% of the population earn less than $25,000 per year, and nearly 50% of the population takes public transit to commute to work. Um, now I would like to pass off to Michael Noonan from Foley and Lardner to go over the details of the proposed project. Thank you for the overview, Catherine. My name is Mike Noonan, and I'm a zoning attorney with Foley and Lardner. As Catherine mentioned, today we are seeking approval under the Lakefront Protection Ordinance for renovation of this project. In addition to the details mentioned, our focus is really on the parking lot as that's the trigger for lakefront protection ordinance here. Um, the building changes are long overdue, improvements that remedy older designs on the facade, including rain leaking through the shear wall and on the end caps, and improvements that bring more light into the building and create better access to the garden and parking. The building is set for a, its financial closing in December and a building permit is required by the lenders in order for the closing to take place. Of course, we'll need lakefront approval in order to get the permit. Hewa Terrace is a 100% affordable senior housing building, which provides 204 affordable units for seniors in the uptown neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. The building is predominantly surrounded by residential and retail with a public elementary school and park several blocks to the north. The building is at the western edge of the Lakefront Protection District. Next slide, please. Building is very well served by both bus and rail transit, and as you can see, qualifies for transit served location benefits 
due to its close proximity to the CTA Lawrence Red Line Station. Hewa Terrace is a fixture of the community and this project enjoys support from Alderman James Kappelman, who I believe may be here today and will speak later if he's present. The applicant would also like to thank staff for their diligence and responsiveness in getting this project before the commission today. Next, I'd like to turn things over to John Suzuki of the Japanese American Service Committee Housing Corporation to provide some background and context about the project. Next slide, please. Good morning, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great, um, well, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm John Suzuki, I'm the president of the Japanese American Service Committee Housing Corporation. And as Michael said, we are the owners of the property located at Sheridan and Lawrence, uh, it's commonly known as Haywood Terrace. To give you a little bit of background, uh, after World War II, Chicago became the home of a significant number of Japanese Americans that were relocated from West Coast internment camps. And as you can imagine, this group struggled to find jobs and adequate housing for many years. And it took decades for the Japanese American community to, to recover. Especially hit hard were the first generation immigrants that were in their 50s, 60s, and 70s when the war ended. So to address the housing problem, a group of second generation Japanese Americans formed the Japanese American Service Committee Housing Corporation in the late 1970s to help their parents find housing. My grandparents were the first generation immigrants and my grandmother was one of the original tenants of Hewa Terrace. Sorry about that phone going on in the background. I apologize, I can't stop it. That's okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, the JSC Housing Corp gained support of the city of Chicago who generously donated the land in the uptown neighborhood and HUD who provided housing, uh, pro provided project financing and a HAP contract to subsidize the rent for the qualified senior citizens. At the beginning, the Japanese Americans were the vast majority of the tenants in the property and the property became the focus of the community and a source of pride. Since then, the project has very much evolved. Now only about 10% of the units are occupied by Japanese Americans. The balance of the tenants have profiles that reflect the full diversity of the city of Chicago. In addition to providing affordable housing for all, all groups, the Japanese American Housing Corp has also provided employment to a diverse staff. Uh, many of those staff members have been with us for over 30 years. Fast forward for 40 years now, the loan is scheduled to be paid off in December. Uh, received dozens of offers to purchase the property. Even though the sale would net significant proceeds for our organization, uh, our group unanimously voted to maintain ownership and continue uh, to provide affordable housing, affordable housing for the city of Chicago. And in doing that, all the equity that we've accumulated over the last 40 years, we're rolling over into the property, into the investment, into the uptown neighborhood. We're not taking any money out uh, at this closing. With that, because we've had built up significant equity, we've decided to go forward with a $35 million renovation of the property. Um, that includes tax credit refinance, uh, tax credits in our refinance. And we've assembled what we think is a team that's best in class of the related companies, Landon Bill Baker Architects, Foley and Lardner, and Applegate to execute our project. And we, we, have really, we are very grateful for the support of Alderman Kappelman and his chief of staff, Tressa Fair. Uh, with that, uh, we're looking forward to continuing this project and you know, contributing to the whole city of Chicago for the next 30, 40 years. Thank you, John. This is Mike Noonan with Foley and Lardner. Um, next, I'd like to hand it off to Brad McCauley of Site Design Group and Jeff Bone of Landon Bone Baker to go through the renovation in a little more detail. Um, next slide, please. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, this thanks, is Brad McCauley. Great, yep. I'm sorry. Just to remind you guys, if you could be mindful of time too, but, but this, is, this is great. Keep going, sorry to interrupt. 
Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll make sure I expedite my slides. Um, for the record, my name is Brad McCauley. I'm the managing principal at Site Design Group. Thank you all for taking the time this morning. Um, first and foremost, for, for these few slides, just wanted to reorient everyone with the, the site. Uh, just, you know, north is up, the lake is to the east. Um, the site's at the corner of Sheridan and Lawrence. And just as a reminder, the, the lakefront protection ordinance basically ends at Sheridan Road there to the west. So we're, we're right there at the limit. Um, for the, the project site, um, you mentioned the garden to the west. Uh, there's the building in the center of the property and the parking lot to the east. I'll get a little bit more into, into detail with, uh, with all three areas. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for this one, I wanted to start with the, the west side. These are just wanted to show people a few images of the garden. It's a beautiful space. There's only really two Japanese gardens in the city of Chicago, and this is, this is one of them. So it's just an honor to, to be working on it. Um, they've already started doing so much needed improvements. So you can see it's, it's really beautiful. In terms of work that's being done there, it's, it's minor improvements, um, you know, some, some back to maintenance. The, there's an existing uh, black metal fence um, that's gonna be switched to a, a nice wood slat. You'll still be able to see through it, but it'll warm up the space and really kind of soften it and, and really tie back to kind of the furnishings and everything and just make that even, even better. Um, going to the next slide, so the east side, what we have here, and I think this is really the, the big topic of conversation, uh, is this the parking lot. You can see that it's not a very permeable surface. It's a standard asphalt lot that you kind of see all over the city. Um, doesn't fully meet the landscape ordinance. It's surrounded by chain link fence on the, the north and east sides there. Um, so it's not the, not the prettiest thing to look at. So we're, we've focused a little bit of time and, and energy and effort on this one. And, and that's what I'll get into next on the next slides. I can go to next slide. Um, so you can see here the areas in green, and uh, this, that's really where the, the impact zone is to the parking lot. We're bringing this up to City of Chicago Landscape Ordinance. Um, right now, along Lawrence, there's some missing teeth. You know, trees aren't there, uh, you know, that have died or gone away or, or weren't planted. Um, so we're filling those in. Uh, we're adding an island in the center that'll really kind of soften that space, create a nice view shed through the corridor, and also add some permeability um, to the site. And then to the west, we're actually adding a, 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 a right along the building. We're squeezing in a few more trees and a few more, a few more shrubs and whatnot to kind of space. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is kind of a recap of the entire site, and I just wanted to talk about stormwater management. The the red areas are really the impact zones to the site. I mentioned some access and, and improvements to the west. Um, at the north, you'll see a square there that's that's kind of just taking advantage of some space there to to tie to the the community room. And then the red areas on the east to the right of the, the drawing that those are kind of the landscape ordinance improvements here. All that square footage is, is roughly 3,500 square feet, which is far less uh, than the requirement for this to be regulated. And most of this is, um, at, at least a significant portion of this is, is permeable. So it's really only improving um, the conditions there on the site and should be you know, much more for <clears throat> the neighbors and, and community alike to enjoy. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I'll turn this over to Jeff Bone to get into the architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Bone. I'm with Landon Bone Baker Architects. We're the architect for uh, Hewa Terrace. Um, this first slide really is just to show you a little bit about how the building is currently. Um, it's a 13-story building. Um, it's about 40 to 42 years old. It was built um, in the late 70s. Um, it's masonry and the, the, the punched openings for the windows on all the units um, are in place and there's an EFIS panel system um, underneath each of the windows um, as a spandrel system. Uh, the ground floor is all non-residential um, and then to the left is the existing garden. Um, we've got on the end walls, it's kind of an unusual design. Those are shear walls, structural shear walls and there's been um, a lot of uh, water penetration, um, they're mass walls, so we're addressing that in, in uh, the new rehab. Next slide, please. This is an image um, kind of looking west of uh, the vision and starting from the right-hand side, we're gonna um, overclad the existing masonry wall with a rain screen system. So it's gonna be a Swiss, pan a Swiss pearl panel system. Um, we're picking a, a color that harmonizes with the brick that's a more neutral palette. Uh, the new window system, we're going to get rid of the EFIS, um, and there were P-TACs that were punching through those walls, and we're going to put a new um, window system in, um, floor-to-ceiling to bring a lot more light into the units. 
Um, as you can see on the bottom right, there's a new entry canopy as well, which is gonna open that up and really provide a, a pedestrian friendly entry. Next slide. Um, a little bit about the, the ground floor. Um, this is non-residential and it's a pretty robust um, service and community space for the residents. We're reconfiguring it. Um, the the right-hand side on the bottom is the entry. It's gonna be a management area. The upper right is a day room for the residents. There's a lot of puzzles, a lot of artwork that happens. We're gonna be connecting um, and grabbing some outside space um, to the upper right. We've got a host of other services, uh, mail room, laundry room. But I think the big move was to really um, kind of put the corridor on the exterior of the building to bring a lot of natural light into the ground floor and really connect to the sidewalk and also really connect to the garden all the way through the building. Um, on the far left, we've got a solarium space and a fitness room for the seniors. So some really great, great features for the ground floor. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a typical um, residential floor plan. There's 17 units per floor. Um, there's uh, 401 existing units, um, 404 total, and they're all one bedroom units and they're about 500 square feet. Um, we're gonna re redo the corridors with new LED lighting and, and finishes and the units will get new kitchens and the kitchens will be opened up as well as new finishes. So they'll be really nice. Next slide. Uh, these are the elevations. Uh, you can see on the, on the right-hand side, the overclad system that we're gonna be doing on the end walls. We're also gonna be opening up the stairwall um, to have more glass into the stairway to hopefully encourage some, some use for active design. On the left is uh, the south elevation and the ground floor, opening up those windows to bring more light into the ground floor, the common spaces, and then the residential units above uh, 12 stories. Uh, the next slide. Uh, that's just the opposite side, the east and the, the north elevations. Next slide. Um, the palette that we're choosing, we're, we're again trying to respect the existing brick. Um, we want a warm neutral palette with the overclad and warm grays and warm tones for the exterior of the building. The, the image on the left is the, uh, the new window system, which really is gonna open up the, the units for the residents, put a lot more light into the units and ventilation as well, and then get the, the PTAX off the front of the building. Next slide. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mike Noonan, Foley and Lardner here. Uh, real quick to wrap up. Um, as you can see on this slide, the project is going to create a substantial benefit for the area, keeping 204 affordable units in Uptown and creating approximately 135 construction jobs. Uh, both JASCHC and related have a strong track record of diversity, equity, and inclusion and are committed to providing opportunities for M and WBE firms whenever possible. Um, next slide, I'll hand it back to Catherine for the city's recommendation and just wanna thank the commission for their time today and our team is standing by after the city wraps up for any questions you might have. Thank you. Again, for the record, Catherine Hurd from DPD. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials um, submitted by the applicant and has concluded that this proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance as they apply to development in the private use zone, such as um, the proposal will increase personal safety by improving and revitalizing an existing development and maintaining the residential character of the property consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. The proposal will promote a harmonious relationship between the Lakeshore Parks and the Community Edge. The project will provide improvements in the private use zone that will result in continued residential use in the neighborhood and enhance landscaping by upgrading an existing service parking lot to include more vegetation. And the proposal is consistent with the pattern of existing development in the surrounding neighborhood. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator for, of the Department of Planning and Development that this application being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved subject to compliance with the plans presented to you today. At this point, I will pass off to Mike Noonan to field any questions. Thank you very much. Commissioner Nevada. 
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my comments are directed to Mr. Suzuki and the uh, Japanese American Service Committee Housing Corporation. And um, Mr. Suzuki, I'm a I'm a commissioner on the on this commission, plan commission, but I'm also the housing commissioner for the city. And um, one of the things that uh, many of us know is that we have a 120,000 unit affordable housing gap in the city. And often we talk most about adding new places to call home for people who need more affordability. But just as important is that we don't lose any of the places that we already have. And so I just want to give my heartfelt thanks to you and to the committee for your commitment doubling down here on the community of Uptown and its residents um, and, and diving back in uh, for another uh, set of hopefully many decades of providing uh, this great service to the community. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. What about uh, Alderman Kappelman? Is do we have a, a either a letter or is Alderman Kappelman here? Uh, Chair, when his his uh, chief of staff Tressa Fair is here, I'm not sure if she'd like to speak, but she's on the call. Gee, I thought we were going to get through this one quickly. Okay, Commissioner Cox. No, no, I'm going to uh, just uh, again second. Uh, Commissioner Navarra's uh, comments about the, um, the commitment of long-term affordability and, uh, and just some of the simple moves that the architecture team made. Uh, I was taken by the height uh, when I saw in the drawings, seven, seven feet, 10 inch floor to, floor to ceiling height and what a difference it's going to make to open up the full wall in glass. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's an, a, a mark improvement uh, on the quality of life and livability of the units. But also, you know, obviously this garden is uh, a, a jewel in the neighborhood and I appreciate at least the uh, landscape architects um, assertion that um, the pedestrian will get glimpses of the garden. Um, it's, not, it's not easily discernible or understandable from the renderings just how present um, that will be while you maintain the privacy uh, of the garden, uh, which is one of its qualities. Uh, but I guess I'm encouraged uh, and uh, believe him uh, that the passerby will be able to have views uh, into the garden and just again, applaud their effort to take some of that sensibility in the garden and bring it to the parking lot. Uh, it's uh, going to be an amazing, um, addition. So I guess my only point of clarity is perhaps if they could talk about exactly uh, what the view experience is going to be like for the pedestrian uh, as they uh, pass by this garden. Uh, but otherwise, again, it's, uh, it's really just a wonderful, wonderfully sensitive um, project. And I applaud the, the team and the developer for their commitment. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I can hand that question over to Brad McCauley of Site Design Group. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Brad McCauley from Site Design Group again, for record. Um, for this one, it's, it's currently an ornamental irons uh, picket fence right now. So it is relatively transparent. What we're doing is, is basically replacing the pickets with an Ipe slat, so an exotic hardwood. Um, so it'll be, it, it should be the same view shed into the space. Uh, what will be enhanced is they're also doing a lot of, you know, back due maintenance, tree, you know, some tree pruning, all that kind of stuff. So it should open up uh, the view sheds actually quite nice into the space and, and give even more of a glimpse. So um, it will be similar or, or improved e either way with, with the, uh, the improvements here. So we're, we're excited and I think the, the wood will certainly add quite a bit to it. It'll, it'll soften it. Everywhere you look in the city, you see that black ornamental iron. So we're, we're happy that they're, we're moving forward with the wood slat. Great. Thank you. Great. I think we um, echo the um, the resounding applause for for keeping uh, affordable housing. So um, and and also that Japanese garden looks so wonderful. Do I have a motion uh, for so uh, move, guys? Uh, uh, Commissioner Garza, as Garza seconded by Commissioner Reyes. Did I get that right? Yes. Um, or was that you, Burnett, Commissioner Burnett? Who was that? Oh, good. Whoever. Yeah, okay. I, I, it wasn't me. I think it was Commissioner okay, Burnett. Commissioner, Commissioner Burnett uh, first, and then 
And then uh, Commissioner Gray is uh, seconded that. Okay, again, the roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Bronco. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Um, Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. All right. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Cyril. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Tunney. Commissioner Villegas. And Commissioner Wagaspot. Yes. Uh, motion passes. Um, congratulations. This was uh, for Hiwa Terrace 920 LLC for the property generally located at 920 West Lawrence Avenue Street. Um, the, the motion approved finds that it meets the requirements for this approval. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, can you also get me in as a yes, too? I sure shall. Got it. Okay, anybody else? All right, the next item on the agenda is a proposed amendment to plan development number 276 submitted by the Society for the Danish Old People's Home for the property generally located at 5656 North Newcastle mm -hmm. Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property from institutional plan development number 276 to R2-4 residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district and then to institutional plan development number 276 as amended the applicant proposes to construct two three-story lateral additions to the existing building, one on the west side and one on the east side. The resulting expansion would not increase the allowed number of beds within the facility. This would remain at 87 per the original approved plan development. The proposal would include 13 accessory vehicular parking spaces on site and an additional 30 off-street accessory vehicular parking spaces established via grant of privilege along Hurlburt Street. Noah uh, Sopranic will provide the context overview and the applicant will then present the proposal. Mr. Sopranic. Good morning. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. All right. For the record, my name is Noah Sopranic and I am with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, this proposed development is generally located at 5656 North Newcastle Avenue. It's located within the Norwood Park community area of the 41st Ward. The applicant, the Society for the Danish Old People's Home and their development team appear here today for the purposes of amending institutional plan development number 276, which had previously been established on the subject site by approval in 1981. The request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application due to the expansion of their existing development. Uh, as mentioned, the subject site is in the Norwood Park community area. This is within the 41st Ward. The site is located on the far Northwest side of the city the community area measures just over three and a half miles in size with a population just below 30,000 people. The land use in the Norwood Park community area is predominantly single family homes. It is home to what is considered to be the oldest existing building in the city, which is the Southern wing of the noble Seymour Crippen house, which is shown on the bottom right of this slide. The subject of today's amendment is the Danish home, which is currently situated on the subject site and has been since the 1890s. It is located at 5636 North Newcastle Avenue. An image of the existing front entrance is located along West Hurlbut Street, is located on the left hand of your slide. The top middle image shows the yard along Newcastle Avenue. The top right is a view looking along Hurlbut to the west. At the far right of this image, you can make out some of the existing parking stalls that are located along the public right of way. The bottom middle image is the yard at the western end of the building. And at the bottom right, the existing building that abuts the existing public alley located along the south property line. Providing a little bit of neighborhood context, the site is located at the southeast corner of West Hurlbut Street and North Newcastle Avenue, and it's shown in red on this slide. As previously mentioned, the site is surrounded by predominantly single family homes. To the east is the Norwood Park Historical Society. Just beyond that is Taft High School. A little further east and uh, just north of Taft High School is Norwood Park. And then located to the north and west of the site is Mulberry Point Park, Norwood Park Elementary School, 
and Norwood Circle Park. The Norwood Park Metro train station along the UP Northwest line is located approximately one half mile to the north, located by or shown by the blue dot at the top of the image. And the Harlem CTA Blue Station is located about one half mile to the southwest of the site, another blue dot at the lower left of your slide. The subject site is zoned Institutional Plan Development number 276. The applicant will seek to amend this today by application, which will take the project to an RT4, Residential Townhouse Multi-Unit District, and then back to Institutional Plan Development number 276 as amended. Uh, as brought up by public comment, the site also is situated in Special District 1, Norwood Park. Uh, that, that carries with it three specific uh, requirements, all of which will be retained by the applicant. Uh, a 30-foot front yard setback, which will remain unchanged. A lot area of 7,500 per dwelling unit, which is not applicable to this project. And then to have street frontage of 30 feet along the front yard, which this will remain unchanged as a result of this application. So no changes to the compliance to Special District 1 as part of this proposal. Uh, in preparation for the plan commission hearing today, the applicant has held a number of community meetings and open houses. These meetings occurred January 16th of 2019, January or June 18th of 2019, August 21st of 2019, and October 24th of 2019. As a result of those meetings, a final community-wide meeting was held November 6th, uh, 2019. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to the uh, Danish Home Project Development Team to discuss their proposal. Maybe they're either Sarah Barnes or Susan King. I know, I'm, this is Sarah Barnes, commissioners. I'm not seeing my video. I'm not sure how to get advanced. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We, we um, can hear video. Okay, I'll just proceed, I guess, with audio if that's okay for the timing. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, Commissioner Cardova and other esteemed commissioners. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to present this exceptional project to you this morning. I'm gonna be very brief as um, Noah so eloquently as always has taken the words out of my mouth and I think very adequately described the underlying zoning issues and concerns um, and regulations related to the same. I do think it's just important to point out a couple um, preliminary items. Um, that is first and foremost, this is a senior group living facility. It is assisted and skilled nursing living. It is not independent um, residential living for seniors. So that's kind of a unique um, distinction between this and perhaps even the project that you saw before us. Um, as well and towards these same ends, the proposed modification and amendment to this PD will only allow for the physical expansion of the existing building, which as Noah indicated, has been at the site for over 150 years. It is not intended to change the overall operations or the character of the Danish home at all. In fact, we are going to be keeping the same maximum operational standards as the original PD. The um, modifications and renovation of the existing facility is only intended to enhance the evolving live quality of life standards and conditions for the existing residents of the Danish home as well as the staff. I'll let Mr. Scott Swanson get into that a little more with you um, as I pass over the mic to him as well. And as Noah also indicated, we have been working on this project with Alderman Napolitano, the 41st Ward Zoning Advisory Committee as well as the different residents and community members for over two years. Um, in the span of that two years, we have engaged in multiple community meetings and hosted um, several open houses so that we could get all of the feedback from the community as this is such an important project for not only the Danish home, but the community. As a result of those meetings, the development team and operational team did make several modifications to the programming 
which you will see in our further presentation. Um, with that, I'm very happy to pass over the mic and or screen to Scott Swanson, who is the president of the Danish Home. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Swanson. I'm the president and CEO of the Danish Home. And I want to thank you, the Chicago uh, Plan Commission, for the opportunity to speak with you today about our project. Um, the history of the Danish Home, uh, we've been... Uh, we were founded by 12 Danish women in 1891. So we're a little bit over 130 years uh, old and we've been on this property since 1907. We also know that we established the character of the neighborhood back in 1907. This was actually known as the colonies out in this area. The Danish home had their property and the Norwegian home, now Norwood Park Society had theirs. And then of course the housing and that came in around it and around our properties. We serve, uh, we're a boutique, continuing care retirement community, as um, Sarah pointed out. We have 30 sheltered care apartments and we have 14 healthcare beds. Um, the interesting part about our project is our 14 healthcare beds are predominantly semi-private. And although we are enhancing the common area, we will be able then to take um, all of our um, semi-private rooms and change them into private rooms. And as you well know, with COVID-19, uh, private rooms are a much better situation in a healthcare setting. Um, we have three brand monikers. Number one is dining services. We pride ourselves in our Scandinavian cuisine, although we also offer an American cuisine, but our uh, Scandinavians and people who are here do delight in some of our various uh, Danish type um, dining services. We serve three meals a day, seven days a week to our residents. Resident life is important, getting them out and about and engaged in the community and having volunteers come in. As you well know, we're limited right now because of COVID-19, but we're doing well. And of course, healthcare services. Um, really, you know, this project is first and foremost about common space. Um, the second thing is it moves our mission um, beyond a break even point, which is important for us um, because we can, we're not adding capacity, but we're able to serve a, a few more people. And of course, we can continue our charitable care to the community. We do over $300,000 of charitable care per year to the area community um, in Norwood Park and just the Chicago area. Um, so with that, um, that is the Danish home. We're quite the delightful little place and, um, and tucked away very nicely in, in Norwood Park. Thank you for your time. Um, with that, commissioners, we are going to now turn it over to Ms. Susan King with HED um, Architects, who is going to walk you through the programming for the proposed renovations. And again, I'm going to ask you all to be mindful of the time. Yes, ma'am. Morning, right, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. We'll look open up, but we can hear you. Okay, uh, can you move to the slide? I will try to go as um, quickly as I can. Uh, have the next slide. Next slide. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's just while I was waiting. I'm a principal with an architect with Harley Lestaro. And uh, these renderings um, on the left, as you saw earlier, is the existing conditions in what we will call the, the front yard of, um, of the project. And then on the uh, left, you will, I'm sorry, on, <laughs> on the right, on the left is the existing conditions, on the right is uh, the one of the two additions planned as part of some this revision to the um, um, to the PD, and so we're planning a new entryway um, with some uh, dining above it for the residents and a couple of units as well. And the important thing about the new entry is anyone who's been to the place, um, we are actually uh, addressing accessibility and universal design in that uh, when this is completed, residents and everyone everybody coming in will have access to what we refer to as the garden level, which is where the common amenity spaces are. Right now, it's, it's rather convoluted and um, difficult to maneuver and way that's the analysis about what you replace with a straight, um, you know, no threshold uh, 
way, which will get an added benefit to the residents who, who live here. Um, and we were, in, we were also in keeping and have worked with the historic department because Ms. this Ms. isn't. You're, you're really, you're breaking up a lot. We can kind of make out what you're saying. I'm wondering if you, if you didn't use the headphones, if that might improve it, or it may just be a function of your connection, but, um, but you're, but you're okay. You can try unplugging. I thought that would help. Let me, uh, let me try and plug. I think Ms. King, if you turn off your video, your audio okay. might. Uh, that your bandwidth situation. Hey, yeah, maybe take off your video. Maybe that'll Are help. you able to hear me at all? It's still... no, I'm going to turn off your video. Yeah, do you have another um, another I'm device that's hooked into us? Yeah, do you have another, um, another device that's hooked into us? Oh, boy, no. No, I'm, yeah, no, I don't. Okay, um, actually, that's an improvement. How about now? That's an improvement, yeah. Any better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, actually, that's an improvement. That's an improvement, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to talk very loudly as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, I did want, to, well, I'll come back to it and plan, but we have been working with the historic, we are an orange building, the building was built in three phases, and there are two parts that are in the, that are marked orange. Um, now, but to go more quickly, because I know we were with time constraints, uh, this is the rear, and uh, in working with the, um, uh, with the Danish home, and in the spirit of their desire to keep uh, um, a Danish look to the building, but in a contemporary way on the rear, which is what you see on the right here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So the, now these are blow ups of the two renderings we just, we just saw, uh, yeah, there. And so we did work again closely with, um, with the historic department to make sure the connections between the new and old are distinctive so that it's clear you know, what has been added. And also there was some repositioning at the entryway as well. Go ahead and go to the next one. And so in plan here, again, um, trying to protect the view of the 1920 floor portion of the, the building, um, especially from the, from the street. Um, we actually revised the new building entry in order to maximize um, that, that sight line. And uh, various parking is being added here, primarily at the back at the private alley. And I, I guess I wanna highlight here that the private alley is being redone as part of a stormwater strategy. It is correct, as we heard from one of the objectors this morning about the, um, there was serious flooding issues at this site that will be remediated throughout the course of this project. Our civil engineer is also present to answer any questions about that. But I'll in short say that the nine spaces at the back are new and our, um, that entire private alley that is part of the Danish home, they own that, is, um, will be permeable in the future. Uh, okay, go ahead and uh, go forward. Um, I, on this, this is um, the ground floor. We are expanding the dining for the residents here. There's no restaurants here. And I also want to just clarify that there is a theater spot uh, mention, program space up at the upper left of the slide. And that is intended for uh, residents only for movie nights in the future. So I didn't realize that had, that was causing some concern until today. So that's the intent of that. Go ahead, next. Um, and then uh, the healthcare wing that um, Scott mentioned, we will, we're expanding and all new rooms will be private and he'll be able to um, move some of the people who are sharing rooms into the new wing. And the top floor is um, the assisted. So this is the skill to go ahead and go to the next. So the, and the, the top floor, okay, but they're mislabeled, but these are skilled care uh, units here. And go ahead and go next. Or or I'm sorry, sheltered care. Uh, um, overview again of the site plan in black and white showing the roofing where we are staying in keeping with the heights of the buildings that are there. Yeah, you can go next, sorry. Uh, so the views of the elevation showing how we connect. Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, be, again, being respectful of the existing cornice lines. Yeah, you can keep going and we can come back for questions, Q&A as needed. Um, we are planning to match the masonry that's there and um, a wood-like, you know, glass fiber reinforced concrete to give a wood warm, like feeling again, picking up on, um, you know, skinned, contemporary Scandinavian. 
and the section, and I think I'm almost done. Uh, yeah, there's the required wall sections. Go ahead, next. Um, and then the, the next slides are relatively wordy, but they should capture everything we've already been talking about. So you want to pass through them. We can uh, answer any questions if anybody has anything about that. I think I have the sustainability slide. So yes, we're planning to pursue the 100 points um, as, as outlined in that, um, in that slide and identified. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Actually, thank you, um, Susan. I believe at this point, for the sake of time, thank of, you, um, Susan, of the commissioners um, for the and other projects time. going today, I will turn it back over to Noah, who can um, provide his recommendations. Sure. Uh, sorry. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant, and we've concluded that this proposed development is appropriate on the site for the following reasons. Uh, the proposed development remains compatible with the surrounding residential and institutional developments in terms of land use, as well as density and scale of the structure. The proposed underlying zoning for this development and RT4 and Special District 1 is consistent with other zoning districts, both adjacent to the subject site and in the immediate area, and it remains consistent with the underlying zoning designation proposed for the site originally. The proposed amendment to this plan development continues to promote economic development uh, in terms of beneficial development patterns, and it's compatible with the character of the neighborhood. The project continues to promote transit, pedestrian, and bicycle use. It ensures accessibility to the site for persons with disabilities. It minimizes conflicts with existing traffic patterns in the vicinity. No traffic patterns have been changed as a result of this proposal on any of the streets surrounding the facility. All sides and areas of the buildings that are visible to the public will be treated with materials, finishes, and architectural details that are of a high quality and are appropriate for use on primary public right of way facing facades. And lastly, the application was circulated to other city departments and agencies and all comments received have been addressed by the team uh, that's assembled here today. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding the project and the plans identified here today. But based on the foregoing, it is a recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application to amend institutional plan development 276 be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Uh, thank you. And just one other word, uh, as we are here today, I did receive an email from Alderman Napolitano. His office apologizes. He's in a budget meeting and cannot be on the call to speak, uh, but he wanted me to state that he has a letter of support um, on file with the city for this project. Thank you, Mr. Sopranic. Commissioner Searle. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up on, I think it was Mr. Sinney's uh, comment yes, on the project. Uh, he, he mentioned a 40 foot wall and maybe that slide of the site plan is good. I don't know. Uh, was he talking about the wall of the new addition of the south, the south wall of the building? Um, or was this some other wall? I mean, if it's the building, I understand. If it's a wall somewhere else, I'm confused. <laughs> I, I, I uh, Commissioner Searle, this is Noah. I believe he is speaking about the south elevation that faces the alley. Um, the, the portion you see here in the gray is the existing building in the existing condition today. Uh, going back to the plan, or actually in the key plan above, uh, the addition will uh, be similar in size. And so it will extend that wall a little further west, um, but right. off of the alley uh, a little bit, as you can see in the top right corner of the key plan there. Okay. And it's as, as shown in the bottom left, does have windows for the rooms and corridors that are being placed there. Right. It, okay. it extends, it's not its height, it extends the width. Is that what you're saying, Noah? That's correct. It will extend further westward, but it will not increase the height that's already there as part of the existing addition of the existing okay. building. Okay. okay, great. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, also, I just wanted, no one mentioned anything about the new courtyard that would be created. It would seem like that would be a great kind of nice landscape space. Um, but we didn't really see any elevations, I mean, or, uh, you know, images of that area. So um, seems like that would be a good spot to have a nice private garden now. Yeah, this is Sarah, Sarah Barnes um, and or Susan. Can you speak to the sure. intent of that space? Because um, you are correct, Commissioner. Um, that space is under, you are out. 
correct. Uh, Dana's mom is going to um, even more further beautify their existing gardens um, in and along that space, but I'll allow Mr. Swanson to address that. Sure. Um, as as our neighbors know, and anybody who knows the Danny Shaw would have been around our grounds, we take great pride in our landscaping and it's beautiful now. And that section already has a wonderful uh, perennial garden right up against the windows of the existing 1924 building that the residents enjoy watching that change colors from spring through fall. And um, that area um, already has a garden in there again, by that 1924 edition. The rest is green space or lawn that we would still preserve. We would obviously add some flower um, arrangements, you know, flower beds with it. And then on the west end, there's a passage. Um, it'll be a, like a three season porch on that uh, ground level that will allow access into that area back there for the residents. Um, you can see it, yeah, it's the, it's the glass in the, on the first, on the ground level there where you see that person walking by. Um, so we are very, we take great pride in our landscaping. A lot of our uh, donors and those who are interested in the Danish home are very successful uh, landscaping and, and propagators in the Midwest uh, for landscaping companies. And so they uh, take great pride in our garden. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, thank you, Commissioner. So I want to follow on the same line of Commissioner Searles uh, related to comments made by Mr. Simi. So, um, so I thank you for asking the question about a 40 foot wall. I wanted to get that clarified. What about the setback? He's saying that there is no setback, but Mr. Zafranek, I heard you say that, the, or someone say that there will be no changes in the setback, that the setback uh, remains yep. the same. Chairwoman, this is Noah again. So the existing setback that uh, is there today uh, mm -hmm. from Hurlbut to the building you can see in gray hair is mm -hmm. 60 feet. So the additions will remain you know, south of that required setback. It's actually a 30 foot required setback based on the um, 30 foot required setback based on the special district, but they are actually at 60 feet and they're not extending beyond that. Also, mm -hmm. you know, they're maintaining on the Newcastle side they have a 30 setback requirement as well. They're maintaining that and not extending beyond that. And then also to the west, they own that private alley to the large uh, dark dotted line. They're maintaining a 25 foot setback on that side as well. There is not a required setback um, um, here at the rear. It was set at zero as part of the original plan development approval in 1981. So their new building will not, uh, will not be any worse than that. It will actually, you know, you can see that little triangle of green space it's actually shifted about five feet north of uh, where the existing building hits the lot line today, but they will be retaining the existing zero foot setback that was approved originally in 1981. But it is adding more building up against that back setback. C correct, heading to the west, there will be more building line at the 40 foot height uh, that this building is uh, existing at. And that's the one we were just talking about. There's an extension of the width. That's correct. I, th I think the exact measurement is 37 and change. Let me get that for you. 37.9. Yep. Uh, an additional width. Okay. Um, the other qu another question that was asked, um, a comment that was made by Mr. Simi was about that. He said that, quote, the alley is being broken up. So, um, so I, I assumed he was referring to the public alley in back. Um, is he referring to the private alley? Uh, the development team probably should take that, Sarah, or the engineer is here, Mr. Price, correct? Yep. Um, oh, go ahead, because I'm going to ask, ask Mr. Price a question, too, after that one. Go ahead. So, Commissioner, um, I'll actually, this is Sarah Barnes again. Um, I believe that the witness was speaking with regard to the public alley. Um, as that is where the new addition is going to be um, erected along. So I will allow our civil engineer, Mr. Price, to address that and then any further questions that you may have. Okay. Mr. Price? And Mr. Price, the comment was that the alley was being broken up. So if, that, you, can, if you can address the comment, thank you. Uh, sure, this is uh, Tom Price. Um, I, we are making no changes to the public alley, so I'm not sure what the comment 
was referring to. They may have been referring to the private alley. The private alley is, you know, to the general public may appear as a public alley, um, just because it's, you know, it's accessed from the, from Hurlbut, et cetera. It is in very poor condition and uh, is being repaved in permeable paving as part of this project. So people will still be able to use that private alley, but it, but uh, I guess you're saying they are, they currently do. And so uh, they're not, you're not blocking off their access. That is correct. There's two to three um, existing residences to the West there that um, access their garages via that, that private alley and, and there'll be no changes that would prevent them from, from doing that. Okay. Um, and then uh, what about the, during construction time would, will the public alley be, uh, are you going to be, is it, it, will the access of public alley be affected during the construction period? The, the public alley should not be uh, affected by the project. Okay, fantastic. Now, the other question uh, that I think you might be able to address, Mr. Price, was related to water runoff. Mr. Simi also raised questions about um, concerns about water runoff. But I heard you say that you were doing, the, there was some improvement on the, um, on the water runoff. So if you could address that, that'd be great. Uh, yes, so the project will be required to meet the City of Chicago Stormwater Ordinance and what we're proposing meets and actually exceeds the, the requirements of that ordinance. Currently, drainage from the properties to the west drain on, including the alley, drain onto the Danish home property and lead to sort of drainage problems in the patio area. Uh, the existing patio area and actually at times has run uh, to the front door that is level with the, or I should say the back door at the, that uh, is level with grade there and has caused some flooding problems in that area. So the intention is, is that the permeable paving from the alley will intercept some of the runoff from the neighbor's properties and will also reduce the runoff from the alley and then there will be some additional stormwater that's provided to uh, address, you know, the, the flooding problem on the Danish home property and also meet the stormwater ordinance um, requirements. Uh, on the east side of the property, there is the, with the new entryway and the new building, there will be stormwater required for that area as well. And just the, due to the nature uh, the drainage patterns there, it will actually be dealt with separately from the improvements on the west side, but there's plenty of room there on the east side to provide adequate uh, stormwater to meet the stormwater ordinance. And so the, the runoff should actually be less from the property than it is today after the improvements are completed. And you said it'll be dealt with separately on that other side, but but it'll be dealt with at this time though, it's part of the same, the same record. Uh, well, I guess let me defer to um, the but is there, architect. Is there, is there currently an, a, a, a runoff issue on that side where it's, where it's going to be addressed separately? Uh, on the west side of the property, there there is runoff on the Danish home property. I'm not aware of any runoff issues for the uh, neighboring properties. Okay. Um, and then uh, this may or, I, this may or may not be something that you can answer. This might have to be passed back to the developer. But uh, again, uh, looking at the comments made by Mr. Simi, he mentioned the issue of sound mitigation. Um, and so we're not adding more residents. We're just expanding to allow for more private rooms. That's what I hear you say you're doing and um, some other or shared space, but it, are we going to have a sound mitigation issue or a sound issue? I'm not sure who of you. Can I think this is Scott Swanson. I'm happy to answer that. Um, okay. You know, as uh, Noah pointed out, we had over four meetings with the neighbors, and that was brought up very early. And one of the members who is on uh, Alderman Napolitano's. Uh, commission, not commission, I don't know what they call it, but that uh, reviewing board um, that was brought up to that group and a couple of members reviewed that and just said, this really isn't, you know, uh, an issue because, you know, I-90 is there as well as the CTA. And so, um, 
you know, it's, and it's far away from um, that, you know, where that sound is coming from. And so they really kind of, uh, you know, just said, you know, it's really not a big issue. And so they, they didn't pursue it any further. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final final comment by Mr. Simi was that he felt this would affect the quality of life for the residents. And I, and I say Mr. Simi, but actually there was a, a letter that we received that had several signatures on it. Um, and so I think he was might be representing a group of people, but the last comment he made was about high, affecting the high quality of life in the neighborhood. Well, I guess if he's referring to quality of life uh, for the neighbors themselves, I think um, it well, as you can see, we're staying well within the boundaries of our property. We're actually allowing our own residents to have better access to our garden area. We're really focusing more of the pedestrian traffic or the residents use to the west end of the property, that big garden area. That's what that'll allow us to do. Um, and, you know, we're not, I mean, we're adding some parking, so, and we're enhancing uh, the existing parking along Hurlbutt. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I also know, I mean, I read the notes from the neighbors. We do have quite a few neighbors who are in favor of us. They look at us as a, quite a, a great neighbor. In favor of us. They look at us as a great neighbor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Sorry, Commissioner. This is Sarah Barnes again, if I may, oh, since I, I was Sarah also asked again, if I <laughs> Um, with regard to the overall impact on the other property owners and residents of the neighborhood, I actually believe based on some of the modifications that we've made as, as well as other improvements that we're going to have to continue to commit to and make for the rest of the permitting process, which does include that stormwater review. So although we may have only indicated the permeable pavers at this point in time, we will have to pass through the stormwater, fully through the stormwater review um, for this site as part of the plan development process. And we will not be allowed to get permits for the proposed renovations until we have met and exceeded the new standards for stormwater retention. So as a result of just those improvements alone, I think we should actually be benefiting the neighborhood as a whole. Obviously the Danish home is not the only um, improvement in the area that is contributing to flooding. It's unfortunately found throughout the city, but we should actually be improving the conditions at and around the property that have been there for over a hundred years, just through those improvements. Um, and as well, like Mr. Swanson indicated, we'll, um, and as we'll have um, bring that existing parking on Hurlbut into compliance. And Dana Chom has agreed to allow the public to utilize that parking um, for when its staff is not utilizing it. So that should be just another added benefit in addition to all the community events that the Danish home has hosted and will continue to host over the years. Yeah, I did get that impression looking, listening to Mr. Price about the improvements that would probably on the drainage that would probably spill over. Um, okay, and then one final quick question. Um, I noticed in the, in the front area, the improvements you're gonna be making, um, there, there's a there's a loss of trees. Are there a lot of trees that will be being removed from this area? Um, um, Hi, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me. This is Susan. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, we will be losing a few trees. We can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay. There will be a few trees um, that will be removed primarily on the west side where the new addition is going, but there will be new new trees planted um, to kind of compensate for that. And if I may, I, I also wanted to address that we we are not, we did do shadow studies as well, and you can see some of that here in this drawing, that we are not affecting the sunlight to the south of us. Um, all of our shadows will be casted, you know, because we are facing south, we'll be cast it onto our own property as is indicated here. Just to piggyback oh, yeah. that onto the I'm other glad you added that. issue and, and I'm, clarification. Oh, from yeah. I'm glad you added that because I think there was a comment mm -hmm. about that. So I was wondering about that too. Great. That Thank you. Um, this is Tom Price. The Just if I could add to that, the, you can see on this rendering that the shows the trees that are, um, I believe those are all existing trees that are, that are shown 
um, in the kind of the Northwest and around the building. And so I think the rendering perhaps may have been you know, remove some of the trees just so you could see the building and such, because uh, otherwise they'd be blocked by the those trees. And so I think it was more of a graphic issue than actual um, trees being removed. They're they're really only being removed where the building new building is, and to accommodate uh, some of the uh, added parking along the private alley. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions from commissioners. We do have a letter on file of support from Alderman uh, Napolitano. Do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to plan development number 276 submitted by the Society for the Danish Old People's Home for the property generally located at 5656 North Newcastle Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Seconded by, Seconded by Commissioner Searle. Seconded by Commissioner Searle. Again, I must do the roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Gaza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Kelly. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not Kelly. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Commissioner Wegesbach? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Okay. The next item on the agenda is proposed amendment to residential business plan development 1420 submitted by Triangle Square Condominium LLC for the property generally located at 1701 West Webster Avenue. The applicant proposes to amend residential business plan development 1420 to add one additional dwelling unit to sub area C that is proposed to be improved with the seven story 98 foot tall residential building containing 72 dwelling units and 72 parking spaces. No other changes are proposed as part of this application. Emily Trun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are proposing to amend residential business plan development 1420 to add one additional dwelling unit to sub area C prior to establishing residential business plan development 1420 as amended. The subject site is located in the Logan Square community area. There are over 42,000 people in the area with 61% of the population between the ages of 20 and 69. The median household income is over 75,000. The triangular shaped site is bordered by Webster Avenue, West Webster Avenue to the north, the Chicago Northwestern Railroad to the east and North Elston Avenue to the southwest. The site was previously vacant and construction has commenced on the site since the plan development was adopted in 2018 to allow for the construction of a mixed use residential and commercial development. A minor change was approved in May 2020 to allow for the addition of three residential units in this plan development. With this request to add an additional unit, the proposal necess necessitates a trip to plan commission for an amendment since a minor change was previously grant granted to increase the unit count and the applicant is proposing to increase the number of dwelling units approved in the original plan development in the excess of three. The site is within less than a quarter of a mile of the Clybourne Metro platform and therefore is eligible to receive transit served location benefits. It is also located near the number nine Ashland CTA bus line. The zoning districts in the immediate area are a variety of commercial districts, manufacturing districts, and plan developments 907 and 1110. The site is located in the north sub area of the North Branch Industrial Corridor. This is a rendering of the previously approved seven story residential building in sub area C, where the applicant is proposing to add an additional unit. This is a view of the building along Webster Avenue looking east. And this is a rendering of the previously approved development looking southeast at the corner of Elston and Webster Avenues.
There are no changes proposed with the site plan or facades or elevations of the buildings approved in the 2018, approved in 2018 with this amendment. The proposal is subject to the North Branch Framework Plan adopted by the Chicago Plan Commission on May 18, 2017. The goals of the plan are to maintain the North Branch Industrial Corridor as an important economic engine and vital job center within the city of Chicago, provide better access to all transportation modes and build upon the North Branch Industrial Corridor's unique natural and built environment. Now I will turn the presentation over to Jeff Goulet, the project architect who will further explain the details of the proposal. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Jeff Goulet, principal with the architecture firm of Sullivan Goulet Wilson Limited. Um, as Emily noted, um, the plan development was approved in September 2018. We had a minor change uh, administratively approved in May 2020 to add three units and we're now here seeking to add one additional dwelling unit to sub area C. No changes are proposed to the site plan or the design of the buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, as the chart shows here, uh, just summarizing that request for simply adding one unit, which would increase sub area C from 71 units to 72, and the total on site from 369 units to 370 units. Next slide, please. Uh, the site plan is unchanged from what was previously approved. Next slide. Uh, the ground floor plan is also essentially unchanged from what was previously approved. Access to the parking, the, the interior parking garage, as was previously the case, is from uh, Webster Street. 72 parking spaces are provided for the proposed 72 units. This is the second floor plan. We simply reconfigured interior space to accommodate the additional unit that has, is being requested. Next slide. These are the third through seven floor plans. And similarly, interior space was reconfigured to um, achieve the added unit. Next slide. Uh, we will be uh, keeping consistent with our um, strategies to meet the principles of the North Branch Framework Plan. No changes there. Next slide. We will similarly uh, be keeping consistent with our compliance with the Affordable Housing Ordinance, nine affordable units having been provided on site in sub area A and the payment as noted to the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. Next slide. Uh, similarly, we will be remaining consistent with our goals of achieving the MBE and WBE uh, requirements. Next slide. Emily, Department I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal is consist consistent with the goals in the North Branch Framework Plan. It ensures a level of amenities that are appropriate to the nature and scale of the project and is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and building scale. Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, the zoning administrator recommends that the application to amend residential business plan development 1420 be approved and forwarded to the city council committee on zoning landmarks and building standards as such. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any comments from or questions from commissioners. Um, Alderman Weigesbeck, would you like to make a comment or a statement on this uh, proposal? Uh, Chairwoman, I should recuse myself from this, but we had sent in a letter of no objection to it uh, to NOAA and staff. Okay, great. So uh, as, as Alderman, you've written a letter as commissioner, you're gonna recuse yourself. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do I have a motion on the proposed plan development submitted by Triangle Square Condominium LLC for the property generally located at 1701 West Webster Avenue Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Moved by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by? Commissioner Searle. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner Searle. I'm not seeing any, need, any further comments, so I'll do the roll. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Garza. 
Commissioner Grossman? Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Dreyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? And Commissioner Wagesbach recuses himself. Uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Garza. Sorry, I was uh, distracted. I'm, I'm a yes. Okay, great. Got you down as a yes. Thank you so much. Uh, motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is an amendment to residential business plan development 1430. Submitted by Ogden Washtenaw JV LLC for the property generally located at 1257-1411 South Washtenaw Avenue. 1256-1368 South Tallman Avenue and 1355-65 South Tallman Avenue and 2604-2664 West Ogden Avenue. The applicant is proposing to amend the allowed uses within residential business plan development 1430 to include drive-through facility. This will allow for the addition of a drive-through automated teller machine to sub area B of the property. Brian Hacker will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Hacker. Thank you, Chairwoman and uh, Commissioners. Let me pull my presentation up here for you. Okay. So yes, this is a proposal to uh, amend PD 1430, which is known as the Ogden Commons development. And this amendment is required because of the uh, proposal to add a drive through to a wind trust bank that will be a tenant in this development. Uh, this is located in the North Lawndale community. Uh, so this is a, a west side community with uh, roughly 34,000 in total population. Uh, it's recently seen a decline in population and it is a uh, predominantly low income uh, community. So uh, this uh, development will bring some much needed uh, retail and uh, mixed income housing in an area that has not seen much development uh, as of recent. This uh, slide shows the context for the uh, PD. As you can see, outlined in yellow is the boundary of PD 1430. And in uh, the outline of red, there is the subject site where the current phase one of Ogden Commons is under construction and is also the site uh, that the amendment applies to. Uh, but just to um, provide a little bit more background here, you, know, you can see uh, to the uh, south and southwest and west, are the Mount Sinai uh, Healthcare Campus. They have several facilities in the vicinity here. Uh, to the southeast is the Cinespace Film Production Studio. Uh, they also have several buildings uh, going south along Rockwell. Uh, to the west and northwest, uh, west and north, there's also a residential neighborhood there. And then to the east, there is uh, several other industrial facilities. To take a look at the zoning map, this just reflects the uh, context that I gave. Uh, you've got several other PDs due to the uh, large institutional developments and the uh, Cinespace campus there as well. But then you've also got some uh, RT4 residential uh, districts there and directly to the north, PD 1138 is a townhome development. To provide a little bit of background on the Ogden Commons project, this is a, a large scale development that was uh, approved by uh, Plan Commission in November of 2018, at least the PD 1430 section of it that I showed outlined previously. Uh, this was, this is going to be uh, constructed on uh, former CHA land and the development team was chosen by a competitive process. Uh, and that team is made up of a uh, partnership of the Habitat Company, who will be a uh, part of this presentation, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, and Cinespace. 
And the first phase of this project is currently under construction, which I will uh, get to very shortly here. To provide some planning context here, uh, North Lawndale recently approved a uh, quality of life community plan that uh, applies in the entire North Lawndale community. This was led by the North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council, also known as NLCCC, uh, in partnership with LISC and the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, relevant points from that document here are uh, the identified need for complete streets improvements to Ogden Avenue, which if you're familiar with it is a wide roadway that uh, poses uh, pedestrian challenges. Uh, it also recommends that Ogden Avenue be uh, uh, central uh, to expansion of retail amenities in the community. And it identifies this site in particular as an opportunity to add affordable housing. This site plan here shows phase one of the Ogden Commons project. Uh, the north is uh, to the right here. Um, the outlined uh, parcel there or site there is the aspect of phase one that's currently under construction right now and the site uh, where the drive through facility is being proposed. Uh, that building that you can see there is a three-story mixed-use building that will have office on the uh, second and third floors and ground floor retail on the first floor. The second and third floor uh, fl office space will be occupied by a, a Sinai's Ambulatory Care Center, which recently received some funding from the city of Chicago. Uh, on the first floor are two restaurants as well as the Wintrust Bank. That's uh, the subject of our uh, amendment here. This is an image of the phase one site that we're looking at uh, before construction commenced. So it was a surface parking lot previously. Uh, here are some photos of that mixed use building that I described under construction right now. Uh, and uh, it's uh, you know nearing completion at this point. Here are some renderings of what the uh, building will look like once it's complete. This is a view from Ogden Avenue. So looking at it from the southwest corner of the site, uh, as you can see, there's some outdoor dining space planned here. And uh, this tenant space would be occupied by a, a restaurant. Uh, both of these restaurants actually received uh, uh, financial incentives from the city of Chicago. This is the uh, eastern elevation of the building. And so uh, this is where the Wintrust Bank would be located in the tenant space that you're looking at in this rendering. And so now uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Scott Morse, Jeff Head, and, Jeff Head and Jeff the Ogden County. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, can the Members of the commission hear me? Yes, yes, Scott. Yes, we can hear you. No, we can't. Uh, Scott, I believe you're frozen. Uh, Jeff Head or Jeff Leitz, uh, would one of you mind stepping in, please? Yeah, I can, I can step in. This is Jeff Leitz with uh, Charles Fitzgeorge Architects, uh, Architects for uh, the Wintrust Bank Facility. Uh, we uh, had originally proposed uh, a site plan that shows a drive-through facility um, in the southeast corner of this development exiting onto West Ogden Avenue. Through DPD review and CDOT review, they requested that we uh, reviewed alternate locations for the drive-through to preserve the pedestrian uses of Ogden Avenue and to uh, preserve the green space that was uh, originally planned for this southeast corner. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So what we came up with is moving the drive-through facility to the northeast corner of our, of our property. It is uh, shown in this plan. It's about uh, 40 feet set back from the curb. Um, what this plan did was uh, eliminate five parking spaces from the original uh, 2018 plan, but we did, uh, as I stated earlier, return the green space back into that southeast corner. Uh, uh, 
we did review this with DPD and CDOT, and they both uh, offered their uh, design approvals on this. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, I can get into more detail on our specific location. Uh, in this northeast corner, you can see the area in red there. That is our uh, drive-through space. Uh, the enclosure is the ATM facility. The ATM facility is uh, set back about 15 feet, two and a half inches from our property line. There is a, a landscape buffer with uh, ornamental black fence that will match that of the development. Uh, as you exit the drive-through uh, on the south, you can, uh, you know, turn to the east and uh, use an, an existing drive-through, or you can turn to, to the west and exit on to 13th place, which is a two-way drive. You wanna to go to the next slide? The elevations of the ATM are, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small facility. It's about seven feet by seven, seven feet uh, deep, and then uh, about nine, and, uh, nine foot nine inches tall from the curb, so about 10 foot three inches from the pavement. Uh, it is an aluminum structure. It'll be painted to match the Windcrest blue with uh, identification markings as shown on this plan. So with that, I will, uh, you know, obviously answer any any questions. Uh, then turn back over to uh, Brian. Uh, Brian and members of the Planning Commission, can you hear me? This is Scott Borstein again. Yes, we can. I, I'm sorry about that. I, I don't, you know, of course, right right when my <laughs> I'm about to talk, I lose my connection. So. Uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, thanks to Jeff. Um, and I don't know if it was mentioned, but it just the, the, the technical reason why we're before you is just that the uh, the drive through ATM wasn't a permitted use within our PD. And uh, we don't really view it as a change of character to the area, but it's a technical uh, uh, a reason that it just wasn't specifically allowed for. So that's why we're we're back here today. Great. Thanks, Scott and Jeff. Uh, I'll go to my final slide here uh, with our recommendation, uh, unless anyone has any questions about the site plan and what we've just shown. No, you go ahead. You present your recommendations, and then we ask questions. Okay, apologies. Uh, so, yes, yeah, DPD does approve uh, this uh, PD amendment application, uh, but it is in line with the uh, recommendations of the Chicago Zoning Ordinance for plan developments. It uh, does support the economic success of Ogden Commons while also uh, preserving the pedestrian oriented frontage on Ogden Avenue. We uh, believe that this uh, circulation design promotes safe and efficient circulation of pedestrians, cyclists, and motor vehicles. Uh, it's locating that curb cut away from Ogden Avenue, which is the primary uh, uh, transportation frontage and puts it on 13th place. Uh, it's also preserving open space on the site uh, because of the location in a, a portion of the site plan that was previously identified for parking. We're keeping that green space that was shown in the previous slide to allow that for uh, to be used for patrons of the, the bank and the restaurants and uh, maintain that as landscaped uh, uh, open space. And that concludes my presentation. I have a quick question for the for the um, developers. I'm not seeing any hands by the um, any other commissioners. So I didn't hear anywhere you met with surrounding neighborhoods neighbor, or surrounding uh, stakeholders in the area. I heard that you looked at the plan, but I didn't hear about any stakeholder meetings. Yeah, uh, Commissioner uh, Brian, you want to go ahead and. Yeah, so this project, because it's an amendment that makes a, uh, a small Brian, adjustment. Brian, let them in. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Scott, please. Okay, sure. I, I, I was just going to add that um, the, of course, this is part of a larger plan development that was already reviewed uh, by the community. And this uh, addition of the ATM or remote banking facility uh, as I say, was uh, banking uses were allowed at the site. Um, and so the addition of the ATM, we felt wasn't, uh, you know, a significant enough change 
uh, that would necessarily merit uh, any kind of full-scale uh, community input. We, of course, talked to the alderman and, uh, you know, asked him if he thought it was necessary to do any kind of community outreach. He said he thought it was fine. And, of course, you should have in your file um, a letter from him uh, indicating his support for the project. Um, so, great. But, uh, and I, I guess maybe just as a general caveat to folks, I mean, I understand the point you're making. I think it's always a good idea, whatever we can do, at least to let people know sort of what's, what's happening, keep people in uh, abreast of the developments, particularly since this is such a big one. This is kind of unrelated, but I'm curious, not only in this phase, but in previous phases and in your forthcoming phases, will you be doing a lot of not only local hiring, but then retaining of the people that you hire? This, this is Jeff Head, uh, Commissioner. Um, I'm, I'm with the Habitat Company. And I, I'd like to both respond to your, <clears throat> your prior question as well. Uh, and just let you know that the, the community process on this development has been pretty robust to the point um, that a new uh, community organizing uh, uh, entity has, has evolved out of it called the, the Ogden Commons uh, Coordinating Council. Uh, it's, uh, it's staffed by Mount Sinai Hospital, which does a lot of community outreach and um, includes leadership from a number of uh, uh, local groups ranging from arts groups to economic development groups, of course, um, uh, North Wandale, uh, North, North Wandale, uh, Wandale Christian and, and others. And as recently as one month ago, I was describing this scenario to them and they, uh, in, in, in a regular scheduled meeting. And um, there's been strong support in general for the project and no objection to the concept. Okay, that. great. What about the question about hiring? Have you, have you hired thus far? Are you retaining the people that you're hiring? Are they well, coming from the yeah. neighborhood? Yeah, thank you for the question. This is the first phase. And so during the construction period, um, we've exceeded the city, our city hiring goals pretty substantially. Um, we're not all the way complete, but we've exceeded the dollars, the, the dollar uh, goals for uh, MBWB hiring during the construction process. And um, the, uh, in, when we move into the operating phase, we have an agreement with the Chicago Housing Authority and um, with, and we're also separately working with um, the coordinating council I just described to you to ensure that um, uh, new jobs, whether they are um, new jobs created by Mount Sinai as part of the, um, uh, the new uh, uh, ambulatory care center or new jobs by the restaurants and uh, Wintrust Bank will be prioritized to residents in the local community. Great, thank you, Mr. Head. And this comment is directed to you, Mr. Head, but uh, I think that's a more general comment, which is that it does become important in these bigger projects, uh, uh, particularly in a neighborhood or in an area where there is such a need for jobs to create the jobs and not only create jobs, but retain people in those jobs, provide opportunities for them to remain in those jobs and provide sort of pathways for them to move up um, into, into um, um, into higher pain and career opportunities in those jobs. So just want, I just encourage you to be mindful of that. Um, do we have, uh, uh, it was mentioned that we have a letter on file for from Alderman uh, Irvin, is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry, and I do see hands from Commissioner Tunney and then Commissioner Cox. Go ahead, Commissioner Tunney, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it's interesting that the PD allowed bank uses, but not the drive-through because in most cases, banks need some kind of drive-through. So that being said, I'm kind of surprised there's only one terminal for ATM. If they're gonna do one, you know, most of them have more than one terminal. And that gets me to the other question, uh, Chairwoman, it, it kind of follows on your thinking. Um, I don't know how it impacts Tallman and how it affects um, 13th Street because I'm not familiar. I'm certainly familiar with um, uh, with Ogden and the need to move it off, but the residents on those streets, um, I hope they're engaged because the traffic pattern 
maybe if there was a traffic study would show how many cars they anticipate and how they would impact the residential quality of life, not Ogden Commons per se, but the, ne the nearby residents. So that, those are my comments and questions. Yeah. Can we get a response to that, particularly around the um, traffic? Laura, are you on the on this? Maybe you can answer the question about the number of, of uh, remote facilities that you need. Uh, good morning. This is Laura Slevko with Wintrust. We are just planning on the one location here. We typically only have um, three to five cars stacked at one time at the very busiest points of the day. We usually don't see more than that in line at any one time. Um, the idea for the lane is mostly just to provide the remote teller as well as convenience of the ATM. We will have another ATM within the bank where customers can walk up and access as well. Great, thank you. What, all right, can we get the question answer that Commissioner Tunney asked around uh, traffic? Not well, this before, we, before we get to that, Chairwoman, mm -hmm. with Wind Trust, why wasn't this part of the original PD? The drive through? Uh, Alderman, uh, uh, Commissioner Tunney, this is Jeff Head again with, with the Habitat Company. Um, the Habitat Company developed the, the or what, took the project through the, the plan commission process, and we had anticipated that Wintrust would likely be a tenant at the time, but we had not executed a lease with them. Um, as, uh, as Council stated at the, at, at the beginning, we understood that, that um, the use would be, we didn't, we didn't realize that it wouldn't be a permitted use, and so that's why we're back here today. Okay. Thank you. The, the, the second half on the residential, um, the residents not, you know, that surround the 13th and Tallman or whatever, 13th yeah. place, I think. Uh, I, I can speak to that as well, Alder, Alderman. The, uh, the, the street is very lightly traveled um, and the, the subsequent phase of the development would, will create new housing. The housing will orient towards the north south streets and not towards uh, 13th Street. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's the 13th Street is, is typically used only for parking. It's, it's rarely, it's not contiguous uh, as you go to the east. And uh, so it's, 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 not a, it's not a very heavily used street. Oh, was a traffic study done? Yes. Or traffic analysis? Yes, there was a traffic study done. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just point out one other thing that, of course, through any plan development process, we have to consult with CDOT. And so we had, you know, advised CDOT of all the traffic issues. I, I will also add that, um, that the good news about only having the one remote facility is that it really, it doesn't generate a huge amount of new traffic. And so CDOT, of course, took that into consideration when they reviewed the project. And of course, they've given their approval, so. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cox, followed by Commissioner Lyons. Uh, can I be heard now? You can. Yes, I just wanted to put this um, a, a little bit um, in a larger context. Uh, uh, this is uh, a project that um, the city has supported uh, both uh, in, in spirit in terms of its ambition to create um, uh, a kind of mix of uses uh, from the uh, CHA original uh, vision of mixing housing close to commercial, close to retail. Uh, and, uh, and most recently, uh, the Mount Sinai um, um, building, mixed use building was supported by a $7 million uh, allocation from the CARES Act most recently. And uh, I think as Brian mentioned, uh, a neighborhood opportunity fund to secure a black owned restaurant, uh, sit down restaurant. So um, this is a, an exemplary project in many regards. And uh, I think having uh, Wind Trust as a anchor here, providing banking services to this neighborhood is a welcome addition. Um, what, um, what I am uh, pleased to see uh, the planning staff um, 
uh, noting that the drive-through demands of the uh, bank uh, should not be accommodated on uh, Ogden Avenue, where we're trying to preserve a more pedestrian orientation. And we know that these drive-throughs are a required piece of uh, banking services, but we've seen them all over town where the drive-through is put in the front door uh, and really wears away at the pedestrian orientation of many of our neighborhoods. So I think this was a very um, good call on the part of the planning staff to say, could we put this drive-through facility in the back of the site and preserve that green space for uh, future uh, pedestrian uses. So um, uh, I think this is, um, it was a, a wonderful um, response by the design team on how to meet the bank's needs um, while preserving the pedestrian orientation of the lion's share of the project. And there really is um, the, the site or the street that we're talking about is currently uh, dominated by um, commercial um, uses. Uh, the neighborhood proper is really more to the west side of the site towards the park. So a lot of the traditional concerns we might have of, of, of traffic um, impacts impeding on uh, residents is not the case here. So I just wanted to um, to put this in context, I really do think that the solution that the design team has found um, is um, really the best solution. And uh, again, I applaud their sensitivity to um, making sure that we don't ruin the pedestrian experience of Ogden, uh, which is the most important uh, frontage uh, for, for this parcel. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons, followed by Commissioner Biagi. Um, yes, and thank you. I, you know, I just um, got me thinking, and I really appreciated your comments, um, Madam Chair, uh, about uh, sort of the overall um, impact of the of this larger scale project. Um, and it just got me thinking, just in terms of, you know, I think sometimes we have opportunities like this to see a project sort of in the mid mid of middle of the development, um, but it also sort of raises. <laughs> question of, um, you know, for projects like this, it would be really great to have report backs on sort of the economic impact, um, the impact on the community, um, you know, th throughout the development um, in the middle of it and, and towards the end. Um, for me, some of the questions that are in my mind, um, you know, are about the, the jobs that are being created. Um, you know, are those folks, do those folks have health insurance? Are they able to go to Sinai themselves? Um, and to the larger questions about the impact of these sorts of development and you know I would just encourage um, you know the development about including um, you know in the presentation um, voices from the community um, it's great to hear about um, those organizations um, having evolved over over time throughout this process but I think um, it would be really great to hear um, from the community about sort of the impact of, of, um, of this project um, uh, whether it's in this than you are in another. Thank you so much. Commissioner Biagi. Thanks, just to put a finer point on the traffic. So there was a traffic study done. We did review it. Our engineers double reviewed it. We said no to the drive-through on Ogden. And I think that sort of unlocked the potential um, of using the 13th place um, as a, you know, a very limited uh, a through traffic street. I think the other thing that's important is that um, we'll be converting Washtenaw between Ogden and Roosevelt to a two-way. So that also unlocks some flow. Um, so there are a number of things uh, that we did in the process to make sure. Uh, and lastly, of course, there'll be another uh, traffic signal modification to make sure that this conversion works. So um, just to put some context on the traffic engineering work we did. That's fantastic. Thank you. That, that helps to have that, uh, have that feedback. OK, so I asked a question. I don't remember what the answer was, whether or not we had a, a letter on file or whether Alderman Irvin is here to make a statement. What's the answer to that question? Brian? Uh, yeah, I can uh, address that. Uh, Just to add very quickly, is, 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 is we have a letter on file? Is, is he? Not with the, the staff memo, there, there is not one on. Uh, I do not recall if there's one in the original application, so I would have to add the development. Uh, 
I'm sorry, Brian, I, I did send the letter to you. I'm sure in the thousands of emails you get, maybe it was overlooked, but we, we do, we did receive a letter and I forwarded it to, to the staff. Okay. okay. I can also confirm that I just spoke with Alderman Irvin in a briefing this week and he has been notified of this project on multiple occasions and he voiced his support for it. I did forward the invitation for this meeting to him and let him know we'd be presenting, uh, but it looks like he wasn't able to attend today. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion on the proposed business plan development submitted by Ogden Washtenaw JV LLC for the property generally located at 1257-1411 South Washtenaw Avenue, 1256-1368 South Tallman Avenue, 1355-65 South Tallman Avenue, and 2604-2664 West Ogden Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved by Commissioner Cox. Moved by, Commissioner, by Commissioner Garza. Thank you, Commissioner Garza. All right, so now let me do the roll call here. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Villegas. I'm not sure if he's back out of committee. Commissioner Wagespach. Yes. Yes. So motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, next item on the agenda is proposed industrial corridor map amendment application located within the Kinsey Industrial Corridor, submitted by 1352 West Lake Restaurant LLC for the property located at 1352 West Lake Street. The applicant proposes to rezone the property from M2 3 Light Industry to a DS-3 downtown service to allow for an eating and drinking establishment that would exceed 4,000 square feet in size to be established on site. Joshua Sun will provide a context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Hi. and Commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Josh Sun with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, this proposed development is generally located at 1352 West Lake Street and is located within the near West Side community area within the 27th Ward. The applicants, 1352 West Lake Restaurant LLC and their team appear here today for the purposes of an industrial corridor map amendment. The request is being submitted as an amendment to the zoning designation from M2-3 Light Industrial to DS-3 Downtown Service pursuant to the provisions of the Chicago Zoning Ordinance Title 17 of the Municipal Code of Chicago, due to the fact that the applicant seeks to allow for an eating and drinking establishment as a permitted use. The subject site is located both in the Kinsey Industrial Corridor and the near west side community area of the central region, as you can see here, uh, circled in red. Speaking to the demographics that make up the near west side, it has a population of about 62,700 people with about 49% of the workforce living outside of the city. The top three industries of employment based off of the 60607 zip code are accommodation and food services, followed by finance and insurance, and professional scientific and technical services, number three. This aerial illustrates the areas around the site and its, its proximity to a mix of uses, including residential and office developments. Note, north, uh, note to the north, West Fulton Street, uh, to the south, West Randolph, and then to the west, North Ogden Avenue. And then in the red is the proposed uh, site amendment. This slide provides a zoning context for the subject site. As mentioned previously, it's located within an industrial corridor in an area that is evolving into a more mixed use community. The property is located in an area zoned M2-3, as you can see here in the light blue, uh, which is light industrial uses. However, immediately south across West Lake Street right here, uh, areas are zoned C1-2-3-5 or neighborhood commercial district. 
Following slides will provide additional views of existing conditions. Uh, with North Ada Street in the foreground, you can see the site in context with the change happening uh, in the corridor. So in the back, you can see this is West End on Fulton, which is a 14-story office building. These photos give you more of a, a zoomed in look on the existing property. Uh, as you can see, the space was previously used as a dog run for the former business, which was a dog training business. The project is consistent with the Fulton Market Innovation District Plan, which the Plan Commission approved back in 2014. It accommodates and complements private sector investments and the general growth of the corridor as an economic engine and will reuse an existing building for a use that will provide jobs and an amenity for people in the area. With that said, I will allow Tim Barton on behalf of the applicant to take it away. Thank you, Josh. My name is, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Um, my name is Tim Barton. I'm with the law office of Thomas R. Raines. Um, I'm representing the applicant, Hogsalt Hog Hog Hospitality, which is a nationally known restaurant group. The project today is for a small Cheval uh, restaurant. Um, I'm joined today by Lynn Burns, who is the Chief Financial Advisor for Hog Salt uh, and this project's manager, and as well as by Stephanie Schubert, who is the project architect. Uh, this project was initially discussed with Alderman Burnett earlier this year. He referred, he referred us to two community groups, uh, the West Loop Community Organization and the neighbors of uh, West Loop. They reviewed the project um, Wilco, the West Loop Community Organization, uh, sent a letter of support. Uh, the other group, neighbors of West Loop, stated that they had no concern with the, with the project. Um, DPD staff also reviewed the project and raised questions, which you see here, um, alluding to the uh, use of the patio during winter. Um, uh, specifically, there was a question about having uh, uh, shading, but there's just going to be individual umbrellas at the tables. Um, there will be some winter use of the property to the extent the weather allows. There will be a heater at each table. Um, there won't be any other further enclosures for um, outdoor use. Uh, there will be trees um, planted on Ada uh, per the landscape ordinance. Uh, next slide, Josh. Uh, so here we see again the um, an aerial view of the property. Um, just following up on what Josh said, th this is an area of dense development. There is uh, the, the building, the plan development for the mixed use property immediately to the south, uh, the Mason. Um, there is also a larger building here just off to the northwest uh, developed by Trammell Crow and Randolph Street. And farther west um, at 1450 is a 500 plus unit uh, residential building. Um, the site is three blocks east of the Ashland L, L stop on the green line. So it's uh, very accessible to public transit. Uh, next. So here's the site plan. Uh, we see Lake Street is on your left. Um, the property is uh, about two thirds of it is uh, the open patio space that's 3,800 feet. Um, and then the, uh, in, uh, the restaurant itself is in a one story building. Uh, which is 2,000 plus feet, uh, square feet. Uh, as I stated before, there'll be five trees um, on North Ada Street. Um, and the outdoor patio is planned with small tables, again, small tables with umbrellas. Um, and there will be a surrounding hedge of, evergr uh, of evergreens. Next. 
here's the interior. Um, it's a pretty standard uh, layout um, showing uh, all the seating is basically stools and counters. Um, obviously, this is a more traditional uh, layout. It's been, it's changed or would be altered according to the, uh, to be in compliance with COVID related uh, standards. Um, to note here are there will be two, there'll be two doors. Um, so there'll be um, very good interior flow. There'll be a door off of Ada and then a door directly onto the patio. There will be also two very large um, glazed windows on both elevations. Next. Um, again, so there, we're reusing an existing structure, um, improving it significantly. Um, the exterior will have, again, this hedge of evergreens. You also see here that there's a string of uh, lights overhead, small lights. Um, I'll show you that in the rendering up here, uh, but you'll see that the elevation here um, is improved with uh, uh, painted brick. Um, there's uh, signage that's painted onto the building, so it's a very active uh, kind of design. Next, please. Again, here's a close-up of the um, east elevation. You see. Um, the large uh, signage for the restaurant and the, the metal garage door that can um, open up, obviously, that will facilitate co use of the property during the, this current pandemic. Um, the menu board is painted onto the building, the, uh, as is the, the company logo. Um, you'll see that the glass block is still retained so it very much keeps the, um, the original look of the building. Um, this area is still pretty desolate in character. So the attempt here is to, um, is to really enliven both the design and the area itself. Uh, let's see. Here you can see the, the lighting um, and the hedge, this is ideally an outdoor uh, view. I think if we go, here's the same view in the winter. Uh, no heaters here, but you get the idea that um, there will still be uh, active use of the property. And here's the patio rendering. I don't know if you can see there's, you'll see the, you'll, the wall, this wall is, uh, glazed on the right, again, uh, having a large patio door opening. Draw your attention to the sign on the left that will be hand paint, that will be painted onto the building. That wall actually is part of this property. Um, it's a part, it's a remaining party wall from the store that once uh, um, occupied the site. So um, we'll take it. We'll take advantage of that to use that for more signage. Again, uh, patio rendering um, of the site. So it's a it's a relatively small project, but one that we think will have a lot of visual impact um, on the area. Um, overall, economically, we're looking at. Um, uh, hiring of approximately 30 jobs. There'll be two shifts. Um, uh, the site, the store will be open from 11 um, a.m. to 12 a.m. So there'll be two shifts. Um, obviously, there'll be kitchen workers and security and maintenance. Um, the property, the project should bring in tax revenue, um, substantial tax revenue. And of course, it will expand the dining op options uh, for all the, the new commercial and residential development. Thanks, Tim. 
Um, and so with that said, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant, and we've concluded that the proposed industrial corridor map amendment would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposed change to a DS-3 to allow for eating and drinking establishments as a permitted use is consistent and complementary with other zoning in the immediate area. It promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. And it encourages active public space and neighborhood character in the West Loop through placemaking, signage, and identity. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the Zoning Administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application for a rezoning be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Oops, uh, Commissioner Wagspot. Uh, Chairwoman, uh, I was just going to comment on uh, the change, if I could. Please. Um, so the uh, small Cheval owners also have a similar property around 1730 North Milwaukee in, um, in my neighborhood. And they did a similar type of um, project uh, where they basically did an adaptive reuse of an existing property, a, an original building that was many years ago, I think a tire shop and turned into a restaurant. So I think uh, similar to this project, it's uh, very complementary to the neighborhood and it does create a lot of uh, vibe and economic development around it. So I just wanted to say, I, I really appreciate the way they've redone this and um, hope that it's as successful as the one in our neighborhood and, and voice my support for it. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Mr. Barton, thank you for your presentation. I'm not seeing any other comments from commissioners. Uh, Alderman uh, Burnett, do you want to speak to this? Yes, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Madam uh, Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Archival uh, was one of the pioneers over in the West Loop area over on Halstead and uh, Randolph. And they really helped to enhance the community and attract more people to the neighborhood. It's a great establishment. Um, you know, I, I don't need a lot of red meat, but I they do have uh, some chicken there. <laughs> the food is very good. Um, matter of fact, uh, Archival, the owners of Archival is actually opening up their uh, their uh, headquarters uh, in our ward over in the um, Goose Island area. Uh, so, uh, and they do employ a lot of people. Uh, we did send them to uh, to the community organizations in the area uh, to get their approval. You know, uh, you know the funny thing in this community, uh, something this small is a no brainer, right? Because we so, we've been so used to getting larger projects. Uh, so we just think um, it's refreshing to have a, an establishment to open up uh, in the community and, and not have to build something uh, very large, uh, large uh, in the community and use the existing property to make it work. Uh, I support this 100%. Um, of course, I have to recuse myself from voting for it. Uh, but also, uh, Madam Chairman, I want to say, uh, if you can record me for the other items, a couple of items that was before this on voting yes for them. Uh, I apologize because I was, on Zoom meetings with budget committees and there was a lot of stuff going on. But I, I was looking at it, I saw them, so I'm voting okay. for them. <laughs> Alderman, for the record, I just want for the court reporter, those were items D2 and D3, uh, a yes from Alderman Burnett. Yes. And D4. And D4, sorry, yes. Okay, I, su I support all, all of them. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I ask for this committee support for this project, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Alderman in your role as Alderman. Um, so no other comments. So I will entertain a, I guess I, well, I guess I wanna make a real quick one, which is it's really heartening to see the investment in a restaurant at a time when uh, restaurants are having a hard time. And I think it, it uh, reminds us that we, we will, hopefully with not too many more people suffering, get to the other, other side of this. Um, all right, so do I have a motion on the proposed industrial, I'm sorry, do I have a motion on where to go? 
Um, I gotta see where I am here for my motion. Madam Chair, in the meantime, it, 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 I, think, uh, I was reading. Mr. Searle has her hand up. If you want to take oh, that yeah, one. no, I, I will. I, I missed her hand. Thank you so much. Um, and I was looking at the right one. I just didn't expect to see corridor, industrial corridor. But go ahead, Commissioner Searle. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. I was just going to add too um, uh, to Alderman Burnett's comments. Um, Ocheval is um, one of the higher-rated restaurants in that neighborhood. And it's even recognized by Michelin, not with a star, but with something like a plate, <laughs> one of their other um, recognition. So I think having this additional place for people who love Ocheval will be a great addition to the neighborhood further west. Although I think you should leave the sign up that says hamburgers and fries and it's kind of cool. Cool reminder. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Okay, now do I have a motion on the proposed industrial corridor map amendment application located within the Kinsey Industrial Corridor, submitted by 1352 West Lake Restaurant LLC for the property located at 1352 West Lake Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved by Alderman Tunney, the restaurant tour. Oh. <laughs> I second it. Moved by, by Commissioner uh, Moore. Uh, and seeing no further discussion, let me do the roll call vote. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett recu uh, recuses himself. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Gaza. He'll be back. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Brez? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Wegesbach? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Uh, Madam Chairperson? Yes, um, Commissioner Grossman mouthed yes, but she was muted, so I don't think you heard her. Okay. Yeah, I haven't I, I haven't marked her as voting on any of yes. the recent items. Uh, Chairman, um, I'm sorry. This I'm is Smita Shaw. Can you also add me? So. Can you hear uh, me now? We can hear you now. I, 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 I apologize. I was being yes, behaving okay. myself. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner, Commissioner Shaw, I've got you, I've got you also as a yes. Okay, the next item on the agenda is proposed plan development submitted by 2420 South Halstead LLC for the property generally located at 2420 South Halstead Street and 2500 South Corbett Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the subject property from PMD-11 Plan Manufacturing District and plan development number 1236 to a waterway plan development. The applicant proposes the construction of a 112,000 square foot distribution center with 487 parking spaces and 15 loading docks. The applicant will also construct a landscape river walk along the length of the site that fronts the south branch of the Chicago River and an additional 183,900 square feet of landscaping. This is in the 11th Ward. Nolan Zaroff will provide a context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. And can you see my screen? We can. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, again, for the record, my name is Nolan Zaroff with the Department of Planning and Development. Um, and again, this is for proposed plan development generally located at 2420 South Halsted Street and 2500 South Corbett Street in the Bridgeport community area in the 11th Ward. The applicant appears here today because they're proposing to rezone the property from PMD 11, Plan Manufacturing District, and plan development number 1236 to PMD 11 prior to establishing a waterway plan development to construct a 112,000 square foot distribution center with 486 parking spaces and 15 loading docks. The proposed uses are permitted under current zoning. However, the applicant is required to rezone to a waterway plan development due to the site's proximity to the south branch of the Chicago River. Uh, the subject property is located in the southwest planning region in the Bridgeport community area. According to CMAP, there are around 34,000 people in the community area, 39% of which are Asian, 33% white, and 23% Hispanic or Latino. The median household income is just over $50,000.
The subject property is bounded on the north by the south branch of the Chicago River, on the east by South Halstead Street, on the south by freight rail and the CTA Orange Line, on the southwest by a residential plan development, and on the west by a ComEd facility. The Halstead stop of the CTA Orange Line is approximately 500 feet south of the site along Corbett Street. <clears throat> uh, the next two slides show the existing conditions of the site, um, including um, kind of clockwise from top left, um, the Senior Avenue entrance looking east, um, two views of the seawall condition on the western extent of the site looking east towards Halstead Street, and the seawall condition looking west towards the neighboring ComEd facility. And here you can see the east side of the property looking to the, north, to the northeast, um, the same view, but looking northwest towards the Fisk generating plant across the river, um, the south side of the property uh, looking east along the railroad, and a broader view of the property looking west from the Halstead Bridge. Uh, the western portion of the site is currently zoned PMD 11, Plan Manufacturing District. Um, this is in the Pilsen PMD. Um, and the eastern portion is zone PD number 1236, which was previously operated as a heliport. Um, the applicant proposes rezoning the eastern portion of the site to PMD 11 prior to the rezoning of the entire site to a waterway plan development. The surrounding land uses for the area include industrial and manufacturing to the north, the east, and the west, commercial to the south and southeast, and, a resi and residential to the southwest. Um, at this point, I will turn it, the presentation over to Richard Clowder, uh, the, applica the applicant's attorney, um, who will further explain the details of the proposal. Rich, are you there? I am here. Mr. Thank Clowder. you, Nolan, very much. Um, and good Nolan, afternoon. Mr. Clowder. Excuse I just me? Want, I just want to remind Nolan and the staff to, to, uh, to, uh, to call him Mr. Clowder. Clowder, not, not Rich. He can, he's, he's, he's welcome to call me Rich. That's fine, too. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, thank you, Nolan, uh, Mr. Zeroff. I appreciate your, um, your report. And uh, for the record, my name is Rich Clowder. I am with the law firm of DLA Piper, located at 444 West Lake. Um, my colleague, Liz Butler, and I have the pleasure of representing the applicant in this matter, 2420 South Halstead, LLC. They are a wholly owned affiliate of Prologis, and Prologis is a global leader and developer in logistics and industrial real estate development. Uh, joining me today, should they be uh, uh, in need, should you be in need of having questions answered by them, are Aaron Rosedale and Drew Store of Prologis. Also, the design team includes Nate Groff, Jamie Putnam, and Daniel Grove of Kimley Horn. They are the civil and landscape architect for the project. Dan Hill and Kevin Jaco of Progressive AE are the project architects and are also available, as is Lue Abuna of KLOA, our traffic engineer. Finally, Bob Coles of Meridian Design Build is the general contractor for the project and is also present. A couple words of background, Prologis is the contract purchaser of both sites. They are located at 2420 South Halstead and 2500 South Corbett, respectively. I won't describe the location any more than Nolan uh, already has, except to say, that most notably the eastern portion of the property that fronts upon Halstead is the former heliport site and is zoned waterway heliport plan development number 1236. The western portion of the property um, uh, is uh, unimproved and primarily serves as outdoor storage currently for trucks and trailers. That site is presently zoned PD, PMD district 11. PMD 11. Um, the development plan here contemplates that Prologis will develop the property with a best-in-class industrial distribution center containing approximately 112,104 square feet of floor area. The primary use of the proposed development is a last mile logistics and distribution center, which are permitted by right in the PMD. The reason that we are before you today is due to the property's proximity to the Chicago River, and it is for that reason that we are seeking a unified waterway plan development for the two sites. In light of the many disruptions caused by COVID-19, it's appropriate as a first uh, order of magnitude to point out that the proposed development of a last mile distribution center will serve as a critical part of the supply chain infrastructure serving city of Chicago residents. Distribution facilities, including the one proposed to be constructed here, serve a critical function in the local, regional, and national global supply chain. Uh, and are critical elements of the city's COVID and emergency disaster preparedness strategy. The slide currently in front of you summarizes the project timeline, and I won't speak to it in detail 
except to mention the community outreach that has been undertaken by Prologis and the leadership that has been displayed by Alderman Thompson. We have solicited much input from the neighborhood and a, a considerably superior project is the result. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, Nolan or Noah. Um, this slide shows the evolution of the project design, which largely derives from the extensive neighborhood impact we received. Let me just briefly touch on some of the highlights of the changes that were made in response to community and aldermanic feedback. In 2019, the initial design contemplated development of only the Western portion of the site. In response to discussions with the aldermen and community stakeholders, it became clear that the truck traffic and access were of critical concern and that inclusion of the heliport site on the east, which allowed for commercial vehicle access directly to Halstead, was critical to success, the, the success of the project. The final site plan shown on the left provides for four driveways. Very close attention was paid by the development team to vehicular access and to managing access in a manner that would limit traffic impacts on the neighborhood. Based on extensive discussion with the community and review and coordination with the Alderman, DPD, and CDOT, the project will allow truck access from Halstead Street exclusively. The developer will design, fund, and install a new traffic signal at the Halstead driveway. Employees will be able to access the site from Archer via the driveways at Corbett and Senior. The Hillock driveway on the westernmost perimeter, perimeter of the site will be gated and used for fire, MWRD, and emergency access only. These access management requirements will address the current traffic management issue of large trucks and commercial vehicles navigating residential streets to the western portion of the site. The project will also provide a 30-foot wide river, uh, river setback, the design for which Nate Groff will discuss in just a moment. Initially, the project design specified river walk access only from Halstead at the east, with a future connection on the northwest side of the site. After receiving feedback from the community, the applicant decided to add a 10 foot wide, fully ADA compliant route to the west uh, side of the site from Hillock to the proposed river walk. This added connection will provide for welcoming river walk access for residents of the residential neighborhood to the south and west and employees. Extensive attention was given to greening the site, generous publicly accessible open space and landscaping buffers including a four foot tall landscape berm along the southwest site perimeter are provided, thereby shielding adjacent uses from view of the surface parking lot and building. Internal circulation drives and parking areas were shifted or consolidated to increase green space and provide more buffer to the residential neighborhood to the south and the west. A large paved area at the northwest corner of the site was replaced with 14,000 square feet of naturalized detention basin with native plantings and 20 additional trees. If we could go to the next slide, please. With this site, uh, with this slide rather, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Nate Groff of Kinley Horn, the civil engineer for the project. Nate, if you could take it away and remember to identify yourself and take yourself off mute. Yes, thanks Rich. Good afternoon. My name is Nate Groff with the design firm Kinley Horn Associates. We're located at 111 West Jackson Street. Uh, the color landscape plan you're looking at now is the culmination of an iterative process working with the city staff and community input as, as Rich mentioned. The plan was greatly improved through this collaboration to maximize the green space and the buffering and the tree canopy coverage while still maintaining the functionality that we need for the tenant. All landscape ordinance requirements were met or exceeded with this plan and additional buffering has been created along the Halstead uh, right away on the east and along Senior and the residential on the west side of the site. Where possible at the west end, berming was also introduced to increase that screening. Evergreen trees and a mix of shrubs complement the canopy trees and new parkway was also incorporated, sidewalk curbing and streetscape trees. Uh, to provide additional buffering and screening all along CNOR. Next slide, please. We have a couple perspectives here looking at the building. This is a view looking north at the site. Next slide is looking east at the site, the Chicago River on the left. 
the next one is looking south at the project site with a river in the foreground. And then we have another perspective looking west. This is the view from Halstead looking at the site. This perspective here is a view from Halstead Street showing the connection to the 10 foot wide pedestrian path that ties into the public sidewalk. You can see here how the path starts to drop down in elevation as you go towards the river um, is buffered by the ornamental fence and the, uh, the trees that screen this, this side of the site. If you go to the next one there, we're looking at the, so this is the proposed development from the river level uh, looking westward. And the next image is looking east, the project site. And this perspective is a view from Senor Avenue looking east at the development. You can see the building there a little bit to the right down the road on the picture. Um, so this is looking the view from the residential neighborhood. And I'll point out here the, the four foot berm and trees and additional landscaping and planting beds that were provided along this corridor uh, to provide more of a visual buffer, as well as the streetscape improvements for the new sidewalk curbing and, and street trees. Next couple slides here, look at the, the building itself. This is the west elevation. Um, the building will have a maximum height of 43 feet to the top of the parapet. The employee and customer entrances are west facing on the side of the building. Uh, the building itself is clad in precast concrete panels with horizontal and vertical reveals. Jump to the next one. This is the building on the east. Um, again, the east elevation is also treated with materials, finishes, and architectural details that are high quality uh, appropriate for this location. Uh, the east elevation also shows the loading docks uh, for the facility and the entrance canopy to the right on the drawing is wrapped in decorative metal panel. Next slide, please. This is the building elevation looking north. You can see the, uh, the precast metal panels there on the canopy. And the next one is looking south. So this plan shows the traffic circulation and, and Rich touched on this, the various entry points for the site. Um, as noted earlier, all the truck traffic for the development will flow through the new signal that will be constructed as part of this project on Halstead on the east side of the site, as well as the last mile delivery vehicles will ingress and egress from that location. Um, employees will have access to the site also from Halstead uh, or from Archer utilizing the uh, public street connections through the viaduct at Corbett, which is in the middle of the project to the south and then through a, an entrance on Senor Avenue, Avenue as well. And there's also pedestrian access from the CTA Orange Line stop uh, provided via a new sidewalk that's being constructed as part of the project under the viaduct at Corbett. Next slide. So I, I won't read this in detail. This, uh, this slide highlights some of the recommendations um, that were part of the detailed traffic impact study that was conducted by the design team and coordinated with CDOT. Um, so out of that collaboration, there were several things uh, suggested um, to make sure that we had both vehicular and pedestrian movements taken into account and also paying close attention to the functionality and the safety of the bike lane and how that operates with the signal on Halstead. Next slide has, so this is the additional recommendations and, and really the improvements that are uh, part of this project within the public right-of-way that includes the new signal at Halstead, pedestrian and bike lane improvements, um, as well as enhanced signal timing for Halstead and Archer, the intersection to the south. Next slide. So coming back to the overall landscape plan here, uh, this illustrates the extent of the new green space being proposed at this redevelopment site. It was primarily impervious surface previously um, and had been utilized and developed over the years. Uh, we're increasing that pervious coverage as well as enhancing it with trees and landscaping um, that meet or exceed the ordinance requirements for this development. 
stormwater detention and water quality requirements are met for the project by utilizing on-site infiltration basins, um, including the naturalized basin, above ground basin, you can see at the northwest corner of the site. Uh, all stormwater runoff is treated through a water quality BMP or best management practice. And that includes an infiltration trench that will run all along the shoreline, the Chicago River shoreline, um, and pick up all of the runoff from the uh, pedestrian path, which includes native plantings within that, um, that infiltration system. Next slide. And I won't, I won't read through all these, but this gives an overview of the various amenities that we're providing within the public open space along the riverfront. Uh, the path is open and connected to the public right away, um, ungated with connections both at Hillock on the west and Halstead on the east. The treatment of the Riverwalk area works well with the topography um, and conditions as possible and maintains the existing seawall all along the riverfront. And as mentioned before, the BMP infiltration trench that you can see there on the right hand side with the native plantings is also incorporated. Go to the next slide. This shows a couple cross sections just to get uh, an idea of the elevation change that's happening along this area. Um, there's also a proposed retaining wall that's part of the project between the riverfront path and the building. The developed parking areas uh, provides a buffer along with some landscaping and, and keeps the pedestrian area down at a lower elevation uh, really along the, uh, the seawall elevation of the river. And the next slide, this shows some additional cross sections relative to the parking spaces um, and their proximity to the walking path, as well as the aquatic habitat that's being incorporated um, down at an overlook area along the uh, pedestrian riverfront route. And if you jump to the next slide here, so this is actually that, um, that view from the overlook area with seating, the native plantings, on the left, you can see the proposed retaining wall and ornamental fence, and there'll be some interpretive signage here as well. Uh, so this open area really takes advantage of an existing jog in the shoreline uh, and introduces that aquatic habitat at this location as well. Uh, the next slide has a couple views of the trail condition, um, the BMP infiltration and native planning you can see along the river on the left side of each image. The lower right image actually uh, also shows a seating pocket with bench seating that we're introducing periodically along the pedestrian path. The next image is a view from the northwest corner of the site. The river walk is on the left of the image here, and this is the turn to go up uh, to the right that connects up to the hillock, um, hillock right away and sidewalk and directly in front in the middle of the image is the above ground detention basin. And the next slide here, just this is the uh, sustainable development policy and the, the project will achieve the 100 points um, from this matrix. And we're doing that utilizing, uh, designing the building for lead silver, EV charging stations and EV charger readiness for the parking, as well as 80% waste diversion for the project. Yeah, if we jump to the next slide here, I'll turn it back over to Rich. Thank you, Nate. Uh, just to sum up, um, this has been a vacant parcel for generations and has never generated much in the way of significant tax base or jobs. This redevelopment will remediate a long vacant, substantially underutilized brownfield site with an active job creating use that will strengthen the city's supply chain infrastructure and will also include a river walk that will serve as a publicly accessible recreational amenity for this community. The project is estimated to cost somewhere between 25 and $30 million and will generate between 125 and 150 construction jobs as well as 200 permanent jobs. Prologis, the developer, is committed to diversity and inclusion in its hiring practices and is targeting 26% and 6% MBEWBE participation for the project. Their contractor has already invited MBE and WBE builders to bid on the project and is in the process of coordinating with the Alderman's office 
on the hosting of certain subcontractor outreach events as soon as this fall. That concludes our presentation. We'd like to thank CDOT and DPD for their thoughtful and comprehensive review and collaboration, and especially to Alderman Thompson for his leadership on helping to advance this important project. I'll turn it now back over to Nolan to conclude. And of course, our team is available should you have any questions that you'd like answered. Nolan, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Clowder. Um, so the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal will be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposed plan development promotes economically beneficial development that is compatible with the character of the existing area as evidenced by adjacent industrial uses. The proposed plan development advances the goals set forth in the establishment of the underlying pills in PMD. And the proposed plan development will provide nearly 2000 feet of publicly accessible river walk along the south branch of the Chicago River. Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, the zoning administrator recommends that the application for this plan development be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Searle. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one of the, a couple of the people who testified earlier this morning um, suggested that there would be quite a bit of pollution uh, generated by this development. Um, and the only thing I can think of is any number of how many trucks um, would come in and out of there. But um, can you uh, answer that question of what the number of trucks per day might be? And would this be something that would contribute to the pollution in the neighborhood? Um, thanks, Commissioner. Again, Rich Clowder from DLA Piper. Uh, um, and I, I will take a crack at that, that question, and I'm glad you asked it because I heard the same public testimony this morning. Um, we anticipate that there will be approximately 16 to 21 trucks per day that will access the site. Um, there was a reference to a concern about air quality. Uh, the air quality here it, impact is quite de minimis. It's similar to a big box retailer or a grocery store. And what's more, um, we are cleaning up a brownfield site, building a LEED certified building. And to the question about environmental impact, our goal is to provide 100% EV fleet and to support an eventual 100% electric fee fleet of vehicles to and from the site that, that are utilized by drivers delivering packages. So we think that this is a very environmentally conscientiously designed project with relatively modest impact on the immediate neighborhood. Uh, and in the, and uh, I guess, I hope that that answers your question. Yes, it does, thanks. Commissioner Moore, follow, uh, uh, followed by Commissioner Brumfeld, followed by Commissioner Shaw. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, I actually like the um, site as it was presented here this morning or this afternoon now. <laughs> um, but my question, I thought I saw um, that there was one community meeting in June um, during this process. And so could someone speak to that? Was it just one meeting or were there others that I missed something in, in the presentation? And um, how many people were at that June community meeting? Because there were a lot of testimony and I just, you know, I'm curious to make sure that people got a voice in the project. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, Rich Clowder from DLA Piper. Uh, I attended uh, the meeting in June, as did representatives from the design team and the developer. It was very well attended. Alderman Thompson hosted the meeting. There was a robust discussion. We've also met with uh, Friends of the River, and we've had, an, and uh, the alderman has provided, I think, at least monthly ward updates about the project. So the, the, the community pro process has been fairly robust. I would also say that many of the features that we emphasized during our presentation this afternoon are in direct response from the feedback that we got from stakeholder organizations and from community members, including the aldermen. So um, whether it's the relocation of CNOR, the, uh, the berming to uh, 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 reduce the impact of the building on the neighborhood to the south and the west, um, this is in a PMD. So uh, uh, sig significant industrial uses are permitted here but we are also mindful of the fact that we are very uh, near a, a residential neighborhood. And I think you'll agree that we've done a very good job of orienting the building and designing the site to uh, accommodate those concerns. And we've, we've listened to them very carefully and 
we believe that we've incorporated uh, all of them into the plan that you see before you. Um, okay, can, um, but did you say how many people were at that June meeting? Oh, I'm sorry. I think um, I think around a hundred or so. Um, it was it was well publicized. It was on the alderman's website. Um, we sent out notices, so um, anybody who wanted to participate was able to. It lasted a couple of hours. Uh, we took every question that we got, um, and have and have had uh, numerous communications with uh, the residents individually and otherwise uh, throughout the course of time since June. So. Um, we believe that we've answered all of their questions, uh, if not all of their concerns, and um, and be and believe that uh, that the that the um, project has been well vetted in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you for that. One final quick question: What is what buildings or industries are to the east and the west of your site? Um, I don't know if Nolan, if you can help me on that one. Um, sure. I I can take that. So, so to the east of the site across Halsted Street is uh, an Iron Mountain, uh, the, the paper shredding um, company. To the west is a ComEd substation. West of that is a demolition contractor. Um, and then to the north across the river, there's the old Fisk generating station. Um, I do believe the uh, kind of the white roofed building you see here is a new recreation center in Pilsen. Um, but those are sort of the, the adjacent uses. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes, I think it's uh, it's no secret that we're going to continue to see more of these distribution centers, not only in our region, but of course within our city limits. And it's clear uh, to me that the, the tenant uh, has worked with their design professionals and to soften and green the site. And they should be commended for that. Um, something I have to believe that DPD probably did have a small hand in. Um, that stated, I guess, from a sustainability stand standard, and I think this is just a general question, maybe a statement, uh, is this the new uh, standard for distribution centers uh, or should we be striving for something more? Is this enough? Uh, maybe again, it's a combination of a statement and a question and kind of building on uh, Commissioner Moore's comments. Um, actually, she uh, kind of uh, took a number of my questions related to the engagement process, um, specifically as it relates to the concerns that we heard earlier on at the beginning of this meeting and that we were aware of going into this meeting I uh, just wanted to, uh, and I think Rich, you've actually answered these earlier in your statements. You know, just wanted to be, uh, uh, make everyone aware that, uh, you know, these are still very real concerns, you know, even though uh, I think uh, it was handled today in a presentation well, but these are still very real concerns that I think uh, the residents in the community still have, uh, regardless of the changes that have been made to this plan. No, that's a, a again, Rich Clowder from DLA Piper. That's a, a, a very fair point, Commissioner. We think we've set the bar pretty high here for uh, the logistics uh, buildings and facilities that will come behind us. Um, and uh, we're very pleased with the way that we've been able to accommodate uh, this use uh, at this location in relation to the broader uh, context. Um, I do, uh, Madam Chair, I believe that Alderman, I should have uh, asked or I'll referred call, you to Alderman I'll Thompson. I'll call on him in a minute. Uh, okay. Okay. Our, our process is that I give the commissioners a chance, but I do want to welcome you, Alderman Thomas Thompson. I want I was going to do that in a second, but uh, what we'll do is I'll let a couple more of the commissioners ask their questions, and then and then we'll give you a chance to speak. But again, welcome, Alderman Thompson. Go ahead. Uh, um, do you have any more questions, um, uh, Commissioner Brumfeld? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Okay. So moving on to Commissioner Shaw. Shaw, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I too am pleased with the green space and the way that this has been put together. Um, I, had a, I had a question, more of a curiosity. I noticed your MBE plan, which I thought was good, um, but I was curious more from an execution perspective about this 10% minority hiring in the work. I think that's great. Um, from a sustainability perspective and variety of others, I think it's a good idea. But how do you um, how do you plan to accomplish that? Um, I, I may refer that question to um, our contractor if he's if he's there. I I don't know. I think he's um, I think he's still on the call, but 
Yeah, Rich. Radium. Bob, do you mind uh, taking that question from the commissioner? Sure, sure. Uh, Bob Coles with Meridian Design Build. <clears throat> um, we've already reached out to or invited uh, on the initial project uh, a handful, or not a handful, but a, a lot of MBE, WBE uh, subcontractors. Um, and we'll be utilizing a, a bunch of them. We've, we've also reached out to Alderman Thompson's office to um, request uh, additional contacts as well as uh, help um, get an outreach event set up so that we could entertain and give more opportunities to uh, the surrounding um, companies as well um, to try to get those people involved in the project. Okay, that sounds great. And then just on the initial outreach, how did you, what did you use to identify MWBEs. And I ask this not because I'm challenging you. I also think these are educational for other people who are starting to look at and, you know, trying to meet their minority women and, you know, local hiring and EEO goals. I think it's important for people to understand how, when it is done, what are some of the avenues people take? So we've, uh, again, Bob Coles with Meridian Design Build. Uh, we've used both the, the Chicago website uh, that has a list of WBE, MBE uh, subcontractors and companies, uh, as well as we have an internal list of, of people we've uh, worked with in the past or uh, have invited previously. Great, great. And for other MBE firms, if they wanted to pursue it, would they reach out to you? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to Alderman Thompson and then uh, uh, Commissioner Cox, Commissioner Lyons are, are in the queue um, after that, uh, but welcome um, Alderman Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, however the order is, if, they, if you want to go through, I was uh, <clears throat> going to wait until you were done and then I could speak. Uh, I did the only reason I was raising my hand earlier, I was trying to answer some of the questions that were asked about, for example, community engagement and, and attendance and things like that. Go ahead, uh, Alderman. I think, we, I think we're very interested in your, in your thoughts. Okay. On so one, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> this has been a uh, quite some time we've been working on this plan. And um, when I was first approached uh, by Prologis uh, for the, what was the grant formerly the Grant Crowley Boatyard site uh, on the west portion of this, um, I had uh, asked them to uh, have a conversation with the, what was the, the heliport, uh, for those that recall what that eastern portion of the site was. Um, and so uh, the issues that we were having in the community, most especially with that vacant land, which was the Crowley site, uh, was it was, it's located in the PMD um, it was being utilized as a truck storage. And so we had a lot of truck traffic that was running through the neighborhood. And to the west, that neighborhood, uh, that's a very old neighborhood here in the city. And it is actually where Bridgeport was founded because uh, at Ashland is where the Chicago River started and flowed downtown. And you had a bridge and you also had a, a port there from the Chicago River, hence our, our name. And so uh, that area is predominantly residential. Um, there is some Brandenburg demolition is along uh, the river, also in the PMD. Um, I think we have a coexistence between some commercial and residential, and I think that's what this design uh, will allow. And, uh, and I appreciate the cooperation. Um, we did have a meeting on, on June 25th, a community meeting. We had 72 people attend that. Uh, on a, a Zoom, it was our largest Zoom community meeting that we've had under these new uh, circumstances. Um, and then I've had subsequent meetings. I had a quarterly meeting, uh, which I do. And I had a, a number of folks that uh, again, had an opportunity to express their concerns. We've had dialogue and correspondence with folks uh, that had raised concerns. And I know some folks directly talked to the developer. And I was just out uh, the other night, uh, on Tuesday night, talking to some of the neighbors along Senor and explaining the design and answering further questions. So I think we've had a, a pretty robust uh, engagement. Now, we're not all going to agree, uh, but I do think that we've uh, listened to the community. We've made modifications and changes 
Um, but really what this accomplished first and foremost was the concern I had uh, before, uh, which was the truck traffic coming through the community. We've completely eliminated all of that. Um, there is no vehicular, no commercial vehicular traffic that will be coming through on Hillock on 25th or on Eleanor. <laughs> None of that goes west. It all goes out and ingress and egress comes in and out of Halston Street. Um, and other commercial, smaller commercial trucks will use Corbett, which is the small street uh, that has a viaduct. And then you have Senor uh, to the west that uh, will allow for the personal vehicles of the employees uh, to come in and out uh, there. But all of the traffic is geared and pushed towards uh, the, the east away from the residential. And so I, I do appreciate that. I think that alleviates the noise and congestion. Also having that river walk will provide pedestrian access so they don't have to go on to Archer and over to Halstead. Now the residents in that part of the neighborhood can walk down the river walk and, and get out to Halstead along that way as well. So I think there's a lot of benefits uh, that come along with it. Uh, in addition to the access, uh, in addition to the the uh, creation of hundreds of jobs of permanent, um, hundreds of jobs of construction and the economic impact that that'll have on the entire community, along with the increase in the real estate tax base for the city. Um, we also have other benefits, the viaducts and working with the developer uh, to, to paint murals and improve the aesthetics there uh, and rebuild some of those viaducts. In fact, the Corbett Street we've dedicated to the developer. so. Uh, we vacated and dedicated it to them. So that will all improve all uh, for the, the entire community along there. So I do also want to just thank um, uh, all of the neighbors that were involved with this for all of their involvement and engagement. Uh, as I said, some of the neighbors um, may not be uh, as excited because they don't have everything, but we did listen and we tried to accommodate the best we could. I also want to thank DPD and CDOT for their input and their involvement, as well as the entire development team. I think they've been very responsive and uh, I think this will be a good development project for the city of Chicago and specifically for the 11th Ward and Bridgeport community. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I fully support this project and, uh, and hope I've answered any questions and would be available to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alderman. Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, I, I would uh, just also like to put uh, a few items uh, into context, uh, some that have been highlighted uh, by, the, by the alderman and uh, by my other colleagues. Um, you know, um, the, the kind of transit and logistics and distribution sector of the Chicago economy uh, is one of the sectors that is growing uh, rapidly. Uh, and so we can anticipate that we are probably going to have more requests for these uh, last mile facilities uh, throughout Chicago, and they will not be just on the west side or the south side. They are in, in, by, in by name uh, a last mile uh, center so that they need to be close to the uh, service areas that they are attempting to, uh, to serve. So um, I think we as Chicagoans have to accept um, that this sector um, is a part of Chicago's uh, future economy. So uh, if we accept that, uh, and this is a permitted uh, use in the plan uh, manufacturing district, um, our job I think as commissioners uh, and as stewards of the public interest is to get the best public benefit uh, out of these facilities and hold them to a high standard uh, of uh, livability. And so uh, I know my staff and the CDOT staff have um, done so with uh, Amazon to make sure that the residents who live in this area receive uh, a state-of-the-art uh, river walk, uh, which we um, worked with uh, the development team to secure. Uh, 
in, in hopes that this will be the beginning of a longer river walk, because uh, the uses that are just west of the site, as you, as you can see, are vastly unimproved. Uh, but if you continue this river walk to the west, uh, you'll get to the park. I think it's park on uh, number 571 with the um, boat dock uh, house. So uh, it is my hope that we will be able to persuade the uh, adjacent users, uh, adjacent uses uh, to the west of this site to continue uh, the river walk so that this entire neighborhood has a multi-mile uh, access um, to the river. So uh, that, um, that's one of the community benefits that we, we fought uh, incredibly hard to integrate into this site plan. Uh, likewise, um, we fought really hard to make sure that the adjacent uh, residential uses that you see um, were had an aggressive landscape buffer, so much so that they would not know that this facility is here and that they would not see a, an encroachment of vehicles uh, constantly coming in and out. So uh, I have visited many of these type of facilities throughout Chicago uh, and uh, a lot of these uh, un uncompatible uses, uh, very little attention had been given to what it means for uh, residents living next door to them. So we wanted to make sure uh, that uh, they will not see a building, they will see uh, a landscaped edge. Uh, and I think in many ways, this uh, image that's up on the screen is a, a testament to just how uh, derelict some of these manufacturing uses have been historically. If you just look at the northern part of this site, uh, northern part of the river versus what this site plan is attempting to do. So I just want to um, you know, um, applaud the development team, applaud the city agencies for watching out for the public interest uh, and making sure that we set a new standard uh, that we can then hold every other logistics um, program and site plan to. In fact, our planning department is in the process of, of reviewing and revising all of our standards uh, for landscape coverage on facilities like this so that we can propel these, this industry uh, kind of into the 21st century and create a much more sustainable uh, industry because you know logistics is going to continue to be a part of our uh, a part of a vibrant Chicago economy. So I just wanted to put it on record uh, that we very much um, have been uh, trying to use these uh, these site plans as a, a standard for what excellence should be, and um, I think the team. Uh, is uh, has achieved that, and uh, I certainly will be supporting uh, their application. Commissioner Lyons. Um, yes, thank you, um, and thank you all um, for um, you know for the presentation and everyone's thoughtful um, comments and questions. I um, you know I just thinking I can't help but think back to the. Um, to the comments from um, from the residents from the community earlier today, um, and some of the the that was raised was sort of the treatment of the North Branch corridor versus um, versus the um, the South Branch too. And I guess how do we collectively answer that question? Are are we treating this differently? Um, the question about air quality is is real one, and you know I don't want to um, uh, treat that lightly and. So I'm just wondering, I don't know who this question is for, but um, you know, are, are, how are we making sure that we are um, you know, treating the North and, and South Branch in an equitable way? And um, I guess that's, that's one. Um, and my, my second um, concern here is that, you know, we're part of this project, you know, I'm hearing and, and I really hear um, um, Commissioner Cox, your, note about um, holding these projects to a really high standard, partic particularly logistics. Um, this is going to be sort of a, a core part of our economy. Um, but one thing I just can't help but notice is missing is, is a discussion about, um, you know, how are we going to make sure that these are the jobs that are created um, are going to contribute to the community. And I just feel like there's just not enough information 
um, about that, about how we're going to make sure that the permanent jobs um, do positively impact the city and residents, um, particularly if that's sort of, you know, the core tenant of why um, why this is being built. Um, and I just wanted to make both of those comments before we move forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, did your hand go back up, Commissioner Cox? Uh, it did. I, I was hoping, uh, Madam Chair, that the development team can speak very specifically to the jobs component uh, and uh, how um, the tenant's record is uh, in hiring uh, locally, uh, et cetera. I do think that the jobs question is a, a, an important one. So I would hope that the applicant can speak to that. Um, I can speak to that, uh, Commissioner Cox um, and Commissioner Lyons. Um, the, the delivery station here has three categories of workers. Um, there are the managers and the dispatchers who manage sorting and delivering uh, processes. There are sortation associates who sort the packages within the delivery channel itself. And then there are the delivery drivers um, who drive branded fleet vehicles, um, who deliver packages to customers using their personal vehicles in what's referred to as a flex plan. And that's a, that's a very small subset of the drivers uh, uh, themselves. Uh, the tenant provides all associates with at least $15 per hour in wages. They also get a variety of benefits packages uh, from the day that they start. Um, they get uh, medical, dental, vision insurance, they get 401k match, uh, and they even get, in some instances, life and disability insurance. So uh, there are also part-time opportunities um, for you know, parents who need flexibility because of uh, challenging schedules or college students or people who need second jobs. So uh, it's a very flexible and adaptive work schedule, but at a minimum, uh, the wages start at $15 and go up from there. And as I said, we're projecting um, 125 to 150 construction jobs, but more importantly, 200 or so warehouse jobs and another 200 or so drivers. So it's a pretty significant employment engine for the neighborhood, we believe. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? It does, thank you. I don't know sure. if the commissioner who posed the question, whether it answers hers. Uh, let me go to Alderman Thompson. Um, go ahead, Alderman. Thank you, thank you. Chair, I also just wanted to weigh in on this as well. Um, we've talked with uh, with the uh, development team about hosting a, uh, a job fair uh, for the community. And I just want to say, you know, having this uh, Pilsen Industrial Corridor and that PMD, we also have uh, another industrial portion of our ward a little bit further south in the stockyards. Uh, some of the industrial, there's a union uh, clothing manufacturing on Halsted, just north of the river here, uh, as well as some manufacturing. Part of the reason what's appealing is that we have a workforce here. This has excellent public uh, access. So we have the, uh, you see the rooftop of the orange line uh, right here at Archer in Halsted, uh, as well as the bus lines that come down Archer. Um, and so I think the proximity to a workforce, um, we have 15, thousand or so employees that come into the stockyards. There's thousands that come along this corridor as well. And I think that's also what's appealing. Uh, and what for me is appealing is so that our, our neighbors in the community have the ability to, uh, to work at a facility with, with the benefits, with a, a decent wage and, uh, and an opportunity to increase and, and improve uh, their job and their quality of life for their families as well. So I think all of that is appealing and where we think this is positioned to attract uh, residents to work there and we're supportive of that. So I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Commissioner Grossman, if you can unmute yourself. I did, can you hear me? We can, yes. I, I, I think this is wonderful and I, I, I assume or I don't assume that we'll be tracking this because if this is the future and if we're in the forefront of logistics centers, shouldn't we be tracking what jobs are created? How are they created? What goes on? I mean, I think there's a real uh, opportunity here to maybe work with one of the universities or business schools 
to really look closely at what this might mean for Chicago and what it actually meant for Chicago. Um, I think we're too smart not to study it and learn from it. That's it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, I have a I have some questions that I'm I'm going to um, ask. So I'm calling on myself here. Um, first off, one of the things I wanted to do is agree with um, I guess it was Chris Kanich uh, who gave uh, a lot of applause to the alderman. Alderman Thompson, um, uh, you know, I think he, he made the point that he, he clearly assumes, as do I, and, and uh, knowing you a little bit, that when you uh, do things, you clearly do it um, with your constituents in mind and, and have the best of intentions um, in doing that. So I, I, I just wanted to, to highlight that and note that. And I dare say that a lot of these um, improvements uh, to the original plan have come about because of uh, your facilitation um, of, of those and your insistence upon those. So I just wanted to give you um, kudos for that. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, why I um, corrected Nolan and referring to uh, Mr. Powder by his first name. I don't think we want to feel that uh, planning staff has become, uh, first of all, out of respect, yes. But secondly, I don't think we want to feel that you become buddies uh, with with the uh, with the applicant because we rely on you to provide us an analysis to help us um, make make our decisions. So that was part of um, of my purpose for doing that. Um, so, but I do have I do have a number of questions. So I did read uh, very carefully the letters that was were submitted to us um, from. A number of organizations. We had uh, EJ uh, groups, environmental justice groups. We had regional planning agencies, and we had uh, residents who lived in the area. So that was um, arranged. But they pre they presented letters, and then they came here this morning and uh, spoke, and uh, down almost to the to the second. They they had their presentations time. So. Um, there are probably a, a good couple of dozen questions that they posed that have not been addressed um, here, either in the presentation or in um, our follow-up questions. So, um, so let me let me also let me address the, the point that um, that uh, um, Alderman, or excuse me, Commissioner Cox made about logistics and about the about uh, changes in the city. So. Chicago has, uh, has, it's clearly its economy grew because of our location. Um, whether it was from the, the uh, because of the, the you know, early indigenous settlers that, that developed their portages and gave access from the, from the Great Lakes to the, to the Mississippi River, um, um, our, our location in the middle of the, the, middle of the country and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that we're a location here for the major railroads uh, to come through here. And it makes total sense that that as, um, uh, and we saw this especially come true during COVID, but as, as logistics become more important to, to economies, that they would become especially important to Chicago's economy. So, um, I, and I agree with Commissioner Cox that we are, we are uh, likely to see uh, many more of these logistics centers coming. This is, uh, I believe, since I've been on the commission, this is now the third one that has come before us. And what I'm really struck by, and this was brought up, I think, in the comments, but I've been really struck by this, that the, and, you know, partly, you know, this, in, in some ways, we could, we could have, should have, we be in the city, uh, DPD specifically, uh, anticipated this, but certainly, um, you know, but at the same time, it, in, in some ways, because of technology, in some ways it happened quickly. But I'm really struck by the fact that we don't have a citywide or regional plan on the location of these logistics centers. And it's really, it seems to me, really, really bad land use decision making when you start making putting these locations piece by piece one comes to us here one comes to us there one comes to us over here but there's no overall plan for what where they where they ought to go uh, what ought to be uh, their standards um, 
I mean, I don't know that one project like this that's sort of isolated in the sense should be the basis for our standards. There should be, we, there should be a citywide process um, for, for the standard, for thinking about the location, the land use location, um, and, and what, what are the kinds of things that we don't want these, um, these logistic centers to do or to interfere with. And so I think the first thing, I, you know, commissioners, I think we really need to be asking DPD um, before we, uh, we vote on any more of these. I think we need to be asking for um, a citywide plan and, and really it ought to be a regional plan on these logistic facilities because Commissioner Cox is correct. Um, these things are going to, we're gonna be seeing more of them. And um, let's, I mean, if we wanna be sensible and forward thinking. And if we do wanna be that sort of model for how logistic center planning occurs, then we have our logistic location occurs, we had to be doing some logistic planning. And um, so I, I even, I don't know what the process would be for us to, to follow that recommendation made to us that we should have a moratorium on, uh, on any more of these decisions. And I think DPD, I, cannot be accepting these applicant applications until we have really fully con, uh, really done that kind of uh, planning. Um, and here's one of the implications of us not planning, right? And I think, I think they were really brought up today um, to us by the various uh, people who spoke. One of which um, um, is, this, is this issue of the environmental justice impact. And so Commissioner Cox makes the point that well, they're gonna be all over the city. Well, they're not all over the city and they haven't been all over the city. And that's not where the applications are coming from. The applications are coming from the South and the and South and Southwest sides, and mostly, and mostly Southwest side. And, um, and, and, you know, I think they thank you for whoever did the demographics on the, the percentage of people of color who live around this site. Um, we, there was, you know, the, before we even came on, there was the, the one at the at the Hillco site, um, that's gonna that's we already know that's gonna have massive impact in a community that's already burdened by high rates of asthma and other respiratory um, illnesses. Um, we know that uh, a lot of the changes and the moving moving around industrial locations have resulted in more dumping um, on in the southeast side of the city. So let's not put our heads in the sand and pretend like there isn't a real. Um, uh, a lot of inequality happening here with respect to where these things are being located. Now, granted, some of that is because that's where some of these industrial sites are, but then again, let's be mindful that the land use changes that have been occurring have, have created sort of high price properties on the north side and removing those industrial locations, but where are they going? They're going to the, south, the southeast and southwest locations. So let's not be disingenuous uh, about acknowledging that. Um, and more to the point, let's be proactive in trying to really think about sharing, if, 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 if this is gonna be something that's gonna be common in this area um, and we're all gonna benefit from it, then let's all share the burden of it. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, think, I think these issues that were raised to us are extremely important. Um, some of the other issues, and I guess I, I, that's a point I wanted to make, and my question in there, and I'll, we can come back to answering it. My question in there would be what, you know, what, uh, um, does the planning commission, plan commission have the authority to ask DPD to do this? I certainly think we should, uh, you know, we should ask as a plan commission, I'm certainly asking as chair of the plan commission, that we, that the DPD embark on a, um, a, a industrial uh, logistics center uh, plan and uh, for, 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 uh, for locating these sites. Um, and I think that it needs to be done with regional um, cooperation. Um, and then I also think we ought to consider in some way this request that we have that we put a moratorium on approving these things until such planning has occurred. Because if we don't, the kinds of inequities that have been uh, uh, raised to us here um, are gonna continue to happen. Um, other kinds of things um, that we heard today and, and um, part of these are, um, um, are, are important questions. And this is a question I think that Commissioner Lyons followed up on. Um, so then the, in terms of the Pilsen Industrial Corridor, 
why did it not yet go through the process uh, of the South Branch that was done on the North Branch? That needs to be answered. All right, that needs to be answered. And the answer that we got to Commissioner Lyons uh, was, not, was not adequate. Um, why are they being left out of this planning process? Why is some of this planning occurring on the north side and it's not occurring on the south side? Um, the other thing that was mentioned to us, and by the way, I think it is extremely noteworthy. We've got to show some respect for um, agencies that are in the business of doing, thinking about these long-term impacts of short-term decisions. It's, it is noteworthy that the Metropolitan Planning Council has weighed in on this. I don't think we can ignore that. Um, th th I mean, they're in the business of paying attention to this stuff. They alert us to things maybe that we don't think about. And so they're, they're asking us to think about some long-term implications of a short-term decision. Um, another thing they pointed out to us that this project is contrary to river guidelines. So in some, in some places we're gonna, we're gonna adhere to river guidelines, but not other places. So we may wanna get more uh, information from them on what they had to do about it. Um, but they did ex certainly ex indicate that this is, uh, this um, takes away sort of other potential uses of that site related to river development that we're seeing in other parts of the city. So why not in this part of the city? So I think that's something we cannot ignore either. Um, now, then there is another, again, I'm quoting um, the, the uh, presentation by Garen Sands, uh, the lack of meaningful engagement. So again, I wanna acknowledge, and I know that Alderman Thompson is, makes himself very available to his, his constituents, and I, I agree that it works in what he believes is the best interest of his community. But we're hearing here that they feel that there was not meaningful engagement and there's always this idea of what's the difference between informing people, maybe having them attend a meeting and actually taking into account their, um, their input. Now we do know that certainly, and I think we, we heard um, not only the applicant, but Alderman Thompson testified to the fact that uh, because of some of this input, um, there was some changes in the design. Now, one of those changes though, was to move the traffic from entering on the street Corbett Street, where there's going to be more residential, or whether and over to Halstead. Well, now then we have to go to the testimony that was made by Miss Lowe, for example, um, who was talking about the transportation safety impact. And I believe she has expertise in transportation planning. But here's something that I thought was really interesting that she said um, that the transportation, this, this plan with all the trucks going in and out off of Halstead. And by the way, I'm hard pressed to believe that we're going through $32 million or whatever it was, $25, $30 million of improvements for 16 trucks during the day, uh, which is a number that was given to us. Um, but, but even then, that's some impact. And so uh, what, this, uh, what she was saying is that this is gonna be in conflict with, for example, people who ride their bikes. Now, I, I actually travel this corridor quite a bit myself and uh, there's, there's a lot of bike, bicycle, bicyclists who use this as a transportation corridor. So I think that, I think, do we want to make this a transportation friendly, or excuse me, bicycle friendly city? Or is that only for some neighborhoods? Is that only for some people? Um, and I think we have to ask that question. Um, and then I, there was something else that Ms. Lowe raised, which is this idea of being, um, she wanted to counter some of the economic development claims and uh, suggesting that other uses could actually generate more tax revenue than with this. So I think that would be another interesting line of analysis to pursue. I, we didn't get a lot of details on that, but I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, uh, okay, I think those were, those were, I think the main comments. I'm not sure where the questions are in there, I suppose, other than to ask what it would take for us um, I, again, not necessarily specific to this project question about the moratorium. We'd have to answer that question separate from this. But I, I guess there's just, um, I think, you know, at what point do we say, no, we, we, we must stop this ad hoc planning because that's what this, this constitutes or maybe de facto planning when I think we, we need to be much, much, much more um, intelligent about how we think through this, these logistic locations, because um, this is a big deal. I mean, we're going to, Chicago is going to continue to be a huge 
logistics center. And um, so I, I, I myself am, am not gonna be supporting uh, with all due respect to you, Alderman, because I certainly uh, respect the, the opinions of Alderman in these various decisions. But with, so with all due respect to you, Alderman, I am not gonna be um, supporting um, the vote on, um, on, this, on this proposal. Um, and, and, and also just one last point. One of the things we know from these other kinds of, we know from data, I, some of which I've collected that, that in many of these kinds of sites, it's not people in the surrounding area who get the jobs, they usually travel from someplace else. Um, and I did wanna note there are 460 some parking spaces that are part of this project. Who are those 460 some um, cars for? So let me go now to Commissioner Burnett followed by Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner Burnett. I'll come back to him. Commissioner Biagi, followed by Commissioner. Yeah. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I can address maybe a couple of the uh, questions that you had. Uh, in terms of larger scale planning for transportation and logistics facilities and routing of trucks, actually, I, I, I wanna share that we actually first quarter uh, in collaboration with DPD and CDPH, Department of Public Health, uh, and lots of our advocacy partners will be launching a Southwest Industrial Corridor transportation planning uh, study. So it's about, it'll be, take about two years worth of work and that has uh, rigorous engagement that's getting all the facts uh, in terms of how transport's moving through the city, how we're moving things, but then also the different modes, uh, what that means for land uses. Uh, and so this is a really exciting uh, step in that direction. I think that you're talking about in terms of planning. Uh, yes, we do need to work regionally uh, in terms of the greater metropolitan area and that will fit in this context, but I think the focus on the Southwest side and, and what it means in terms of uh, transportation logistics, um, we'll be starting that up uh, next quarter. So I just wanted to let folks know that um, that's work. And again, it's hand in glove with DPD and public health um, and intentionally uh, because we recognize that um, this all has impacts on quality of life and we need to make sure we're getting it right. Um, and if I could address uh, some of the cycling concerns, obviously, you know, we worked really hard uh, with the developer to get some separation across these modalities and with particular attention uh, to cycling on Halstead. And in fact, uh, working on, uh, we're continuing to work on ways that we can improve that. And we've based our studies of bike needs on pre-COVID levels, of course, but with an eye toward uh, having it increase everywhere. We are very committed to that. Um, and so in addition, we're looking at, uh, and some of this is on their site plans in terms of additional pavement markings, um, looking at the green conflict bike markings. Uh, we're looking at things like delineators and then also um, a bike signal at that intersection. Um, and we've got our bike team kind of actively working on that. Um, and then thinking about how that connects to the bigger network. Um, lots of uh, the framing that we're looking at uh, with our bike network is more moving toward hyperlocal and then filling in the gaps between a hyperlocal network. So um, this is just to say um, our traffic engineers and our bike planners um, we spent a lot of time trying to get this right and make it work for both the cycling community as well as conceptualizing it in the way that things move around the city. So I'll stop there, uh, but I just thought I would add a few points here. Thank you, Commissioner Biagi. Appreciate it. Commissioner Burnett, are you available now to-, to... Yes, I am, and I apologize. I, uh, I just want to commend my colleague, uh, Patrick Thompson, uh, on another great project in his area, his continuous to uh, secure and bring jobs to the city of Chicago, I think is fantastic. Uh, I admire the fact that he wants to make sure that a diverse workforce is, is going to uh, participate in this project over there. Uh, I think, um, you know, logistics and um, de development and research has become a, a huge thing uh, throughout the city of Chicago. And uh, it's a way to readapt a lot of these industrial areas in the city. And uh, I'm just excited about it. Uh, it's like if, if, if one door closes, another one opens. So uh, congratulations to you, uh, Alderman Thompson, and, um, and congratulations to the developer also. Good project. Commissioner Searle, followed by Commissioner Cox. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with you and some of the comments you've made. Uh, Madam Chair, um, first of all, I think when we have these kinds of developments and if they need to be where they're located, I think that's the first question. Uh, even 
is there a real big reason that this needs to be on the river? Um, but if that is the case, then it seems to me the city ought to have greater guidelines about separating between residential and these industrial sites. Um, you know, everywhere in the city where we have industrial zones, there's a fuzzy line between that zone and what the adjacent residential. And, you know, we've, we've made commitments like a 30 foot step back on the river for all kinds of developments. And so why can't we make a commitment to a whatever it should be, and I don't know, some better expert than I am should say that we need, you know, a 50 foot or a hundred foot setback between residential and these kinds of um, industrial developments. Um, second of all, um, I think when we do this planning, which I do agree with we should do, we, we need to know from companies like Amazon and others, what their future technology, technologies are gonna be because if they do drone deliveries, then how does that change uh, the way something is planned? Uh, will they need so many trucks? Um, and you know, who else knows what other kinds of technologies are in the work that they are thinking about, which we don't even know anything about yet. Um, so I think that should be also an important issue. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Cox, followed by Commissioner Grossman. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, an important conversation, right, that we're having. And I can assure you, um, I have been um, focused on uh, this question of uh, environmental equity, uh, given the fact that we have these industrial districts throughout the city. Um, and I think um, Commissioner Biagi um, highlighted that, yes, we are poised to do uh, a Southwest uh, Industrial Corridor Modernization effort um, uh, in the beginning of the new year. Um, the past administration um, started uh, at the North Branch Modernization Framework. Um, one might argue that, um, you know, if it had been up to me, we would have started with the South side and the West side if we want to talk about equity. But be that as it may, this commission passed the, the framework for the North Branch. Now we are focused, uh, we plan to focus on the South, uh, South um, Branch uh, with a lens uh, of equity. Can, uh, so I, can I interrupt you real quick? I know you have more to say, but do you have a timetable for that? When you're going to start that? Yeah, well, we, if I can. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so the contract is almost uh, out of procurement. So we're we're awarding in these months and then we'll start it up first quarter next year. So January, February, we're expecting to start it. Um, it it's a long process. It's a big frame. Uh, and then a lot of uh, smaller projects and assessments can happen within it. And so we, it's two years worth of uh, planning that we can do through that. But it means that we can also take a look at particular issues within it because it's that broad scale. Uh, but then we can also look at it across in, in a more systemic way. Great, thank you. Which, and, I, um, and I'm which, sure it'll involve stakeholders in that process. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Which, which speaks a little bit to uh, uh, the, a couple of things. That, so that's one vehicle we have to really dig specifically uh, into uh, modernizing uh, these type of facilities for the 21st century. We also are having, as you know, a citywide conversation um, for um, all sectors uh, around the We Will plan. Um, so over the course of uh, this upcoming year, uh, we will be having a conversation about the role of our industrial uh, economy uh, in the future of Chicago. And that will have a robust, as in thousands and thousands of voices, uh, weighing in on the role of uh, kind of industrial uses in, um, in our future economy. So we have these two major vehicles. In the meantime, because these are long-term conversations, uh, we cannot put a moratorium on the development uh, in these areas. We have to um, use these sites as opportunities to push the envelope and anticipate where we know we're going, which is a much more robust uh, green coverage of these sites, uh, electric, uh, solar, 
Uh, and we have, um, we've told Amazon, we will use you as a model because your company should be at the forefront, not just in transforming how packages are delivered, but how sites are maintained. Yeah, and I so, thought you were gonna add their labor practices that could be a model too. And absolutely, and the whole, the whole nine yards, but speaking to- I guess I meant to say. Speaking to the planning component, uh, we have met with the leadership of Amazon twice in the past uh, eight weeks uh, to let them know that we have to, if these um, last mile facilities are going to happen in Chicago, and if they can't wait for two years uh, to be cited, that we are going to um, hold them to a standard um, that will make sure that they are of benefit to the community. So I think we have to do both. We have to do the long-term planning, uh, as you've suggested. There is no excuse for us um, doing these as one-offs when we know that they have a plan um, holistically to locate last mile facilities. Um, but at the same time, we have to use these as demonstrations uh, that we can do much, much better. And I think this plan is, um, I think that that river walk will be a significant amenity uh, to the neighborhoods. Now, I am interested in the, the comments that were made about what is the appropriate buffer between this use and residential uses. Uh, this is a first good attempt to acknowledge that, but should it be 50 feet? Should it be 100 feet? These are things that we are committed to using these site plans as test cases on what we can do now uh, to uh, make these uses, these logistic uses more um, sustainable because they are here to stay. Uh, they have to be a contributor to the um, economy, to the quality of life in neighborhoods. And so, as I said, I, you know, while I don't like these coming ad hoc, uh, the way they have through third party developers, uh, I'm committed to working with the logistic industry and uh, I certainly will be supporting uh, this site plan. So before I call on Commissioner Grossman, uh, Commissioner Cox, a couple of follow-up um, questions to you. Um, one is, I, or maybe it's, a, a, it's a, a, not so much a question as a, as a point. Um, one is that I um, think that um, the citywide plan, I think we need a separate plan other than the citywide plan, because I've been sort of in, uh, been involved in some of those meetings around the citywide plan. And I, and I think as good as that, as that process is going, um, I think you need, we need something separate that, that will pull out, right? It may, the industrial stuff should be in there, but I think we need a, we need a separate planning process around the, 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 um, the industrial, or excuse me, logistics centers, and that really ought to be regional, and that ought to involve some regional actors. But you know, I, there are there. I was really impressed also with the list of people who who submitted information to us today for this. So starting, you know, with MPC, but then you had Bridgeport Alliance, you had the Chicago Asian Americans for Environmental Justice, the Active Transportation Alliance, which is which is a, a citywide regional uh, organization, Equiticity. Equi Bike Lane Uprising, Center for Neighborhood Technology, they've been around for a very long time. The Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, Blacks in Green, Neighbors for Environmental Justice, and then the Southwest Environmental Justice Coalition. So I think these are all organizations that have taken a particular interest in the topic around, around these conversions of industrial sites and, and representing how that impacts other aspects, aspects of, of life. Um, and I think they are, um, I think they ought to be involved um, in, in, in a really mm -hmm. active way in, because, you know, why not, right? They, they clearly have some intelligence and some long-term thinking uh, about this and have a lot of insights that I think we can benefit from about how this affects people on the ground. You know, from outside, I know I can just be really happy that I can, because I'm always ordering books. And it's like I get the urge for a book and boom, you know, there goes, there goes another, you know, and I try to consolidate my Amazon request. So yeah, I benefit, right? What's the impact of that? Right. Uh, what's the impact of that on, 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 on where these logistics sites are located? And then, and then, you know, and again, this is a little, this is outside the issue of land use, but um, maybe, maybe while, we, while we have the chance, I think we should be raising these issues about, about our warehouse workers. Um, and and what the and what this means for them, right? And what maybe establish some expectations that as we're granting them access. I, again, I realize that's a little a little out of our scope, but 
but not unrelated. I don't think we should be insensitive to the warehouse workers. And we certainly know that they have been among the frontline workers that have kept it possible for us even to be able to work virtually while they are out there risking their health and the health of their family members to get us delivered our packages. So actually I've ordered fewer books in the last, in the last little bit. No. Um, but anyway, uh, I, do, uh, I have a couple of uh, smaller questions, but I'm gonna call on Commissioner Grossman first. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to ask more questions about what it is we want. Mm -hmm. And we, we saw an opportunity and now we wanna go full force on this. Uh, Atlanta, it looks like Atlanta does a lot of um, logistics work. Who else does it? Who does it in Europe? Uh, what business schools? Where can we learn what we should do? I mean, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It, we are not, what is logistics and how will it help us and what do we need? And do we want to be in it? But it seems to me we're just, oh, we should be in the logistics business. So let's do this or let's do that. I, I think. Um, Commissioner Cox has, you know, the ability and the skills to really begin to develop a long-term or short-term, long-term plan of development of who our customers should be. Nobody in business just goes out and says, you know, are you a customer? They figure out who, what skills we have, what we have, and then they begin to develop customers. So I think we're, we're, we've got the cart before the horse. We need to decide what we want to do and then see what other cities and other places are doing and how we could do it better or how we wouldn't do it at all because it's really not a sustainable business. That's it. Thank you. And maybe to, maybe to that point, maybe um, Commissioner Cox, uh, you and your role as, uh, as uh, Commissioner of, the, of, of DPD and me and my brother, maybe we could host, maybe we could host some um, uh, a, a, a meeting, a series of meetings for other plan commissioners and for others, just to us, just to talk about this issue of logistics planning and to take Commissioner Grossman's ideas to see how else it's being done. Um, and also this point that Commissioner Searle made, and it was also made, I think, by by Mr. Kanich when he or when he spoke about the technology and how that's going to affect employment numbers. Also, how it's going to affect, you know, electrification, and what's that going to mean for, you know, are we really going to be getting the number of jobs that, that we think we're going to be getting from this? What are the implications of that? What's the footprint compared to? The, I mean, there's so many things we need to look at, and and uh, I think rather than just sort of ending this with this conversation here, clearly you're going to, you know, be moving on the, the South Branch project process, um, on the modernization planning. Um, I think you know you're going to start a an industrial um, uh, what do you call it, reuse and logistics sort of planning process, but why don't we start with some conversations and maybe you and I, Commissioner Cox, uh, with the help of the staff can, can initiate those right after the new year. So uh, uh, Commissioner Grossman, we'll finish your point and then I'm gonna go to Commissioner Cox. Yeah, I, I was just to say, we are a rich city in business schools. We have the UFC, we have Kellogg, we have Lake Forest, we have a lot of business schools who know a lot more about this probably than we do. We also have the MacArthur Foundation. If we're really serious about this, not as a short term, doesn't mean we can't go out and try and, and learn on our own. How are we gonna learn more? How do we, how do we move from where we are to, to a, a serious player for the logistics? Or is the logistics world you know, dissipating? I mean, let's not overwhelm ourselves, but we should take advantage of all the rich consulting and education sources and what we can get and where we might be able to get grants or do other things to find out. I mean, we need business. How are we going to get it and who's going to help us? Yeah. And it's not a matter of being anti-logistic centers, right? It's a matter of, you know. No, 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 not no, at all. No, no, I know you're not saying that. Uh, I'm saying a reference to my comments. It's a matter of like, let's be, let's be intelligent about this. So yeah. I appreciate your comments, Commissioner, yeah. uh, Commissioner Cox. Well, I know I just, uh, I appreciate the, the conversation. It's an important one and this is the appropriate forum to have it. So uh, I appreciate you dwelling on it. Uh, you know, um, I will say in the mayor's um, 2030 um, vision of the Chicago economy, it was built around five pillars. Uh, and uh, this was post, uh, pre-COVID, 
Uh, but one of those pillars was transit, logistics, and distribution. And, and as you highlighted earlier, um, Chicago built its economy on logistics. Uh, the infrastructure, the highways, the rail, it's all in place. Uh, it will be a, a part of the future of Chicago. And these are jobs which are accessible to Chicago residents. Uh, and particularly as the, the, the way these uh, industrial corridors have been laid out, they are adjacent to neighborhoods. So people can literally work uh, in these type of jobs in their neighborhoods. So I think we just have to accept that the future, uh, a stable part of our economy is going to be in this sector. So our job is to make sure that it is um, in a, a 21st century, truly that Chicago is leading the nation in logistics. And I do think that that is a question of, of site plans. That is a question of, uh, of employment, um, jobs, it is uh, with regard to electrification and solar. And so um, I think it might be worth um, the planning commission maybe hosting an information session on the future of logistics. And we can bring in some of these area experts who are right here in Chicago who could let, uh, let everyone know uh, about where, where Chicago is going. Uh, and I think that that is probably a wise thing. I have now visited two or three of these facilities uh, in Chicago, they are full of, of, of black and brown and Chicago workers. So I think we want to be very mindful of who is being employed by these jobs. These are our neighbors. Uh, and so I would hope that we see this as a part, a critical part of the Chicago economy. Um, and my, many of the objections we heard um, were coming from a position that perhaps they don't know uh, that these are people who, these are their neighbors who are employed in these facilities. And so I think we might have be more tolerant of the diversity of our economy uh, if we actually went to these facilities, saw who's working in them and understand how vital they are to the overall economy. So I'm committed to making sure that there is significant community benefit uh, because I do believe that they are a critical part of our economy. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Can I direct staff to, uh, work with me to help once we get into the new year set up some uh, at least one perhaps a series of, of meetings around the logistics when we can have uh, not only all plan all commissioners there uh, this would be apart from a regular commission meeting but we can have various experts uh, but we can start locally and then maybe uh, get some other experts a couple of points I want to also make and I, I know that um, I appreciate that you're acknowledging the importance of this issue and and um, and, um, and uh, reinforcing the importance for us to really be think mindfully about this stuff. A couple more points. One, this is regional. This is also a regional dynamic. It's not just in the city sure. of Chicago. And so that I-55 corridor, for example, all the way down looking around the areas around Joliet, for example, um, um, those are all, you know, we're seeing the changes there. And uh, so this has to also be, uh, you know, we can have a Chicago conversation, but very soon it has to be really broadened um, because this is really a regional issue. Secondly, um, we, you know, we, we, we all, every one of us, I believe cares about jobs and increasing the number of jobs and access for people to, to have jobs. But if we listen to what the uh, warehouse workers have been telling us, um, and there's, you know, they're, especially for example, I think they're called the warehouse workers for justice, something like that. Um, one of the things that we find out is that A, a lot of these jobs are not full-time jobs. They are part-time jobs. And we know that the ploy of giving people just a part-time work is so that they don't have to give them the full-time benefits. So while we just say, oh, employment jobs, yay, yay, jobs, jobs, we really have to be asking the question, what, what are the quality of these jobs? What are the types of jobs? You know, are they full-time jobs with access to full-time benefits? Are they jobs with people opportunities to be able to move up through um, the ranks uh, of, of, that, of that system? Um, if, are they jobs where they are able to sort of give their feedback on what would make that, you know, make a, a better situation for them? Are they safe jobs? Um, and, and particularly now, are they safe during this period of COVID? Um, I think we have not uh, in this city emphasized enough 
that part of the spread of this virus is coming from workplaces where there isn't enough adequate sort of attention being paid to how we, how we social distance, how we keep our workers safe. So while we're all in favor of jobs, let's not, re let's not forget that when we talk about jobs, we're talking about workers in those jobs. And so if we really care about people having access to jobs, we'll care about the quality of those jobs and the conditions under which workers are fulfilling those jobs. So that has to be part of our, our conversation as well. So I think we're, we're pretty close to the goal here. Uh, I'm gonna call on um, uh, Alderman Thompson for, uh, for his comments, and then I'll be close to asking for a motion. Go ahead, Alderman Thomas Thompson. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the, uh, the <clears throat> discussion that, that's taking place and, and um, you know, uh, the Planning Commission has a lot of roles and we appreciate that. Uh, I, I think some of this has to, and I know we are looking at this as well as a city council. Okay. Um, let me just say, I, it was mentioned, you know, Chicago being uh, found basically because of its geography and the logistics and how we've been able to grow. Um, it's not new to us, it's about a mile north in my ward. I also represent UPS, which is a pretty big logistics company and has a big facility there. And this is the fourth logistics facility in my ward. Um, so um, we have them in, in other areas and working with uh, our community colleges and in particular uh, Richard J. Daly College and their um, program with manufacturing technology and engineering in a new school that we expanded down there, working with them on job fairs in the stockyards, industrial park for these types of jobs, whether it be on logistics and warehouse or the engineering and technology that all goes part and parcel. There's a number of different roles that, and, and positions that are played in here. And I think it's a, a bigger role. Um, and so I, I appreciate the discussion. Um, and uh, I, I'm just uh, appreciative of it. I'm hopeful that we can focus on this particular project. I know that the Commissioner Cox um, has talked about and Commissioner Biagi talked about <coughs> having a plan in place and we're looking at that and we continue to look at when we establish the plan manufacturing districts and taking into consideration this more popular type of uh, industrial use. Um, and so I, I do appreciate that. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Alderman. Um, I'm sorry, I do have one other quick couple of other quick question. Um, the, de the developer said, or the lawyer rather representing the developer said, or the re representing the applicant said, that there has not been anything on this site for generations. Um, I uh, Generations is 20 years, so I mean, a generation is 20 years, so we're talking about multiple generations. We're talking about more than 40 years that nothing's been on this site. Can someone tell me whether that's an accurate statement? I could. It's Alderman Thompson again. I, um, okay. If I could interject, please. Um, <clears throat> on the west portion of this property, it was uh, Grant Crowley had their, Crowley's boat yard had been there for quite some time. Prior to that, there were um, there was a Coke plant that was there, not Coca Cola, but the Coke plants from the gas company. Um, so all of that soil underneath the western portion of this property was contaminated. Grant Crowley had to move his operation further south in the city, but further south into the tenth ward. That prop that area of the property was then cleaned up. On the east portion, there was a temporary building that was here, which was the heliport. Um, and that uh, heliport had been there. Uh, that came in prior to my tenure, and I came in in 2015. I'm guessing that was in 2013, 2014, somewhere around there, that the heliport went in. Uh, and prior to that, the warehouse facility that was there had been torn down for quite some time. So um, there hasn't been anything uh, active in, in probably, uh, I would say the last five, uh, five to 10 years, but you did have the heliport on the Halston Street access and Crowley's boat yard, <clears throat> which was basically a boat storage facility. It wasn't as an active uh, facility as what this would be. So that gets actually Alderman Thompson, I think you partially answered my second question. You may have fully answered it, which was, a, which was um, has there been cleanup? Has there been full mitigation of the, any contamination on that side? I know, and I'll defer to the lawyer because I, I I haven't done any of the soil borings. I, I do just know that the west portion that was the Crowley site uh, had been 
uh, vacated by Crowley so that they could come in. People's uh, gas actually had the responsibility. They came in and remediated that soil. Uh, but that was a few years ago. And that's as far as I want to opine on that. I will, I'll defer to the lawyer. Well, one of the things, one of the impacts of all this deindustrialization, and there have been many, um, is that when these companies left, besides leaving devastated communities, and um, they left behind um, a lot of contaminated sites without any care for who was going to have to clean up after them. Um, so this is this is a city an issue for us throughout the whole city. But uh, on this particular site, what do you know about this, Mr. Clavider? Um, yeah, I can speak to that. So the the western portion of the site was occupied by Commonwealth Edison for many years. And back in 2010, the IEPA did issue a comprehensive NFR or no further remediation letter for, the, for the, that, that uh, portion of the property. So that actually allows for, uh, I mean, that actually establishes that uh, it was remediated even to the level of uh, residential. If you wanted to put a residential use there, uh, you would be able to do that environmentally. The five acre eastern portion of the Can site. Can I touch you on that or did you exaggerate that number too? Well, on my last point, I said underutilized for generations, Chairwoman. I didn't say unused for generations. I said well, underutilized. Yeah, we, for could check the, we, check, we could check the notes, but I wrote down that you said unused. But anyway, okay. But anyway. Um, uh, the other point is on the, and, the, and, the, and that, that NFR was issued in August of 2010. Um, that's the exact date. Uh, the eastern portion of the site was uh, a gas plant that closed, uh, you know, in 1934, our records indicate that has been enrolled in the, uh, in the uh, in Illinois Environmental Protection Agency site remediation program, uh, or was, and uh, our records indicate that over 260 million tons of materials was excavated from the site. I can go on and on. We've got environmental reports that we can make available for you. Actually, um, can you make those available? That would be awesome. Sure. Um, I, so uh, if you're going to make those available to us, then I'm going to go ahead and call for a motion on the proposed plan development. Um, unless you unless you had something pressing you wanted to add, Mr. Clavider? No, not at all. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Cox, uh, I move the motion. Uh, let me read it first. Do I have a motion on proposed plan development submitted by 2420 South Halstead LLC for the property generally located at 2420 South Halstead Street and 2500 South Corbett Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Moved by Commissioner Cox. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Tunney. Seconded by Commissioner Tunney. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. No. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a no. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Commissioner Jason? Commissioner Lyons? No. Commissioner Moore? No. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novata, not here. Commissioner Reyes, no. Commissioner Searle, no. Commissioner Shaw, Commissioner Tunney, yes. Commissioner Villegas is not back. Commissioner Wagas back. Yes. So I have one, two, three. Four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I have six no's and five yeses. Is that what you have, Noah? I have six yeses. So let me say Brumfield, Cordova, Ly I'm sorry. Biagi, Burnett, Cox, Murphy, Tony. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't let's see. Okay, Murphy. Okay, that's one, two, three. Okay. Who else? I have uh, Biagi, Burnett, Cox, Murphy. Tony and Wagspin. That's, that's right. That's why I had to. Okay, so that's six, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so six, six. What does this mean, Noah? Uh, we should call on uh, Michael Gaynor, I believe, our legal representation. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear somebody. Is that yes. Michael Gaynor? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, is Michael Gaynor uh, for the record from the law department. Yes, we'll just report it out to committed to uh, committee on zoning with that vote. Okay. And does the committee on zoning get and Grossman? Um, this is Fran Grossman. You didn't call me for a I vote. did. I did. You probably just didn't hear me. Um, no, I did. Well, it doesn't. Let's not argue over. Okay. It. I'm sitting here doing nothing but listening. <laughs> so you know, I but I, I and I, and you know I love to talk. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so tell me again, as Commissioner, is, was that? Did you say that was a? What was your vote? Oh, I vote yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So that so that makes it seven six, um, but it still gets reported uh, to the zone uh, zoning committee. Uh, does yes. the, does the full conversation? Can we get the full transcripts to them? The full conversation of this to the zoning committee. Rather than just a vote, Chairwoman, I believe we get the transcript uh, read into the record at the at the committee on zoning. But I think Patrick would confirm that. That's correct, Chairwoman. This is Noah. That's that's correct. Each item gets reported out a final for publication packet that will be forwarded to uh, the committee on zoning as well as the city clerk, and the the attorney will ask that the findings of fact be read into the record as part of the presentation at the committee on zoning. Okay. So uh, it will come also, sorry, Chairwoman, it will come with a letter. Uh, Commissioner Cox as the uh, secretary of the plan commission, it comes with a letter signed by him out from the plan commission to the committee. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Noah. And, you know, thank you uh, all commissioners um, for uh, allowing um, me, allowing us to have this, have this conversation um, because I think that uh, it's really, um, I, I think it helps set in. It's helped. It's, it has helped us set into motion. I think some very important conversations. So, in, in that sense, I feel we're really doing our duty to to keep the to keep the issue um, alive for us to you know to think really carefully about how we proceed in the future on this very very important topic. All right. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much um, to all of you for your time. Um, we appreciate your being here. Thank you, Alderman Thompson. Uh, appreciate your your hard work on behalf of your constituents. Thank you, uh, Madam Madam Chair. This is Alderman Viegas. I apologize. I was having te technical difficulties, but um, has the vote already taken place on this project? We did, but I was just wrapping up. If you want to give us your vote on it, yes, I would love to uh, support uh, support this project and uh, congratulate my colleague my colleague on uh, on a great project here. I, again, I apologize for uh, having some technical difficulties here. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so that's seven to, what, did I count seven? That makes it eight to six with the Viegas' vote. Okay, eight to six. So the vote is eight to six with Commissioner Biagi, Commissioner Burnett, Commissioner Cox, Commissioner Grossman, Commissioner Murphy, Commissioner Tunney, and Commissioner um, Viegas voting yes. And Commissioner Wagsback. And Commissioner Wagsback. And then Commissioner Brumfeld, Commissioner Cordova, Commissioner Lyons, Commissioner Moore, Commissioner Reyes, Commissioner Searle, voting no. Uh, it's interesting that the non-city employees or non-aldermen um, were the ones who um, are sort of representing public. Um, not that you guys don't represent the public, but uh, as non-staff non or non-elected officials. Um, we're um, seeing other things here. So, all right, great. All right, last one, you guys. We're almost there. Next item on the agenda is proposed plan development submitted by 40 West Oak Owner LLC for the property located at 46-74 West Oak Street, 1000-1006 North Dearborn Street, 1001-1007 North Clark Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the subject property from C2-5 Motor Vehicle-Related District to DX-10 Downtown Mixed Use District, then to a residential business plan development. The applicant proposes a, con to const a construct, no, it should be two construct, a 35-story building with an overall height of 465 feet and eight inches with up to 75 residential dwelling units in sub area B. The existing Warren Bar facility, generally located at 66 West Oak Street, sub area A, will remain A 3.8 floor area ratio. Bonus will be taken from area B, and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 
11.34 FAR and 160 accessory parking spaces will be provided. This is in the second ward, Heidi Sperry, who of course has her presentation up and ready to go, will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Ms. Sperry. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. For the record, my name is Heidi Sperry with the Department of Planning and Development. And the applicant appears with me today uh, because they are proposing to rezone the property generally located at 40 West Oak Street from C25, a motor vehicle related district to DX10, downtown mixed use, prior to establishing a planned development to construct a 35 story building containing 75 residential units and 160 parking spaces. I'd like to note that 50 of these parking spaces will be dedicated for use by the neighboring Warren Bar facility. The site is located in the near north side community area, which contains established residential neighborhoods such as the Gold Coast, Old Town, and Sandburg Village. A snapshot of the demographic data of area residents is summarized here. The site is situated on the northwest corner of Dearborn and Oak, and you can see where my cursor is indicating the site. This is located in the second ward. And as these uh, current photos show, of the area surrounding the site. The area includes uh, a mix of low scale and high rise residential, industrial and commercial buildings ranging from historic to contemporary. This, the site is uh, situated immediately north of the Newberry Library and is immediately adjacent to the Ogden Elementary School. Additionally, the site is considered a transit serve location as it is uh, situated less than a quarter of a mile southeast of CTA's Clark and Division Red Line Station. As you previously stated, the applicant proposes to rezone the site to DX10 downtown mixed use and will be using the neighborhood opportunity bonus to obtain an additional 3.8 uh, floor area for sub area B. The overall uh, FAR for the proposed plan development will be 11.34 sub uh, FAR. I'd like to uh, move forward to the zoning uh, map seen here and uh, just highlight the fact that the uh, surrounding properties uh, in the vicinity of the site contain a range of zoning classifications that uh, generally reflect residential, commercial, business, and institutional and have uh, base allowed densities that range from roughly five all the way up to uh, DX12. DPD has assessed the, uh, capabil uh, the compatibility of this proposed district with the character of the surrounding area in terms of use, density, and building scale. And DPD has determined that the project is appropriate within the context of the surrounding area. This map illustrates uh, nearby building heights and you can see the orange shaded sites contain either existing or approved developments which exceed the height of the proposed project. I will note that three developments are situated west of Rush Street on Maple and Walton in very close proximity to the subject site which is seen here on Oak Street. And finally, as you move further south and east, the uh, heights, uh, you see the heights of uh, building, uh, the context of the building heights continue to rise, um, moving toward Michigan Avenue and down south toward Ch Chicago Avenue. This aerial view depicts the proposed building rendered within the context of the surrounding development. And you can see the proposed development, which is seen here in the center of the screen. Finally, this is a view of the proposed development looking northwest at the corner of Oak and Dearborn streets. As proposed, the project promotes uh, pedestrian interest, safety, and comfort by providing safe and attractive walkways, and additionally eliminates a very wide existing uh, curb cut and driveway that is uh, located on Dearborn Street. And this is a view from the east looking southwest, showing the base of the building in context with the Newberry Library, which is seen on the left of the screen, and uh, a, a building known as the Pallet and Chisel Academy, seen on the right. The prevailing plans for the area 
are the Central Area Action, uh, the Central Area Plan of 2003 and the Central Area Action Plan of 2009, which identifies this area as the near north sub area. It is considered to be a diverse and livable collection of neighborhoods. Near North is currently the most populated subject district in the central area, and it possesses uh, an established precedent of high density residential buildings. The Central Area Action Plan sets forward the goals of first improving the quality of the pedestrian environment, and then second, promoting higher densities, especially around transit serve locations, as well as along major street corridors. This proposal supports both of these objectives. Now the development team will explain further details of the proposal. And before I turn over the presentation, I just ask uh, that all speakers, please remember to identify yourself uh, prior to presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, yeah, thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Paul Shadel from the law firm of DLA Piper and I, along with my partner, Katie Janky Dale, represent the applicant in this matter, which is the uh, 40 West Oak owner LLC, which is the contract purchaser and proposed developer. Uh, with us today are Genghis Hadi with Nala Capital, the principal with the applicant, Christophe Lagrange, another principal with the applicant, Lucien Lagrange with Lucien Lagrange Architects, the project architects, Mina Lam, also a principal with Lagrange Architects, and Lue Abuna, our traffic consultant. The, the, as noted on this slide, the first PD intake meeting for this project was in June of 2019. The application was filed in October of 2020. And in between that time, there were two community meetings, one on October 1st of 2019, uh, and another on February 1st of 2020, and many meetings with DPD staff and other city agencies. Based on feedback taken at those meetings, the original plan was reduced from 90 units to 75 units, and the height of the building was reduced from approximately 503 feet to approximately 466 feet. Uh, the, the, I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Cox and his staff, the Department of Planning, and also representatives from other agencies, and of course, Alderman Hopkins for many months of working with us on this project. And at this point, I'd like to ask Mina Lam, the architect, to take the commission through the proposed design. I, before I turn it over to Mina, I would just note that this slide before you does show the change. Sorry, I should have referred to that. This shows the change from the original proposal on the left uh, to the proposal that's before you today on the right that was the result of the review process at DPD and the meetings with the community. Uh, Mina, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, for the record, my name is Mina Lamb. I am a principal with Lucy and Lagrange Studio. Can you go to the next slide, please? This the site consists of two sub areas. Sub area A on the west portion of the site is location of the existing Warren Bar Pavilion Rehabilitation Facility. Subarea B on the east portion of the site is currently occupied by a freestanding multi-level garage structure and will be the location of the new residential building. There is a wide curb cut that exists on Dearborn Street and serves to access above grade parking. The second wide, a second wide curb cut exists on Oak Street and serves um, access for uh, parking below grade on the site. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed plan shows the new development on sub area B, and I will explain more detail on the next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed ground floor plan on the east portion of the site. The residential main entrance is located on Oak Street. A two lane port cashier located along Dearborn Street serves as a vehicular drop off area for the residences. There is a secondary lobby access off of the space. A wide existing curb cut on Dearborn Street, as I showed earlier, will be eliminated and all, tra all vehicular traffic will move via an existing alley into the Port Cachere. On Oak Street, a single driveway will replace a wider existing curb cut with right out only. Next slide, please. 
This is the, uh, the plan of the typical parking floor. Uh, 100 and par 110 parking stalls will be provided with within the building for the residences and a dedicated 50 stalls will be provided for the guest users of the adjacent Warren Bar um, building. There will be no public parking provided. Next slide, please. The typical residential floor has a relatively small footprint of approximately 8,000 square feet and has step corners to further break down its mass to, to appear slender in its context. The plan will only have three units per floor. Next page, please. The roof plan shows that the building steps back from the street on all four sides. Upper floor setbacks convey a sense of sculpting to the top floors and the building is capped off with a small mechanical penthouse enclosure. Next page, please. These are the main elevations on Oak Street, which is the south elevation and on Dearborn Street, the east elevation. Setbacks are introduced at, inter at intermediate floors to allow the building to gracefully transition down to the street level and the facades have a strong vertical expression. Next page, please. Note that the north and the west elevations have the same treatment as the other elevations. Next page, please. The section shows the location of the parking floors in gray at the base. There's an intermediate floor housing the residential amenities and the residential units above. Next page, please. These, this slide and the next slide shows enlarged portions of the facade of the base, middle, and top of the building. They are presented at a larger scale to better describe the relationship of the various facade components to each other, the level of detailing that is envisioned, and the materials to be used. On the right side is the base facade, and this will be clad in limestone and granite with ornamental metal details surrounding the storefront windows. The attention to detail and the use of quality materials at the sidewalk level will enhance the pedestrian experience along the two primary streets. Next page, please. The typical residential floor facade will be clad in precast concrete panels with a reveal pattern to simulate a stone look. Uh, please refer to the image that shows the stone look. Inset windows add shadow and depth to the facade and the terraces have an ornamental metal and glass handrails. The top floor facade enclosing the mechanical enclosure on the right side will be clad in a ribbed metal panel system with a bronze color finish and vertical metal fin detailing. Next page, please. Um, this slide speaks, talks about transportation I will describe the pedestrian and vehicular circulation and access at the street level. Pedestrian access is provided from both Dearborn and Oak Street in, in, into the building uh, and from Dearborn across the site via the connected sidewalks. All resident vehicular traffic is directed to the Port Cochere via, via the public alley with deliveries directed to the alley. Fully enclosed automobile and bicycle parking will be provided. Landscaping is substantially improved on both street frontages. Next, sli next slide, please. A traffic study was conducted by KLOA and concluded that traffic generation will be low given proximity to alternative modes of transportation. The project is not expected to have an adverse effect on traffic operations at the Ogden School located kitty corner from the site the existing street system has adequate capacity to accommodate traffic that's expected to be generated by the building. Parking garage and loading access is designed to enhance pedestrian access and outbound vehicular movements onto Oak Street will be right out only. Access design will accommodate all building traffic and will not adversely impact movements along Oak and Dearborn streets. The proposed development will, will eliminate an existing two-way driveway on Dearborn Street that has key card access and requires cards to stop on the Dearborn sidewalk to enter the garage. The proposed access system will eliminate conflicts between vehic vehicles and pedestrians on the sidewalk. 
Lue Abuna from KLOA is here to answer questions from the commissioners if required. Next page, please. The building as designed complies with the plan development standards as it relates to pedestrian orientation and urban design. Some of these design features include aligning the base facade with the adjacent building and articulating the fenestration pattern to be similar in scale and complementary in expression, even though the proposed facade is concealing parking floors. Next page, please. The plan complies in all respects with the city's open space and landscaping requirements. The plan will substantially enhance the landscaping of the site and will be in character with the surrounding neighborhood. Next slide, please. The proposed building meets the city's requirements for plan developments related to context and scale of surrounding buildings with all sides, including high quality materials finishes and architectural details. The proposed building meets the city standards for high rise buildings. One of the standards include reducing the apparent mass and bulk of the building and using setbacks to sculpt the top floors. Next page, please. The project will satisfy the city's sustainable development policy. And this slide shows the items selected from the menu that will be pursued to achieve the 100 points. Next page, please. The project complies with all city stormwater requirements and the calculations are described here. That concludes the architectural presentation. I'd like to turn it back over to Paul Shadel. Thank you, Mina. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, again, for the record, I'm Paul Shadel with DLA Piper. Uh, the project is uh, an affordable for sale project in the downtown area and will fully comply with the ARO uh, by making a, uh, I should go back to what the requirement is, sorry, it's a 75 unit project which re would require either eight affordable units or as a for sale project uh, payment in lieu of those units, which at this location is the higher payment of approximately $238,000 per unit and the developer will pay approximately 1.9 million into the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund to comply with that requirement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project will include a range of public benefits uh, as described on this slide, uh, including jobs of approximately 450 during construction, approximately 10 to 12 permanent jobs, uh, annual, that's annual tax contribution for property tax of approximately $3 million and anticipated transfer tax revenue of $2.4 million. For a neighborhood opportunity fund bonus, that's an FAR bonus, there will be a payment of approximately $1.1 million. Uh, with respect to the city's MBE and WBE goals, the developer is committed to pursuing the city's MBE, WBE and city resident hiring goals. The company hasn't yet chosen a general contractor, but has sent letters last week to a range of MBE, WBE, and local, local builder groups, inviting them to bid on the project and also will actively pursue those contracting opportunities. Um, the, it's expected that the project um, would commence sometime in the next year. Next slide, please. Um, as noted on this slide, uh, the proposed residential program uh, in building design and as detailed by MENA, includes an appropriate use density and building height in its neighborhood context. It's not the smallest building, but it's also not the largest building. Um, and I think instead of going into any more of these details, maybe we could leave this slide up um, and I will turn it back over to Heidi Sperry. But before doing so, I just again wanted to thank the city team for working with us over the last few months to come up with this design and uh, we would respectively ask for the plan commission's uh, positive recommendation. Thank you very much, Mr. Shader. Uh, to move on to the DPD recommendations, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposed residential business plan development is first compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses density and building scale. It is compatible with the surrounding zoning of the area and it will, adequate, it will be
be adequately served by existing public infrastructure facilities. Based on the foregoing and the staff report presented to you, as well as this presentation uh, offered right now, it is the recommendation of the Department of Planning and Development that this application for a residential business plan development be approved and recommended to City Council's Committee on Zoning, Landmarks and Building Standards as passage recommended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Perry. Um, as always, um, great presentation. Um, I'm not seeing any questions from commissioners, but we had, what, three people, several people um, testify on this one. Have their issues been addressed? Do we think, I guess one of them was heights. I don't think Butler Adams liked the architecture, um, but was, was there anything significant that they raised that we ought to be asking about? I'm not remembering. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't catch anything that I thought, I mean, I was listening for some of the concerns they raised, but I think one of them was, 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 uh, the height, which was higher than I think where they currently live. Anyway, I guess it's a general question. I, I'll, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I, I, to jump in, I just want to note that, uh, Commissioner Cyril and possibly another member of the commission, uh, has a hand raised here. Oh, how did I miss that? Oh, because I've got them way down. Oh, so sorry. Thank you, Heidi. I had the thing. I was looking for their comments, but I had them. I had to scroll way down, so I missed it. So forgive me, Commissioner Searle and Commissioner Reyes. Chairwoman, sure, just to mention too, we might want to mention for that Alderman Hopkins, because I know he's on another meeting, but he's here to speak as well. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. So let me go to Searle and Reyes, and then I'll go to, to the Alderman. Go ahead, um, Commissioner Searle. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think I think one of the comments I think from um, Ms. Butler Adams was about parking, which I totally agree with. Um, 160 spaces seems like um, way more than necessary. Um, why would we do anything more than one on one per unit, one car per unit, plus the I think it was 50 spaces for the um, Warren Bar. So that'd be 125, and this is 160 um, in the um, PD, PD. So we've got eight floors of parking, you know, before we even get the units. And then um, I sort of calculated how tall um, that would be if you added eight floors, which I don't think they need. I really think it should be 125 cars, not 160. Um, so, I mean, this building is 465 feet tall for 75 units and 160 cars. It just seems really outrageous. That's kind of one problem I have with this. Um, the other problem is, to me, this looks like... Uh, if you know architecture, you could say a French chateau sitting next to Villa Savoy, which is a beautiful modern house in France. Um, or <laughs> a few other things. Uh, to me, this has no relationship to any of the buildings around it architecturally. And it seems way out of character and context with what we have. Um, I mean, I think I could even tolerate a building this tall if it had more um, integrity, let's call it, to the rest of the area. And to me, this has no integrity whatsoever. Um, so those would be a couple of beginning comments that I would like to make. Thank you. And I'm completely opposed to this proposal. Madam Chair, can I respond to the parking question? Yes. Uh, again, Paul Shadle uh, from DLA Piper for the record. Uh, the parking, there are 160 parking spaces in the building. 50 of those spaces will be for the exclusive use of the Warren Bar Pavilion to replace the parking that's in the existing structure on the site today. So that would leave 110 for a 75 unit project. And for a condominium project of this type, that's a fairly typical ratio. It's not, it's between one and two, and that's what the developer expects the market to demand. And again, we did have the traffic engineer assess the impact of that parking on the neighborhood. So I did want to know that. 
and, and with respect to the style of the architecture, I can't speak to aesthetic taste, but I would note that um, it's a it's a it's a Beaux Arts style. It's a style that Lucien Lagrange has designed into buildings in a number of locations in the city of Chicago, including about a block and a half away from here at the Waldorf Astoria. A different design, but in the same vein. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any follow up, Commissioner Searle? No, I just like to say, I think we've seen a number of projects, many projects lately uh, for residential um, towers and none of them have more than one-to-one -one parking. If that, sometimes it's 0.5 per unit. Um, so this seems way more than necessary. Uh, other than they're probably going to, you know, sell these other places, par parking spaces to other uh, people in the neighborhood. Unless you have, you have two uh, people in the household that are that are drivers and, and if yeah, I mean in downtown Chicago that seems really unnecessary. Uh, Commissioner Reyes, followed by Commissioner Brumfeld. Yeah, I mean it saddened me to see that again we have missed an opportunity in terms of having some affordable housing here, and I'm assuming this is for sale. So um, it is also saddens me the fact that we have more, we, we clearly favor parking over affordable housing. This would have been a great opportunity to have uh, some affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, so it's, it saddens me overall. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not gonna make a comment about the design because that's, uh, that's not my expertise, but truly how we continue to miss this opportunity, it blows my mind. This is a $165 million project and is only contributing 1.9 million for the affordable housing fund, or could have done eight units on site. Um, and I know this, they're meeting the requirements. So um, I'm just, I cannot wait to see the day that we have a new ARO, uh, but it's, it makes me really sad. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Brumfeld, followed by Commissioner Lovato. I yield my my uh, my comments uh, uh, to Commissioner Navarro, who may address uh, uh, some of the uh, issues that Commissioner raised just raised related to affordable housing. Yeah, great, so I'd like great. her to go first. Okay, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Navarro. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I would like to address uh, Commissioner Reyes's concerns, which we have talked about several times on this in this body, we actually cannot do eight units on site when it is luxury for sale. And the reason for that is that although we could, uh, through the ARO obligations, bring the, the for sale price into an affordable range, we cannot regulate the assessments. And the assessments on a, in a luxury downtown building of this sort um, are not compatible with a affordable for sale unit. And so instead, in those instances, as, as we've talked about uh, when this comes up, what we've done is, is request a payment in lieu so that we can use those funds to create affordable opportunities elsewhere. So that is why you, we do not see that in luxury for sale. And, and we do not envision a way that we would be able to do that in the future. So I don't wanna set up the expectation that that's coming when it is luxury for sale. We have seen some instances where we have majority a majority market rate for sale building where we're able to do affordable units. Those generally are not those, I wouldn't say generally have not been downtown or at luxury level prices. We see those more in, um, in neighborhoods that are further removed from downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, May I say? Yeah, go ahead. Um, respond to that. I, I, I appreciate the clarification. I was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. However, I still feel saddened by the fact of the ratio between the total development cost of this development and the minimum contribution to the affordable, uh, affordable housing fund. So, and I know, yes, I have said this many, many times, but um, so sorry for that. Is this something that's gonna be addressed in the new ordinance, Commissioner Nevada, do you think? Well, as I mentioned, um, we, do not, we do not see a path forward for doing for sale affordable units in the luxury building because of the issues we've discussed. 
Um, I do understand Commissioner Reyes's overall point about the ratio of the project cost to to the affordable amount that they're paying, and and we'll certainly look at that. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Brunfeld. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll be uh, brief. Um, I, I do. This is where it's a bit of a challenge, uh, right? Because we understand that this is really a land use issue. Um, but I do have to uh, echo, without going into details, a, a number of the comments that were made by Commissioner Searle regarding the architecture. And I do appreciate DLA Piper's explanation on the parking, but that was also one of the issues that I had as well uh, related to the parking. Um, it's less an issue about height, and I understand this is, uh, at least for me personally, it's more about the aesthetic look of this, uh, especially the, uh, given the context of the immediate uh, uh, area. Um, but I just at least wanted to go on record for those comments. Um, but, you know, again, we know this is really more of a land use uh, and uh, FAR issue, less about design. This is not a design review board, uh, but I would uh, hope that uh, the architect will continue to work with the developer uh, and possibly even DPD on ways that they could actually uh, make continued adjustments to the design as a whole. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, okay, anything else from you all? Uh, the Alderman. Alderman Hopkins, you are here. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Um, this was the result of uh, a year-long community review process, slightly over a year, actually. I got this uh, project handed to me in June of 2019. Uh, we had three community meetings uh, beginning in October 2019. Uh, the revisions that you saw in the slide earlier showing the height and the density reduction, uh, also a net FAR reduction on parcel B where the uh, tower is being built, uh, was a result in, of negotiations with the community. Uh, as we went forward with the discussion, um, it became clear that the remaining opposition, um, and I, you heard from some of them, they, uh, they reside at uh, 30 West Oak. Um, this is 40 West Oak. So, you know, 10 clicks of the address odometer away. Uh, and it became clear that some of the residents of 30 West Oak were just simply not comfortable. It's just too close to them. Uh, and I understand that. I respect that. Uh, and, and the voices that uh, I had heard from uh, throughout this process, uh, you know, were, were reasonable in their opposition. Um, but their opposition was steadfast nonetheless. You know, there was just no way uh, I could get them to a place, even with further height and density reductions, um, that, that they were gonna be comfortable with this building uh, across the street from them. Uh, having said that, uh, we stayed engaged with them uh, up until uh, last week, actually, when additional modifications were made uh, to the transit component on this. Um, we think it will enhance the pedestrian safety measures taken, as you heard, uh, the council uh, for the developer uh, refer to, um, we have the port to share to bring traffic in off the street um, and we're utilizing the existing two-way alley uh, as an ingress egress from Dearborn to take pressure off Oak Street, which uh, is, is actually uh, the more problematic uh, street for congestion uh, with the proximity to Ogden School during pickup and drop off, et cetera. So um, having that channelized for right turn only and then having the driveway, Port Cashier and the two-way um, entrance and exit off the alley uh, really addressed a lot of the concerns we heard from the immediate neighbors. Uh, and I thank them for their continued engagement in this project, even when it became clear to them um, that I was going to give it a favorable recommendation and I was going to ask this body, uh, which I'm doing right now and you have my letter of support on file, uh, to please uh, uh, give a favorable vote to this project. Um, and we'll continue uh, working with the neighbors next door uh, during the construction phase if this project is approved. Uh, you know, they've been partners in good faith, even though I, I know you heard from some of them uh, earlier today. And let me just say, it surprises me to hear that Butler Adams didn't like the design. Uh, it's uh, a matter of aesthetic taste. I've been a fan of Lucien Lagrange uh, and his firm for a long time. And it, just my opinion, I, I happen to think this is an attractive piece of architecture. Uh, but of course, we're all entitled to uh, our, our individual tastes on that. So uh, again, this was uh, a very robust and lengthy process. And I want to thank everybody uh, involved in it. Uh, I think it uh, resulted in a much better project. Uh, and it will enhance Warren Bar as well. The parking issue that was raised, um, you know, their parking is inadequate right now. That is a facility. Uh, that tends to have people with mobility challenges 
Um, they need transportation to and from. They currently have a driveway for, uh, for drop off on their building, which will be uh, enhanced as a part of this. Um, but people drive to Warren Bar. Uh, and, and that's going to continue. So we had to address that uh, and take that into consideration. Uh, this is clearly a win-win for them. Uh, so I would urge a favorable uh, support for this project and I thank you for your time, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Alder. Uh, those are very helpful comments. Um, okay, so not seeing any double check, make sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any more comments or questions coming. So do I have a proposed, do I have a motion on proposed plan development submitted by 2420 South? Oh, no, wait a second. Uh, where am I? Okay, do I have a motion to proposed plan development submitted by 40 West Oak, owner of LLC, for the property located at 46-74 West Oak Street, 1000-1006 North Dearborn Street, slash 1001-1007 North Park Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved by Alderman Villegas, or uh, uh, Member Villegas. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Villegas. Seconded by? Commissioner Tyson. Commissioner Novara. Commissioner Novara is going to second that. OK, so moved by Commissioner Villegas, seconded by Commissioner Novara. Uh, no further discussion that I'm seeing. All right, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox was a proxy yes. Uh, Commissioner Garza, I think he's gone. Commissioner Grossman. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? No. Commissioner Searle? No. Commissioner Shaw is a proxy, yes. Uh, Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Villegas? Yes. Commissioner yes. And then Commissioner Wade is back. Yes. Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations, Commissioner Searle and Commissioner Reyes. Um, thank you very much for, for your comments. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Commission. Okay, great. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. This does conclude the public hearing portion of our agenda. However, we do have one additional. Okay. We have a, no, we don't have a presentation, do we? No, that's old, old minutes. All right. Just as a reminder, though, I would like to suggest people to go on to the plan commission website and provide comments on the updated master PD guidelines presented at the October 15, 2020 planning plan commission. Actually, can I have that though, um, that draft sent to um, the com uh, commissioners in their email so they have it handy and don't just have to go onto site as well as the site. Um, and this is this is the, uh, the changes, Thank you. changes for the master plan development guidelines. The department is accepting comments until December 16, 2020. The Department of Planning and Development intends to hold a public webinar on the item in December as well, which I believe they're working on scheduling right now. It's probably gonna be the second week. This does conclude this month's meeting the Chicago Plan Commission. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, so Commissioner Novara. Thank you. Commissioner Second. moved it and Commissioner, who seconded, Cyril? Cyril, yes. Commissioner Searle seconded. All right, must do the roll call vote again though. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. He's gonna vote no on this. He wants to hang out longer. Do we have to leave? Do we have to leave? I wanna be here till midnight. <laughs> I like that mustache you're growing, man. Gracias, yes. <laughs> Commissioner Burnett is yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox is not here. Uh, Commissioner Garza is not here. Commissioner Grossman? Yes. Commissioner, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Um, you know, before I finish this vote, though, I want to be sure and say um, um, to everyone we know how this is tough times we appreciate all the people working hard 
we'll help try to get this curve flattened again and get us out of this. Um, you know, just want to throw that in there here real quick. Commissioner Shaw is not here. Commissioner Tunney, uh, I think it's gone. Commissioner um, Viegas, not here. Commissioner Wagesbach. Yes. Okay. Motion. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and I, I think we all thank the staff for their hard work. <clears throat> I mean, this is tough and you've done a great job. And I, we, I think I'm speaking for all of us. We thank you. You are indeed. And, and they do. So thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, staff. Um, thank you, our warehouse workers. Thank you, our health workers. Thank you, all the nonprofits that are working so hard and all the, uh, everybody else who's uh, adapting and all for everybody who's wearing masks. Um, thank you. Um, have a, uh, as best you can, a, a joyous Thanksgiving. And uh, with that, we are adjourned at 3.18 p.m. This month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is now adjourned, 3.18. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.